Yes. All right, welcome everyone to uh, today's city council meeting. We'll be, we recently had a closed session, which we'll talk about later. We're gonna have a stay session. Um, at first though, I'd also like to introduce uh, Magali Tejas, who is the executive director of Los Cien, and she'll be doing the council sit along with us all the way to the end tonight, correct? She's smiling now. Um, Mr. McGlynn, you wanna introduce this item? Yes, item 3.1, amendment to memorandum of understanding, MOU, between the city of Santa Rosa and the Santa Rosa City Schools to allow alternatives to construction of affordable housing or school facilities on Fur Ridge Drive, lot F. APN 173-620-030, Assistant City Manager, David Guin presenting. Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. So as the city manager just mentioned, uh, we're here as a study session to discuss uh, the, a piece of property, it's a six acre site up on Fur Ridge Drive uh, that is um, subject of an MOU between the city of Santa Rosa and the Santa Rosa School District. Uh, there's a lot, long history on this project. It uh, dates back to a subdivision that went into place in 1987 um, called Fur Ridge North at Fountain Grove, was the subdivision that went in that started this process and put this piece of property in the mix for um, use uh, for school sites. So I have a little bit of history here on this slide. Um, also in the staff report, there's an attachment that has a much de more detailed history that goes along with this. Um, but just to highlight a few of the items that have happened over the past few years, um, since 1988, uh, was a, a, an agreement between the city and the subdiv subdivision developer uh, was established for that property. Um, the, th the, the site was to be ha uh, held for construction of a school or low and mo or moderate income housing. Um, there was a negotiation period between the school district and the, the site. Um, there were a number of timelines outlined in that uh, holding agreement. Um, and then the thought would be that if nothing did happen, the, the city could bring that back into the city if, if uh, the school district was not able to move forward with it. Um, some key points on that history um, between um, 1988 and 2015, um, just as a note, it was amended 12 times. So it's been in front of the council a number of times over the years. Uh, the two two main pieces, uh, two main important dates that happened in this timeline was in 2003, um, which changed the agreement and which allowed for the site to be developed as affordable housing for its employees, or the city could develop that site and then uh, develop um, low and moderate housing um, with preferential uh, use for uh, at least 50% of the district employees. In 2016, uh, it was modified again, and essentially what happened was that they extended that for three years, extended the agreement for three years, um, authorized the city manager to extend the agreement if progress was happening. The intent there was assuming that uh, things started to move forward, a developer was chosen and the site was starting to be developed, that uh, we wanted to make sure we extended that MOU and had a flexibility with the city manager to be able to do that. Um, the other thing that MOU did was um, formalize the agreement and partnership between the city and the district, and that was an important piece um, to make sure that uh, the city and the district were working together to try to figure out how to make sure this site was uh, used to its, its best value. So a little bit of uh, location, uh, wh 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 the site we're talking about um, is in the northeast part of Santa Rosa and Fountain Grove area. Uh, it's right off of uh, Fur, Fur Ridge Drive. There's a little blow up of that. Um, it's 6.3 acres. There is about an acre size parcel that came with us back in the 1980s uh, that is just north of this parcel that was converted into a park. That's for, for Ridge Park um, on that site. So the site we're talking about is uh, identified here in red. Um, it's again, it's about a six acre site um, in the Fountain Grove area. So where we are today and why we're back in front of uh, the city council, um, the current MOU and the extension of the, the three-year agreement um, is coming due um, over pretty um, in the early next year. Uh, so the city and the district have been working together over the past basically year, looking at what we could do, how we can help this project move forward. Uh, we've had, met with multiple developers for the site to try to figure out if there's a way that that site could be developed as originally intended uh, per the agreement. Um, in addition to that, uh, obviously we had the fires that happened that um, had a big impact of this area, um, and that did change how that site was looked at, viewed, and also um, the, develop the developability of that site um, in terms of cost. Um, as uh, the council is well aware, there's a number of lots up there that uh, are being rebuilt. This site is 
basically does, doesn't have any infrastructure to it. It doesn't have any um, water or sewer. The, the, the tentative map that was approved for this site has since expired, so that would have to be redone as well. So a lot of work would have to go into developing this site. So one of the things that the city and the county did, or I'm sorry, the city and the uh, school district did was to look at what options uh, would we want to put into an a, amended MOU if the council wants to extend this to try to give as much flexibility as possible to, to realize the intent of this site to um, support the city, uh, the city district, um, the Santa Rosa district's uh, employees. And so we came up with uh, three, three main options um, with a couple subsets. Uh, one was to extend the terms, the existing terms, and those existing terms, and we'll talk about each one of these um, one by one, um, essentially means to develop that site um, as was originally intended. Uh, second option was to, if this district found that they couldn't do anything with that property, or didn't have the, the bandwidth or capability, they could revert that back to the city. Um, third option, the district could potentially sell the site and then use those proceeds for a couple different options, potentially. One is to build housing on another site uh, or potentially partner with another developer that's building housing, for instance, near transit in the downtown area to try to leverage those funds to go further. Um, and then a new option that, uh, that has been discussed was uh, uh, creating a revolving fund down payment assistance program for district employees uh, so that the money would continue to provide uh, benefit over, over the life of, of that um, um, fund. So I'm just going to go through each one of these real quick. And again, the, the intent is to get to have a discussion here at the, at the council level um, to, to hear, hear from the council if you'd like to include all these in a, a revised MOU, if there's ones that you, you specifically want removed, um, have that conversation and then we will take that feedback and then bring that back uh, at the joint meeting. So walking through these items, uh, the first one that we talked about is extension of the existing terms, um, which again, that existing terms really solidified the, the partnership between the district and the city um, towards utilizing this site. Uh, basically what that means is the district would need to establish a new subdivision map for this site. The original map is expired. Um, and then enter in a contract with a developer to develop that site. Uh, so we have language in the existing agreement about timelines, when that would have to happen, uh, when the notice would have to be um, sent to the city to make sure that progress was being made on that option. So this option, again, is essentially developing the site, giving more time, and allowing that to happen. The second option, again, if the district decided that they did not want to do anything with that site or there was, they ran into some issues in terms of either potentially selling it or developing it, that it could revert back to the city and transfer the title back to the city um, for low to moderate income housing on the site. So that's the thought, and then the city could either build on that site or potentially sell that site for um, doing other, um, creating, creating housing. Option three is, uh, has two parts to it. Uh, the first part is selling the, the site um, and then using those proceeds, pro proceeds uh, as I mentioned before, either partnership with a developer on another property, um, create, creating housing on another property, or potentially working on a downtown property in a transit oriented development project. And option 3B would be to sell the property, as, use those funds, establish a down payment assistance program, uh, the, the thought again would be it would be a revolving fund to allow for ongoing payments to help district employees get into home ownership. Uh, the other thing this would do would allow the district to leverage potentially additional other grant funds to increase the size of that funding and make that funding go further than what the, just the sale price of that home or that property would, would do. One of the things that we found when we started talking about this option is that the, the as part of the MOU, the, the council has the ability to put in some provisions or boundaries on a, a program like this, a loan program. And the, the, the boundaries that we came up with were was essentially the eligibility threshold. So does the council want to provide uh, some guidance in terms of who's eligible to participate in a, in, a, in a loan program such as this? And so we have a couple options here that we threw out. Uh, one is not don't provide a, a threshold, you know, let the district come up with that program and implement that program based on what they feel is, is appropriate through a public process. Um, or we set some some thresholds, so to low to moderate threshold from 80 to 20, um, 150 AMI, or look at a district schedule and actually look at what two teachers make on a certain, uh, uh, at a certain um, uh, uh, sen uh, senior seniority in the, in the school district. 
And so we took these three options in the district uh, ran some analysis and there's a letter attached to the packet that does a review of these different analysis to show the potential impact to district employees to give some sense of scale in terms of who would be affected if, if some of these were picked. Obviously the no threshold, um, we don't have any data on that because that would have to be formed, um, the, the program would have to be formed by the district. Um, the uh, traditional low, low to moderate, um, 80 to 120, um, there's an anticipation that about 382 employees potentially would be eligible. Um, 150 AMI look, looked like about 748. Um, and then the other approach, which again, was looking at what a typical two teacher household, um, I believe that is, uh, has a 10 year um, experience um, would, would make. And that opens up the door a little bit more to a broader subset of, of uh, employees. And so again, there's an attachment to this. There's more detail in the letter from the district and the district um, is here and there uh, we'd be willing to answer questions. Uh, we have district staff and uh, President Close and Superintendent Kanamara here in the audience as well. So that gets us to the, the discussion points. Um, so the, the big question is one, do we want to extend this, uh, amend the MOU to allow more time and options? If the city council wants to do that, then there's the question about what options do we want to include in that MOU? Um, do we want to provide a number of options or do we want to have very specific options as we move forward? And the last question that I'm going to ask is how, how long do we want that term to be to allow those options to happen? So those are the three main questions that we have today that we want to walk through. Um, put this slide up here so we can just to make sure that we address all these items. These are the items that we just went through, um, extend the terms, uh, transfer, allow the transfer, allow the district to sell the site, um, to create housing offsite or uh, create a down payment assistance program. Um, if that's an option that the council is interested in, do you want to have an income threshold? So if you don't mind, I'd like to just stop there and get some feedback on these options before we talk about the term of the agreement and if we want to move forward on, on extending this agreement. Great, so before we get the feedback, let's first see if there's any questions about the presentation. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so with number two, that'd be just a regular RFP process once the city takes on the... Correct, if it was transferred back to the city, we would have to go through a, a surplus process. Great, thank you. Ms. Gomes. Thank you, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, do we have access to hazard mitigation dollars to purchase the property so that we don't have people sleeping in a high fire hazard area? Uh, at this point, at this time, no, we don't have those funds. Do we anticipate in the future applying for funds for hazard mitigation for purchasing property in the Mount Grove area? The, the state has not released a program that would uh, afford us the opportunity to do that. Okay. Can we legally create um, something else on that site, such as RV parking, safe parking, an encampment under the concept of ownership? Can we put, can we use that for some of our homeless folks? Uh, again, right now it's, uh, there are no improvements on that site. So prior to utilizing that site, improvements would have to be made. And I'm not sure what the cost of that okay. would be to make those improvements. I, I guess I'm trying to, to figure out if it's an agreement for construction or an agreement that the persons housed there have income levels. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I, I think I understand that question. I, if. I'm trying to understand uh, the agreement was established that the site be held for construction of school, low and or moderate income housing. And I guess I'm trying to ask exactly what well, construction I, I means see. in this case. I see. So, so I think what we're, we're showing here is that the council has the ability to give additional guidance on how that property is used. So as we showed here, here's options that we came up with. So if it's additional options are interest of interest that you wanna include in this, we could do that. If we were interested in using percentages of units based on income level, is that an option? I'm not, it looked as if the choices we had involved this level or this level or this level, if we wanted to specify percentages based upon, for example, the percentage in the district of persons who needed housing in those levels. For specifically for the down payment assistance program? No, specifically oh. for the units. 
like would we could we specify uh, ten of the units are for moderate income, twenty of the units are for uh, low income, and twelve of the units or some percentage of the units are for. Um, workforce housing level like up to 150% AMI. Sure, so that would fall into um, option number one, which is essentially construction of uh, extending the existing terms, which has elements in the existing agreement about what the affordability level is. So if there's interest in changing that, that would be something we, we, we would look to adjust in the uh, revision for option number one in terms of if units are built, here's the expectation of the city of how those units are built. I guess I thought it might also involve option 3B. Well, three three B would be uh, more towards who's eligible for uh, down payment for assistance down programming. Payment assistance so, program. it, okay. Yep. So, so let's ask answer that piece also, which is, can we do it as a percentage, or do we have to go all or nothing? So, so a couple couple options here. The the right now the district isn't set on any of these. They need to go through a public process to determine what they want to do. Um, if if a down payment assistance program is something the district is interested in, the way we looked at that is that they would need to create a program that tried to address how, what the need is. And so we could we could provide that guidance or we could leave that up to the district to come up with that program and present that to the council um, in I terms see of how, how it's the used. Process is. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This question's up for our city attorney. Um, is there any impediment to us transferring the property to the, the school board and um, with the request that they use it for housing and letting them figure it out? The current agreement, um, under the current agreement, the property is in the hands of the school district. And um, under that agreement, they can develop for uh, either school facility or low and moderate income Household, are you? Is your well, question? Could uh, yeah, we my question has to do them? with, um, you know, is it possible for the city to um, to no longer be a party to this MOU and say to this school board, you guys are elected officials and adults, and go forth and figure this out. And so that way it doesn't continue to revert back to the city and we don't continue to go through this process and use your creativity and abilities to make this happen and leave us to you know, manage some of the other things that are more typical of a city. The, um, this agreement was a condition of the subdivision of that um, particular portion of Fountain Grove and um, these conditions you know, again, are, are, are part of that original approval. Um, it sounds like you're asking if we could just simply relieve them of all those obligations and hand them the property. It would be our recommendation that, um, that in, uh, to be consistent with that original approval and the original conditions of approval, that this property or the proceeds from the property be used for um, housing, you know, some sort of affordable housing uh, and or for school facility purposes. Um, and the options that are laid out here um, all do that through one mechanism or another. And um, as we, you know, we've been working closely with school district staff in developing these. Um, so there has not at this point been a request that we simply relieve them of that obligation, there would be some findings that you would need to make in order to undo those original conditions of approval. But again, um, it's our recommendation that it stay in the general um, theme of the original conditions of approval. Okay, thank you for that. Um, given that um, and given um, you know the 3A, 3B, and all of the conditions that have been proposed. Does the, do those conditions um, put any responsibility on the city in terms of enforcement? Do we have to sign off on a contract or that sort of thing um, if the schools are successful in in one of those options? Um, we would be signing an MOU um, with the city and the school district and the, M the discussions, we have a preliminary draft, um, uh, do have some um, triggers 
uh, in the process where the school district would be making some decisions within a certain period of time. And uh, uh, if they failed to do that, the property would again revert back to the city. So there's some mechanisms built in, but that's all still subject to negotiation um, as we go forward. So, but last question. Mm -hmm. Sure, let's take a five minute recess.
we're good. Okay, we will reconvene. Mr. Sawyer, is there some an introduction you'd like to make before we continue? Yes, I would. I'd like to introduce Amy Ricard. She is with Leadership Santa Rosa, Class 36, and taking advantage of this opportunity to sit with the council um, to prepare for their government day. So welcome, Amy. And just to clarify, Mr. Sawyer, you're a class what? Uh, Mike, I was class 13, so <laughs> this is now, it's treble. Fond memory. Three times that. Okay, Ms. Fleming, I think we, you, you still have the floor. So I wanted to follow up. If the city puts all of the conditions um, on the school board, do we have the capacity to mon monitor that? You were mentioning that it, uh, there were certain triggering events that would perhaps uh, precipitate our participation and wanted to make sure that we had the bandwidth internally to deal with um, a really detailed um, conditions of sale. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer that one very quickly and then I'll go back to your prior question regarding okay. um, the, um, the triggering effects are not complicated and I think we do have the um, capacity to address those should those occur. But going back to the, uh, the the more general concept of releasing the property from these restrictions at all and, and uh, allowing the, um, the district to proceed on kind of unencumbered by the holding agreement or by any of the MOUs, the original holding agreement um, did also um, involve the developer and the original holding agreement provides that if the district fails to perform uh, the property can revert back to the city. If the city then fails to form, perform, the property can then revert back to the developer and be free and clear of any of these obligations. Um, that was again back in um, uh, 1988. Um, we would have to track down where the developer or their successor is, um, but it does put a cloud on any, any proposal to um, uh, uh, simply walk away from the holding agreement. It would not be, it would not end with the city walking away from that. And how would we measure a failure in this situation? If it's not developed in accordance with, you know, the original plan had some deadline, the original holding agreement had deadlines um, by which the, the district was to either build um, a school facility or housing, that those deadlines have been extended by the series of MOUs that, um, Director Guin mentioned earlier, um, so so the, the the timing has the 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 deadlines have just been extended again and again and again. And what we're looking at now is some other options to move forward, uh, maintaining the spirit of the original holding agreement and the MOUs that followed. Okay, thank you, sure. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. That, that's helpful. I was actually, my question was going to be around the history and you helped explain what our obligations are to perform. So this doesn't revert into the, the hands of that, that developer from that agreement. Um, but what, how did the property actually come about? Did it come into the school district's possession? Did it come into ours, the gift to both? I'm, I'm trying to get to the root of the history here because it's going to shape some of my comments uh, going into the comment period. But I think it's fantastic that we're working together with the school district and getting to kind of, you know, figure out what the best pathway for it is for teachers getting to live here. But I also don't want to overstep our grounds as far as what, what rights and claims do we actually have to this property because my understanding is this was essentially a school district property. So I'll put this um, the history up here. This is a, a short version of it, but again, it was originally between the city and the sub, subdivision developer, and so that was um, to be held, and then then it was um, negotiated. There was a negotiation period for the school district uh, to, to take that on, and then there was an agreement later on. Um, I don't believe it's listed here, but in the history, there's an agreement when it did officially get transferred to the school district, so the school district has possession of the site I, to do th those elements. And, and I, can, I can clarify that. Actually, the original 1988 agreement um, did include both the development company and the city of Santa Rosa, um, and it did provide for um, transfer of the property to the school district upon recordation of the final map, okay. concurrent with the final map. That, so. that was the, the specific, yeah. thank you. Sure. Uh, and then my second and final question is actually either for um, the superintendent or the board president, uh, but what is your 
preferred use of this going forward? I want to make sure we ask you that question before we. So, so we have President Close who's up at the top. Uh, Hi, I was planning to do this in public comment, but I can I can d just give you my comments now and answer uh, to your question. Um, so first of all, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council Members, thank you for having us here and for engaging in this conversation. And I really appreciate the work your staff has done with our staff to come to some uh, good resolution here and figure out kind of the highest and best use of this property that serves our district in a way that ultimately serves our city because that's what we do as a district is serve the citizens of our city. Um, we, you know, this property is hard to develop for us. It's expensive. To, it was expensive for us to develop before the fires, and now it's even harder and more expensive after the fires. Um, but we have a need to make housing easier and more accessible for our staff. We have a teacher shortage and we have basically a hiring crisis in our district because we have a limited pie that we get from the state, as you know, to pay our employees. And we have expensive housing and uh, housing that is not uh, super available in our community. And so we need to make that easier. Um, so there are other ways and we appreciate, um, again, your staff's creative uh, problem solving around this and talking to us. And some of the ways that would help is either to sell the property and use that money in order to piggyback on another development. That's possible and the school board will have to discuss that. Um, or um, we did a survey of our, all of our staff members and said, what would be the most helpful for you um, with respect to housing? And 67% of them said down payment assistance. Because even if you're at the top of our pay scale, it took you 25 years to get there and you didn't get to save a lot along the way because it's expensive to live here. Um, and so they said down payment assistance. And so for the best thing for the district would be the flexibility to do, to do one of those things, sell the property and use that money to get on to another development or sell the property and use that money to create a down payment assistance fund that would benefit the district in perpetuity because it would be a revolving fund. Um, and so that's what we would ask this council for is basically to give the district the most flexibility to serve our staff so that they can better serve our community. Thank and you. Thanks for the question, Council Member Tibbetts. You're welcome. Uh, one, one more follow up question, and we may not be able to talk about this outside of closed session, but what was the most recent appraised value of that property? I don't have that number and it, it, anything we did, actually I don't think there was an appraisal before, even before the fires that we have. Um, so I, at this point we don't know. We'd have to go through that process. Okay, thank and, you. And if I may, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I did misspeak a little earlier. Um, at the close, uh, at the recordation of the final map, the property did come to the city and it was a couple of years later that then it was transferred to the district in accordance with the terms of the holding agreement that was recorded in 1988. Okay, thanks. Any additional questions from council? All right, Mr. Goon, I know there's several other slides, but I'm interested in maybe taking public comment now because aren't all the other slides just in response to what council direction? Yeah, and I could, I, I could finish the slides real quick before we go there if that's okay, because sure. I think the one other element, so again, input on this in terms of what, if we want to extend the some of you and, and do we want to include these options? Um, the other important piece of this is the time of the MOU. So this is the situation where how much time does the district have to satisfy any of the requirements in that MOU in terms of notifying us what direction they're going or some other th trigger threshold. Um, so that's something that we've had. The current one is three years. Um, we've you know we're, we've looked at three, four, five years in terms of what what's possible. Um, but again, we want to see something happen. I think the district wants to see something happen, and we're all motivated to see something move forward on this site. Um, but again, we also we're also hearing we don't want to keep coming back to council over and over again if we we can't get something to happen. Um, and so the final uh, slide here really was to just let you and the public know what the next steps are. So we're, our goal here is to re receive feedback uh, from from you and the public, uh, get some guidance on what you would like to see. We will take that feedback, uh, craft, modify, do whatever we have to do to get uh, some document in place that has the input that you have create, um, given us. And the intention is that we'd bring that back to the joint uh, city council uh, school board meeting on October 14th. Uh, and ideally we would take action there on that night with the school board and this, uh, the, the city council um, to, to get this project moving forward. Great, thanks for the additional information. All right, a couple cards, uh, George Uberti, followed by Ann Seeley. Thank you, council members. Um, 
I think what's very clear here is that very clearly what we need in Sonoma County is more affordable housing. I mean, period, that's what we need. Um, and affordable housing, housing is by definition not profitable. <laughs> if it were profitable, it probably wouldn't be affordable. So it's something that this city needs to do, particularly if the school district is going to pay people low income wages. If we're going to pay them a rate that they can't possibly afford housing at, we're gonna to need to do something about that. I mean, we have a responsibility. That much is clear. Um, now, what is also, I think, incredibly clear um, is that these three options are a very, very flawed way of examining what our options are. The first one is to extend the terms. Now, I'm looking at this memorandum of understanding, and it's saying that between 1988 and the present, um, this memorandum of understanding has been extended 12 times. Now, that's 30 years we've been doing something with no results. I count four bullet points over a period of 30 years, one of which is to issue a request for proposals to obtain a developer, but we've just heard city staff say that a developer was part of the initial uh, holding agreement in 1988, right? So what's that bring us down to three actions that have been taken over the last 30 years? That's one action a decade. Now, this says that uh, the district has acted in good faith in attempting to, I don't think one action every 10 years is good faith. I think that we're, we need to make, we'll take a real look at why we have consistently done zero things, all right? We can't just have done nothing for 30 years. I mean, literally, not, I mean, show me what's happened. Uh, a request for proposals? Two requests for proposals for something that the, we already had? I mean, this is nonsense, all right? Now, I think what we can do, right, and, and an option that we haven't explored is uh, taking a real look. If what we're trying to do is make sure that people who work for the city have a place to live, and not just that they have a place to live, but that they have a way to eventually raise themselves out of a social position where they're required to live in affordable housing, right? We, let's get a plan together along those lines. Clearly, we need to build affordable housing, but that's a component in a larger plan of elevating people out of poverty, of giving people the tools to work their way to a better social position, all right? That's what we need. We need social mobility for low-income people, right? Not just 30 years of pretending to sort of kind of do something that results in nothing and then we're just gonna sell it to somebody who's gonna turn a profit off it. That's not an option, okay? What is an option is that we take a meaningful look at how to ref fulfill our responsibilities, get a, get a meaningful MOU, I mean. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Seely, followed by Dwayne DeWitt. Ann Seely speaking for Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa. The bottom line on your decision today is this property must not be lost for low and or moderate income housing. Any of you long-termers there on the council and in the staff know how difficult it's been for us to address placing affordable housing all around the city and the loss of this parcel would be a tragedy. So please keep that in mind, whatever option you choose. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland and I'm a part of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group, which was formed over 22 years ago because we have a lack of affordable housing in Sonoma County. I remember in the 90s when this matter came up and it was pointed out that it was very important to make sure and have affordable housing. I think it's really important to not use the term low income anymore. That bothers people. They don't wanna hear that. They wanna hear housing that is perhaps um, of modest means for people of modest means. Something that's more temperate so they don't feel bad up in Fountain Grove by having somebody who might not be in the same social strata. The school district is actually the people who should be deciding this without losing that property. That is an asset that they have and if it goes back to anyone else, the housing will never be built. 
I can tell you that right now from just watching over 30 years. And I bring it to a point with um, Bellevue Ranch, 1994, 95, 96. They said they were going to put in 64 affordable multifamily housing units and brokered a deal with the city saying that, yes, this is how we'll get it done if you'll give us the approvals. City gave them the approvals, and lo and behold, they said they couldn't make it pencil out. So guess who paid for the housing? The taxpayers. And it was built by Burbank Housing. And everybody applauds that because, wow, a low income development got put together, but it was the taxpayers that paid for it. And then they were sold on the open market, and those people were allowed to make profit when they resold them. So the taxpayers didn't even get a return, in a sense, upon that investment. Now, the dilemma here is that the school district is not necessarily in business to make a profit, but they are in business to educate all these kids that keep wandering in here right now and making sure that they have a place to live here in Santa Rosa in the future. So I think the best way to handle this is to look to the school district and say, like Ms. Fleming said, hey, you guys got the knowledge, the skills, and the talent. Now step on up and give us that affordable housing for the instructors and the school district employees and some interns and some teachers in training, people at Sonoma State. Heck, maybe even a really good senior in high school somebody that might have had to be out of their house, living in a garage, let them be up there on the hill in Fountain Grove. They can see what the future might hold, having a really nice place up on the high hill instead of part way down. Anyway, you get the major drift. School district, it's on you, thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Do we have any other cards on this item? No. Yeah, Jenny, you said what you wanted to say, right? Great. Um, back to council, any uh, additional questions based on any of that feedback? Okay, Mr. Sawyer, would you like to start and give your feedback to staff? Well, I'm looking for the, the flexibility as well, but I'm also looking for the a, a um, kind of three years is probably, and there's been enough time. I know that there there's always something new on your plate and you know, the school districts have lots of challenges, and so all of a sudden the three years is gone, which we know how fast three years can go, um, but I would like this to come to fruition. Um, I'd like this to be the last um, uh, extension, uh, but I think offering as much, uh, as many possibilities, as much flexibility as, as is necessary for you to do what you feel is best for the district. Ms. Combs. I think my answer is none of the above. Um, I continue to say about the high fire district in Fountain Grove that we should not add sleeping facilities uh, into the high fire area. And I appreciate that we very much need housing and we very much need affordable housing. Um, that said, if there is any mechanism we can use to transfer the property directly to the school district with conditions, I think that we should let them make the decision about how they configure the affordable housing on the site uh, and that it, we should not be involved in the conversation once we've given them the housing for teachers. Um, I appreciate we need teacher housing. Uh, I am disappointed that we do not have available hazard mitigation money so that we can buy property uh, so that we can eliminate the property from housing availability and put their housing in a much safer place for teachers. So thank you. Ms. Fleming. Okay, go I'm, ahead. I'm gonna jump in. All right, um, I wanted to, to just express my deep support for what the district requested and that's option two or three. I think if we go forward and we focus on those two options, both through an MOU expressing that I want to stay in partnership with the district on this and continue to work with them, I think that's the best pathway forward. I understand that it, it might be easier just to say, hey, you know, let's walk away and hand it to them. But the reason why I'm really concerned is I think there's a real underlying opportunity here that the school district has tapped into, and that is this concept of doing silent second down payment 
mortgages to help people uh, build equity in a home. And I think, in, and this came about during the housing bond conversations we were having, but to construct, usually our skin in the game as a city for a new affordable housing unit today is between 120,000 and 150,000 per unit. That gets leveraged between four and seven times and then you get a unit. But when you do these silent second down payment assistance programs, the cost to the city is actually closer to fifty to eighty thousand dollars per unit to get somebody into a home, and not just into a home, but into a true power or a true um, empowered position where they're now building equity and a stake in in physical property in this community. And I think when when we talk about social equity and social justice, that's the real. I think key that the city has to, to drive for. And if, if the this, this school district is leading us on that, then we need to join them in that. If we put the proceeds of this property uh, to help achieve that goal, then I really think that, that we need to also work with them to do that from the city side. Because God knows we're, with all this development that we're doing, specific area planning, we're going to have anti, or we're going to have gentrification and we need to have anti-gentrification methodologies in place to counteract that. And I think this concept of the silent second is a great way to do that and the best bang for our dollar. So I, I would say I hope this council can embrace that. I hope that the, the school district can embrace that and we can work in partnership to bring that together in the next year. Ms. Fleming. Thank you. Um, I, uh, first of all, I want to make sure there are, there are three things that you wanted to know about. Uh, time frame, uh, options, and there was a third one. Can you reiterate so I make sure that I get? I think the third one was if, if there's interest in a down payment assistance program, are there eligible or income thresholds that we want to include or leave it open to the district to come up with the program? Okay. So I'd like to, um, again, give empower the school district as much as possible and take the feedback that we heard today from President Close um, in as much as possible in crafting what will come back before all of us in two weeks' time. Um, I'm certainly not a fan of options one or two. I would like uh, this to be something that the school board handles, and then um, I would like to not see this again if possible, but I would like to extend the time frame to five years for both, for two reasons. One is to give the school as much time to execute uh, an agreement and also to save staff time. I think that, that extending the time frame will give everybody the greatest chance of success here. Um, and then um, I do echo what Councilmember Tibbetts says around the down payment ass assistance and the, um, the second, um, the silent second. Uh, I just want to be really clear that the, um, the final question around the, the limits, um, I, I would again defer to the school board. This is something that is supposed to be for them to use to support their teachers. And if that's the spirit of it, we expect them to, to carry that out. And I can't see any reason why they wouldn't want to. Mr. Tibbet, you had some other comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, David, that I forgot to give you direction on the thresholds. That's something I'd want to work together on with the school district as, I mean, I think the next step is going to be we hear what the school board wants, whether that's option two or option three. If it's option two, then let's discuss two. If it's option three, let's discuss three. But I very much want to have a conversation about income threshold limits, maybe, maybe not pertaining to their staff. That's probably best determined by them. but. If this morphs into something larger, I, I want us to be actively involved in our own conversations around that. Okay, and can I clarify when you say option two and option three, or do you mean option three A and B, just to, yes. just to be clear? Okay, yes. thank you. Go ahead. Uh, following on what Mr. Tibbet said, I'm trying to understand, is, there, is it possible that the school board would be able to use this for anything other than housing for, affordable housing for their employees? So the, the way the agreement is would be set up would, would be for these elements. So if it was something other than these, or they would have to come back, the council would have to would have to come back to council to get that direction. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I was joking with John when we came down here that when the school board first started working on this, I was nine months old. And I don't think it's because they've been sitting on their hands. I think it's, I think I'm willing to believe them when they say that this is an extremely difficult property to actually develop. I think we've seen that from other projects in the area in particular. Um, normally, my inclination would be uh, to 
go with option two and try to assist them in that. But I do think providing them the flexibility that option three has is actually in the best interest for everybody. Uh, it's not just a school board problem to not have teachers able to live in the community. It's also a city council and a community problem as well. And if giving them that flexibility to determine for themselves how they're going to use the funds from that property uh, actually ends up seeing some form of units come to fruition, I'm happy to, to support that. As it comes to the income threshold question uh, for, for subsection B on three, uh, you know, I know that a lot of the times the funding that's coming to them and the, the wages that they're able to pay their employees is more tied towards what the state is doing and how they're tying their hands. And so I don't know, I'll need a little bit more information when we go to our joint meeting with the school board on what that looks like, because what I would hate to do is tie their hands on the housing in a way to where the, the state then reacts and hopefully, Hopefully the state reacts in a way where everybody would become income ineligible because they'd make too much money. But I don't want to hold my breath on that. I definitely don't want to tie the school district's hands until I have more information. And can I do a follow up on the, uh, the length of the agreement? So do you have any input on that? Well, I mean, I'd certainly say less than the 30 years that it's been so far. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, if you're proposing a three year and if they think that that's feasible, that seems fine for me. I didn't hear your comment to Mr. Sawyer, but I was thinking that, were you even alive when we started this discussion? So um, for me, uh, my um, preference is the maximum flexibility. So I guess it'd be um, option 3B. Um, and I, I'm not, not really interested in the threshold. You know, I appreciate the reach, um, reach out that the school district did to its employees to find out what is that need. And I would just, uh, I'm comfortable there and continue that process. So why would, you know, if I set a threshold, it'd be very arbitrary, let the data drive, you know, I get the intent, we need the housing um, for their employees. So whatever that make, makes that work. And I do think uh, three years is a, it should be an efficient timeline to, to get this thing done. So with that, do you have any other questions or did you get the information that you needed? I believe I got the information I needed and I think we could take that and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work with the district and bring back an item on the 14th for you. And just to, uh, to let the council know, uh, the district is also gonna be having an open public meeting on this topic at their October 9th uh, school board meeting to discuss this prior to the joint meeting. And for those that don't know, that's an open invitation. It's in this very chamber, October 9th, correct? And what time does the meeting start? At 6, 6 o'clock p.m. Yep. this chamber, October 9th school board meeting. All right, thank you. Um, okay, we will now transition to our regular council meeting. Um, Mr. McGlynn, do you need some setup time for item seven? Yeah, we're gonna go item, we'll go out of order, so. Let's start first with um, announcement of the roll call. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Oliveris. Great, thank you. And Mr. Vice Mayor, would you like to introduce your guest? Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Mayor. So I also have a ride along today. I, I believe also uh, from our uh, esteemed program that's having Government Affairs Day the other, in what, two weeks? Yeah, for LSR. Uh, my guest is Melissa Stewart with CHOPS Teen Club, and uh, she'll be sitting back here for the entirety of the meeting as well, I think uh, until about, what, nine o'clock when, when we think we'll be done? Cautiously optimistic. Okay, we are gonna go out of order here. Okay, so as soon as they're ready, one of the reasons, item seven, we're gonna get a um, update from the city manager and it may require a different presentation, so we wanted to try to do time specific on that. So let's go to item five then. Um, Madam City Attorney, would you like to report on closed session items? Uh, yes, the uh, council met on item close in closed session on items 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. And on each of the three, they gave direction to staff and to council members. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are we ready to roll on item seven? Item 7.1, 
fire recovery and rebuild update. I'm going to have Adrian Mertens introduce her two colleagues for this update. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and council members. Uh, with me, to, uh, Adrian Mertens, Communications Intergovernmental Relations Officer. With me is Paul Lowenthal, Assistant Fire Marshal, and Dan Marinzik, Lieutenant from the Police Department. So good evening, council. Um, we're excited tonight uh, to introduce uh, two things. Uh, one is the public release of our evacuation planning. Uh, phase one of our evacuation planning. We'll get into what phase one and phase two are. And also uh, our high-low sirens. Um, following the Tubbs fire, obviously we, like many other uh, agencies across the, um, the area, learned a lot from what did and did not work uh, that night. There's been a lot of improvements uh, to our system and our ability to uh, provide early notification, detection, and alerts to our community. Um, but with that, it's always uh, been our goal to increase our public's awareness on evacuations locally. Um, we saw uh, most recently the county uh, roll out one of their evacuation exercises uh, in the Cavedale area, and they're working on a second evacuation uh, program and project for the Healdsburg area. Um, originally, uh, we looked at that as a potential concept here locally to focus on an individual neighborhood. Um, we decided that we would take a different approach and ultimately roll out uh, evacuation planning and education, as well as a comprehensive checklist for our entire community of Santa Rosa. Um, there's been a significant amount of work uh, that has gone into this uh, program from both the police department, fire department, city manager's office, uh, GIS support from IT, as well as transportation public works. Um, it's been a pretty impressive, uh, impressive uh, project. Uh, it's really good to see all the different departments uh, come together um, with the intention of really uh, providing a good uh, evacuation program for our community. So phase one uh, ultimately will be the release, uh, the public release, which is what occurred today of the evacuation um, mapping and checklist. Phase two will eventually be in early 2020 actual exercises for our community. All right, so, yeah, we're good. Thank you. Or, sorry. Give us just one sec here to pull up the website. Um, but building off of what the process that uh, Paul just described, staff have put together an evacuation toolkit that has a number of resources uh, that are available for residents to help them better prepare uh, in the event of an emer emergency evacuation. All of those resources have been made available on a new public website, which will hopefully load in just a moment. <laughs> Um, the URL for that website is srcity.org forward slash know your ways out, K N O W, know your ways out. We're having IT issues. One moment, please. Sure. Um, and while we're waiting for the website to load, I'll just say that while all of the resources are housed in the website, uh, this is really day one of pushing out all of this information to our community. Um, we have released a press release this morning announcing the campaign. Uh, we put it in our citywide newsletter, which goes to over 60,000 residents. Um, additionally, we did a visit with a couple hundred Oakmont residents just this afternoon to share the information and the new tools that are available and we'll continue to meet with residents in different neighborhood areas um, and push this information through all of our channels. For our residents that are watching at home and the people in the chambers, um, the website works. We're just getting having trouble getting up on the screen, but really um, the website itself will allow residents to physically go in and map their individual locations. Uh, we looked at our ability to um, really, like I said, provide the comprehensive evacuation routes for all the different parts of Santa Rosa. Originally, what we looked at was the actual uh, areas within the wildland urban interface. So we broke um, those areas out into specific um, uh, zones. 
not to be confused with evacuation zones, they're geographical areas that we designated to help with the mapping. So ultimately, a resident will be able to click on their specific zone, they'll get a printable PDF that will show all the different ways out that we recommend um, based on our evaluation of their specific locations that they can print out as well as that checklist. Um, we focused originally on the wildland urban interface areas and then the areas immediately surrounding some of those wildland interfaces. We ended up with approximately 25 different geographical areas. And then anything that was essentially left over that wasn't in one of those areas was included in a, a larger geographical um, zone that showed the major travel routes that would be used uh, during an actual evacuation. Help has arrived. There you go. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> All right, so um, when you get to the landing page, uh, there you can access the resources and the buttons at the top, the evacuation checklist, we have preparedness tips. There's also frequently asked questions on evacuations. Um, and then the searchable map itself, you can type in your address uh, to locate your neighborhood area or you can click into the map and that will bring up a link to your evacuation planning area for your specific neighborhood, which shows all the potential routes out of your neighborhood, and this is a printable document. Um, so there's a total of 29 different printable maps for different neighborhood areas or geographical locations. So definitely a lot of effort went into this, and thank you to our IT, GIS staff, all of our communications staff that were involved, as well as our public safety folks um, and traffic engineering. Um, and then finally, uh, on the evacuation alerting tools area, um, we do have public education uh, to inform residents of all of the ways that we would um, notify them in the event of an evacuation. And with that, I'll let Paul add a couple words. So one of the things we heard pretty frequently after the, the fires was people not knowing the, the need to evacuate. Like we've talked about at previous council meetings, uh, our ability to detect fires earlier uh, is improved now with the addition of the fire cameras. Those fire cameras allow us to activate the tools that we didn't necessarily have the access to back in 2017 that we do now. That includes the wireless emergency alert system, the emergency alert system, obviously SoCo Alert, Nixle, all the way down to Facebook, Twitter, and our radio stations. Uh, we're really excited now to to um, officially announce the new tool in our toolbox, which is the Hilo Sirens. Yeah, the Hilo Sirens is one of the tools that uh, we have added um, on the police department, and we have added the Hilo Siren to our marked patrol vehicles, which includes 52 patrol vehicles that now have access to the Hilo Siren. And the Hilo Siren is a European style siren that produces a different pitch than most normal sirens, and we're using that with our public education campaign uh, piece as a tool for evacuations. Um, we've coupled that on the police department's end of providing internal training to our employees on the use of the Hilo Sirens, what to expect when they're used, as well as worked towards an external communication piece um, towards educating the public on the use of the Hilo Sirens. So with that, I am now gonna get up. Um, I'm gonna walk over to the side of the council chambers and we'll activate uh, the Hilo sirens. We currently have a police uh, patrol car as well as a fire department SUV. We've outfitted our fire department staff vehicles with the Hilo siren as well. All right, that concludes the presentation. Any questions? Thank you for that presentation. Tell me you're not sweating when you open that door. Please, baby, that's gotta go. So. Usually it's the fire department that comes to the rescue. This time it was IT, so yes, I was worried that something was not gonna work. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. And I know the hours uh, of work that went into that. It... 
<laughs> we'll just keep talking when we don't hear that. Um, but I really appreciate the effort there, and I think you, you guys, your whole team is on, is on that cutting edge, and it's really going to help our community. As was evidence on Sonoma Ready Day, I think our community is ready to figure out that they need to be part of the plan. I think this information totally uh, accentuates everyone's own responsibility to have a plan in the event of another disaster. So, Council, any uh, questions on the presentation? Mr. Tibbetts? Thank you. I just have a quick question about your public education campaign. Are, what mediums are you using? Is this going out in mail? Yeah, so step one was just getting everything live and up today and making the big announcement through uh, social media, through our newsletter, and to the press. Um, but we are talking about doing a water bill insert with Great. the evacuation checklist, um, letting people know about the resources that are available online, and we'll be looking at some more targeted ways to reach residents as well. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just a huge thank you. I, I know right after the fire, we talked a lot about uh, community siren and horns, and I know we'll talk a lot more about that. But one of the concerns that we had immediately was how do people know what those sirens mean and how do they know where to go? Uh, I do notice on the, the checklist, which I think is really good, by the way, that there is a recommendation on here about not taking shortcuts because you don't know if that is going to be blocked. Is, is it the intent that by providing uh, these solid evacuation routes for folks that we can also begin to plan our response around it as well? That if we know more people are going to be on these streets, we can put more resources towards it and try to make sure that those are proper evacuation routes. Yeah, so one of the, the common questions we get is what, what is my actual designated evacuation route? And the reason behind the, the methodology that went into this is that there's potentially multiple ways out. And until we actually have the condition that requires the evacuation, we won't know which way we're actually going to take, but we want people to become familiar with all the different routes. The um, We actually just rolled this out shortly before we came here to Oakmont residents, knowing that that is one of the hot topics with evacuation routes as well as um, the uh, the fear of, of knowing when to evacuate, and then obviously tying into your original question, the siren issue. Um, we got through that conversation specifically around this evacuation planning um, with the way we would utilize those routes with flow of traffic, co coordinating with law enforcement, um, all the way down to the high-low sirens and actually had applause from that from that group there. So it's it's uh, effectively rolling out really well and um, doing what we wanted to do. And if, and council member, vice mayor, uh, yes, the, the, the work that will now, you will actually be entertaining an item uh, later this evening, which is about undergrounding of, of utility work. But that's exactly right. This, this becomes a frame work under which we can have other conversations about where we need to make sure that those areas are clear of potential hazards and get into the conversation about very directed with our partners about where they might need to underground utilities at, um, or build other types of resiliency measures to make sure that those paths are free and clear. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I hope going through this exercise has informed us a lot on those infrastructure improvements that we need to do. And I'm sure the public will see that over the next couple of years as we move that ball forward as well. So thank you for your work on this. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGillan, do you have any other items on this item? No, just a tremendous amount of thanks to the team. Um, they've spent many long hours uh, working on this particular toolkit for the community. So thank you guys. I, I agree. All right, let's move to item six, proclamations. Our first one up will be Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Ms. Combs, could you handle this item? Thank you. And I'm looking for Madeline O'Connell or Jessica Provost. Are you coming on down? Good. Come on down. Hello. So I'll read the proclamation. Whereas the city of Santa Rosa recognizes that domestic violence affects one in four families in our local community, and that the crime of domestic violence violates an individual's privacy, dignity, and security based on the systemic use of emotional, physical, 
sexual, psychological, and economic control or abuse. And whereas the YWCA Sonoma County is a community-based, not-for-profit organization affiliated with the YWCA USA, YWCA Sonoma County embodies its mission to empower, educate, and advocate for domestic violence survivors and their children who find they are unsafe in their own homes. YWCA Sonoma County operates our community's only confidential safe house shelter, the only 24-7 domestic violence crisis hotline, the only therapeutic preschool serving one of our most vulnerable populations, children ages three to five years old, as well as short and long-term trauma-informed therapy services, and whereas domestic violence is a serious crime that affects people of all races, sexes, ages, sexual orientation, and income levels, stopping the, vi the cycle of vicious criminal assault in the home requires a coordinated effort between the criminal justice system and the agencies that provide services to victim primarily reliant on the strong resolve and immense courage of survivors. And whereas only an informed community effort will put an end to the cycle of domestic violence, members of our community are encouraged to participate in YWCA's scheduled events and programs to support their mission to eliminate domestic violence in Sonoma County through awareness, education, and empowerment. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Tom Schwedhelm, mayor of the city of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire council, does hereby proclaim October 2019th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Madeline Keegan O'Connell. I'm so fortunate to be the CEO of YWCA Sonoma County, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. We're so grateful to you that you would kick off the very first day of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And uh, on behalf of our board of directors, our staff, our volunteers, and especially the clients at YWCA Sonoma County, thank you so much for your proclamation. We're grateful to be here again, and I certainly wanted to give our uh, personal and professional uh, uh, grateful, uh, sincere thanks for your financial support. Uh, in the past year, you've helped us expand our safe house shelter by five beds, and that is very significant, so thank you so much. Uh, members of our team are here today, and I wanna pause, and I wanna ask them to stand. They're a shy group, but they're right about there. They are, as you know, the real heroes of the YWCA, and recently they voted us a best place to work, according to the North Bay Business Journal. So thank you, thank you so much. We're also so grateful, you know, one of the things that you said in the proclamation, it's the coordination of effort, right? So we're so excited that uh, Chief Ray Navarro and his team would be here uh, representing our tremendous partnership. So Chief Ray and everyone at the Santa Rosa Police Department, our heartfelt thanks. Uh, I understand we've been working with you almost daily this past week, and we're very grateful for your partnership. So a big shout out. You know, regrettably earlier this year, last March, in fact, uh, our community experienced the loss of life when a wife at the hands of her husband in broad daylight was shot at a shopping center here in Santa Rosa. And that was followed by the accused gunman taking his own life only blocks away. As we know, our community struggles with domestic violence and the YWCA is here to answer their calls for help 24-7, 365 at that crisis hotline that you mentioned, 546-1234. Um, I wanted you to know that in the past year or so, YWCA has also become highly engaged in providing housing solutions to families in our care, and I'm so proud to share with you that we currently own and manage two single-family homes and a duplex, and we're working very hard to house families as they come out of our shelter. Funding specifically earmarked for the community's sole domestic violence service provider, YWCA, um, has been directed to us by HUD, and we are now actively involved in rapid rehousing right here in Sonoma County. As you can see, YWCA is on the move, and I'm here to remind everyone that we've been here since 1975, and we're gonna be here as long as you need us to keep Santa Rosa and Sonoma County families safe from harm. I wanna call your attention to our awareness calendar. I know that you have so many weighty and very crucial and important agenda items tonight. I'm so grateful that you would take a moment for the proclamation for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. 
We've partnered with a group called MOVES, that's Minimizing Occurrences of Violence in Everyday Society for their day of nonviolence later this month. And we're thrilled to have our friends at Treasure House create an open house for us um, with proceeds coming back to the YWCA. I wanna thank you so much for your gracious time and attention to my comments tonight and of course for your proclamation. And let's look forward to another successful year together. Thank you so much. Great. Our next proclamation is for Active Aging Week. Week, uh, Mr. Tibbetts, you have this item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so uh, I think we have Miss McBride. Yeah, come on down. So whereas age-friendly Sonoma County and the Council on Aging would like to formally acknowledge International Day of Older Persons on Tuesday, October 1st, 2019, and whereas International Active Aging Week is recognized October 1st through 7th, 2019, and whereas Monday, October 7th is recognized as Active Aging Together Day, and whereas Active Aging Week is recognized nationwide to celebrate positive aging and encourage health, well-being, and active participation in safe, age-friendly activities to share all that active aging encompasses. And whereas the theme for this year's Active Aging Week is redefining active, and active aging is about a broad engagement of physical, social, cognitive, spiritual, professional, and civic activities, and whereas, to commemorate Active Aging Together Day on Monday, October 7th, 2019, there will be a 30-minute walk through downtown, immediately followed by a rally in Courthouse Square for the community to support all persons aging in Sonoma County. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mayor Tom Schwedhelm of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, does hereby proclaim the week of October 1st through 7th, 2019, as Active Aging Week. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm, um, Council Member Tibbetts, the rest of the council. Um, on behalf of Council on Aging and the 130,000 seniors here in Sonoma County, um, thank you for recognizing this week. Of the 130,000 seniors, the vast majority are healthy, active, volunteering here in the community and basically supporting our community in so many other ways. So it's great to highlight that contribution. Um, we hope that you will come out and walk with us on Monday morning, leaving from the plaza, ending in Courthouse Square, and we will celebrate um, the 41% population represented by 50-year-olds and more. I think a few of you joined me in that category. Um, so thank you for your recognition. Um, Council, or, uh, Sonoma County is a uh, age-friendly community, and um, this recognition also demonstrates Santa Rosa's um, belief in, in having an age-friendly city as well. So thank you. Do you want to stay right here? Where's our IT guy? <laughs> right, thank you. But wait, there's one more proclamation, Fire Prevention Week. Mr. Sawyer, you have this item? Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Lowenthal, Assistant Fire Marshal Lowenthal, actually, and group. Thanks for taking the time to be here this afternoon. I'll read the proclamation. Whereas the city of Santa Rosa is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting Santa Rosa, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and whereas the home is the location where people are at the greatest risk of fire, and whereas house fires killed 2,630 people in the United States in 2017, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 357,000 house fires. And whereas the majority of fire-related deaths in the United States, four out of five, occur at home each year, and whereas when the smoke alarm sounds, residents may have less than two minutes to escape to safety.
And whereas Santa Rosa residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared, to, prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas all residents of Santa Rosa should practice different escape routes. And whereas the community has been responsive to public education measures and are taking action to increase fire safety, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme, which reads, not every hero wears a cape, plan and practice your escape, effectively serves as a reminder that we all need to take personal steps to increase our safety from fire. Now therefore be resolved that Tom Schwedhelm, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, urge everyone to be aware of their surroundings, look for available ways out in, an, in the event of a fire or other emergency, respond when the, fire, when the smoke alarm sounds by exiting the building immediately and to support the many public safety activities and efforts of Santa Rosa Fire and Emergency Services during Fire Prevention Week and do hereby proclaim October 6th through 12, 2019 as Fire Prevention Week signed by the mayor on this date. Thank you very much, Mayor, members of council for recognizing this proclamation. For us in the fire department, a very important week, obviously. The theme has a little humor to it, which is great, but the message is very important as well. We focus primarily our education where we get out into the community with the elementary schools to drive that message home at that level. And we know that that's gonna have a ripple effect to the families and that's gonna reach the adults as well. So for us, it's a very fun time to engage our younger members of the community through the assemblies that we perform during this next week. So from the 7th through the 11th, we'll be visiting 11 different schools and we'll conduct 21 different assemblies. So reaching a large number of our population at that elementary level. But again, the focus is really to help them understand what we're trying to build in our community is safety and awareness. And if you begin at your home and you can share that message, that gets passed on to many other people. So for us, we're very excited to have this read in front of our community and have it shared with you as well. So we thank you and greatly appreciate your time. Tony, where's the staff photographer? Thank you guys. I have nothing to report. <laughs> I was waiting for the chief to uh... On your time, Tony. Okay, no city manager report. Uh, Madam City Attorney, do you have a report? I have no report this afternoon, thank you. Do we have any statements of abstention by council members? Seeing none. Mayors and council members reports. Who would like to start? Ms. Fleming? I uh, had the pleasure of attending the Hispanic Chamber of Commer Commerce mixer that was put on here at City Hall, organized by Rafael Herrera, and I wanted to thank our economic development team for organizing that. It was a pleasure to get to meet some of the many business owners uh, in our, our downtown and in our city and more broadly in Sonoma County. And also, it was a great use of our space here, our courtyard transformed into a really charming space, and I think that we sometimes take for granted that it can be a really pleasant uh, place to entertain and to spend time together. Additionally, um, short of getting a, a picture up for you guys, I wanted to hold this up. Today, we made contact with space just a couple of blocks from here. Uh, it was really fantastic. The Sonoma County Libraries entered into a competitive process that they were successful in, in being awarded uh, a ham radio or an amateur radio on the International Space Station, which meant that 10 students from Santa Rosa Middle School got to ask multiple questions and we were up next to answer some questions and you got to see the space station just float out of range and hear the shh 
But at any rate, it was a fantastic opportunity. You could see how much care and thought the students put into the questions, far more than most of the adults who asked me if they could tag along <laughs> with their very basic potty humor questions. So these students are to be commended, as is our Sonoma County Library. Great, thank you for that report. Any other reports? Go ahead, Mr. Tibbetts. I actually have a quick question uh, relating to the use of generators. Um, I, I should have probably asked this in advance of this meeting, but Mr. McGlynn, at the next fire recovery and rebuild update, can we include uh, what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis generators and the decibel ordinances? I'm getting a lot of questions in the community about that. Um, I'll, I'll probably need some more specifics from you, Council Member, but I'll follow up with you about, about that question, but absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a couple things to report out on. On Wednesday, September 25th, we had a special meeting of the Economic Development Subcommittee. Uh, the subcommittee received information on the public-private partnership feasibility analysis update, and we provided feedback to the consultant on that. And we also had a brief discussion on the minimum wage ordinance. Additionally, on Thursday, September 26th, we had a home Sonoma County strategic planning session. We pretty much heard from the consultants about what the process would be and how they'd be gathering um, feedback to hopefully um, provide back to the leadership council for a more efficient and effective uh, team. I also attended the um, Thursday, September 26th, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Mixer. It was a wonderful use of our courtyard. I'd never seen it like that before. I do appreciate the efforts of Rafael and uh, Raisa Del Rosa and the other city staff, including our city attorney who uh, appeared there. I really appreciate your attendance there. Wonderful event. Okay, with that, we'll go to item 10.2.1. This is direction from the council uh, to the mayor regarding letters of interest received for appointment to the following vacancies. And basically, I think there's just one position. It's the North Bay Division League of California Cities Executive Board. Term expires two years from the appointment. Uh, we had a letter received from Susan Harvey, City Katati, and she withdrew that letter on September 25th. And then we received a letter from Mike Healy from the city of Petaluma. So I would entertain any motions, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just as a little bit of background information, because I see a lot of new people in the audience, the League of California Cities is a representative body of many of the cities around the state who get together periodically and talk about uh, issues of concerns that we're all seeing, uh, sharing ideas and figuring out how to move forward on that. Uh, it, we do have a North Bay Division that has every city in the county that has representatives to it. Uh, and so with that, I will make a motion for Council Member Healy from the City of Petaluma uh, to fill out that position uh, for a two-year term. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion to second. Any additional comments? Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 10.3.1, Ms. Combs, I believe this is your item. Thank you, Mayor. This is uh, a part of our process. Uh, tell members of the public so that they understand we have a three-part process for handling items that are not typically on the agenda. Um, last week, I requested that we agendize uh, an item considering the revision of council policy 23, uh, which is how to fill council vacancies. Um, in this meeting, we vote on whether to have the discussion in the next two, next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, so what I am asking is that we have the full discussion of how to revise council policy for filling council vacancies. Um, Part of my reasoning in asking for this uh, to come up now is that uh, we now have a number of members who are in districts and uh, our current policy requires that the seat actually be vacant and that prevents the person who is from that district from voting on their replacement which means that a district representative is selected by no one who lives in their district. The reason I'm asking for it now, though, is that it is possible that I will be vac vacating my seat. And because of that, um, I would like to have a voice to uh, in, the, in the vote um, 
for who replaces me um, specifically because I have a strong base and I would like uh, the seat to continue to represent that specific base um, and would like to have a voice in that. I also think it's a problem for the council that the seat must be vacant and then a fairly lengthy process begun and that leaves a considerable gap in having a full council. Um, so I think for a variety of reasons, it makes sense for us to have a conversation uh, regarding changing the policy for filling council vacancies. Does anyone have any questions of Ms. Combs? We do have one card on this item before I ask for a specific motion in a second. Any questions? See none, I do have one card, Dwayne DeWitt. Thank you, sir. Dwayne DeWitt from the unrepresented district of Roseland, currently in the city, but not allowed to have representation until the 2020 election. And that was a deliberate move on the part of a number of council members. It has essentially handicapped the district of Roseland and South Park also during activities that are affecting them in a negative manner. So I'm hoping that you'll put this on the agenda that you'll have a robust discussion, as you like to say, or in the words of the city manager, that's a conversation we need to have with the community. So let the community participate in this also. I do believe in the past, Ms. Combs was one of the highest vote getters at times. And I think it's really important that what she said about having her base represented should be also respected by the sitting council members. I don't know how it would actually affect my district, but it's really important for the future as you set this precedent that you perhaps allow the leaving person, if they don't die, if it's someone that says I'm resigning because of health, that they get to pick who might replace them. And that if someone does die in office or is uh, has to leave for malfeasance, perhaps something Trumpian like that, that maybe what we could do is actually have an election so that the district gets their person to be representative instead of somebody that comes from the Chamber of Commerce and the good old boy sector that we've always had before. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Um, so Ms. Combs, would you like to uh, make a motion? Let's get it second and then we can have discussion. Uh, I move that we, whoops. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we agendize an item to consider the revision of council policy 000-23 procedure for filling council vacancies, that we agendize that sometime within the next two council meetings. Uh, and I, uh, I hope you will consider having that conversation. Thank you. And is there a second for that motion? I will, I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Anyone would like to make any comments? Mr. Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, and for me, this has been a, an interesting discussion. I've been lobbied pretty hard by a number of folks on it, on whether or not we should make those change, uh, make these changes. I, I do think that we're going to have to make a number of elections changes relative to when we're in districts. I think we're going to have a conversation about an at-large mayor. I think we're going to have a conversation uh, certainly about the vacancies, but also about um, whether or not CAB members and planning commission members should come from a district as well. Uh, we're going to have to have that conversation holistically. And I will tell you by way of background, one of the first policy areas that I worked on when I was in Sacramento was on election reform. It was my favorite topic. It's something that's very interesting to me. And I've always had this belief that you don't make your election processes based on understanding what the outcome is going to be and trying to force the outcome that you want. And that's where I struggle a little bit is because Council Member Combs, you have been a great colleague and I hope you don't leave, but, and I know that your perspective would be valuable, but at the same time, there's so many questions about creating this opportunity for somebody to announce that they're going to be leaving and then backing out if they don't like who's actually the person who comes in. I think we need to have those conversations. I'm just not willing to put it uh, above some of the other things that we have coming in the next couple of weeks, whether it's the all electric or the evergreen conversation or uh, even our inclusionary housing policy, or excuse me, our uh, rental inspection program conversation. So uh, I will not be supporting the motion tonight. Any other comments, Mr. Sawyer? 
Thank you, Mayor. Well, I agree with the, the Vice Mayor. The, the, um, the process that we have in place, I have gone through. We do have a very robust um, uh, experience with the community coming forward. Lots of different people apply. They are interviewed. Um, and it is a, a combined decision by the entire council as opposed to any one council member. And I think because of the, the, the various changes that are coming um, on the horizon, that uh, there will be a, a number of conversations about how to, how to respond to the new district election uh, model. And uh, I'm not interested in, in this time at ch changing the, um, this particular policy, which also mirrors state law. Any other, Mr. Tibbetts? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is actually a, a question a question for you, Councilmember Combs, because I just heard um, John bring up an interesting point. They have a process, that process has, has worked in the past, uh, but the term that you used, Councilmember Sawyer, was, was full body, and I think, and while I support that too, I'm, I, I just want to make sure we're all talking about the same process that I think you have in mind. I, I am not suggesting that I appoint my right. replacement. I am suggesting that I can take part in the conversation. So you would be one vote. of seven I would still be one of seven votes. Okay. And I would also question whether or not we have had success in our past appointments, but because sometimes it has swayed the council one way or the other significantly. Okay, well, I, thanks. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding where this could go, and I appreciate the clarification. Mr. Sloney? Yeah, this, the issue around districts is of significance in that it is our first stopgap toward making sure that we have a representative democracy. While I appreciate the Vice Mayor's comments about needing to appreciate, to approach this holistically, I don't believe that we can wait to do these things. And to that end, I have appointed everybody to my boards and commissions from my district in hopes that if we don't get to it in time, because things come up, that we don't overlook the opportunities to increase representation. And if we go by the assertion that this process works, in the last 10 years, the last female mayor we had was, let's see, in 2012 she left office. So it's been seven years. If you look on the board up there, it's almost all white men. In Sonoma County, there has never been an African-American woman elected to office. This process does not work. And, and if we want to pretend that it does, I, we're fooling ourselves. The la in the last 10 years, I'm not sure that we've had, we've had one female vice mayor. I mean, this, Council Member Combs has been one of the highest vote getters, but has never been permitted to be the vice mayor. If we think that there is not sexism, racism, and classism at play, then we're deluding ourselves, and I'm not willing to be a party to that. Any other comments? Uh, my only comments, because I, I, I would disagree, it, it, in my recent memory, we have had to, um, our process has been a place, and it, they have been, in my opinion, two very effective um, council persons. And also, this position, if you were to vacate, is an at-large, it's not districts. I agree that once we do become all districts after November of 2020, that this is something that we will discuss. And right now, given the competing interest in priorities, because staff is gonna have to be involved, I don't, want, I don't see anything that we'll be discussing wanting to be dropped to the lower rung because we need to further develop this. So I won't be supporting that, this motion. And so, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that motion fails, three ayes, three noes, with myself, Vice Mayor Rogers, and Mr. Sawyer voting no. Thank you for the opportunity to have the conversation this week, but not next week. Okay, approval of minutes. Uh, we have the minutes from September 10th. Any adjustments to those from anyone? Seeing none, we will accept those. Mr. McGlynn, consent calendar. Yes, item 12.1, resolution, professional services agreement for investment advisory services with PFM Asset Management, LLC. Item 12.2, resolution, contract award, design build for audiovisual system at utilities field operations building. 
Item 12.3, resolution, amendment to the city classification and salary plan, creating the classification of stormwater and creeks manager and reclassifying one vacant supervising engineer position to stormwater and creeks manager. Item 12.4, ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa pre-zoning the properties located at 4200 and 4224 Sonoma Highway, also identified as assessors parcels numbers 032-010-023 and 032-010-024. Respectively, to the CG General Commercial Zoning District, file number PRJ18 050. Item 12.5, ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending the Santa Rosa City Code, adding a new chapter 10 46, Housing Anti Discrimination Code. Thank you, Council. Any questions? I do have a question on item 12.2, the audiovisual system at UFO. Go ahead. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, first? Brian Kilkenny, City IT. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding the source of funds for this improvement are the PEG funds? That's correct. And could you just explain what those are? Uh, yes, they come from the uh, cable subscriber franchise tax fees, and they're presented to the, or given to the city for providing a government meeting spaces, um, and broadcasting our meetings and such. Yeah. I, I attend a lot of meetings at the UFO, and that first screen, it always seems to be um, some visual challenges. And I'm wondering, would a fix to that um, screen be included in this upgrade? Uh, yes, the screens are going to be replaced. The projectors are also going to be replaced. Uh, we're moving from 6,000 lumens to 18,000 lumens, so it'll be considerably brighter. I'll trust that that'll be considerably brighter, and we can, my desired outcome is that we can all read it when we're uh, at one of those meetings. So thank you. That was the only question I had. Any additional questions? Okay, we have one uh, card on this item, uh, Mr. Dwayne DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland. I'd like to thank you for 12.5 in which you be helping veterans. This is very important right now because HUD VASH veterans are frequently not being allowed into units. This is really uh, the time when it's necessary because the rains are almost here. With the rains coming, I'm also concerned about 12.3, and I'd ask that you would explain better what this stormwater and creeks manager might be doing, specifically because in 2004 there was a Roseland Creek concept plan that was done with the neighbors in Roseland. We talked about it for years. It was finally approved in 2007, and we've seen nothing go forward upon it. We'd like to be able to know if this will be the person that we can work with to get the Roseland Creek concept plan put into some sort of action. It was a $100,000 plan that was paid for by the taxpayers. It now sits on a shelf. We need to help you find the funds that will get the actions undertaken. The community can do that. We've been talking to the Sonoma County Water Agency. We've talked to the Laguna Foundation, and there are funds available we just need to have you as the lead agency give us one employee who will be that person. I'm hoping it's going to be the stormwater and creeks manager. And last but not least, if there's any money left over from 12.2, please put that money into putting back the overhead projector here so that the public can give you evidence that everybody sees at the same time. That would be the ultimate in democracy and participatory approaches. That's community engagement at its best. Instead, you've taken it out, you've had years to repair it, and you're not putting it back in apparently. So take that time. It wouldn't take that much extra money on such a big contract to get the overhead projector back in here. You've got all this other stuff. You could get it going. I think it's one of those things that's about having a conversation with the community. Please do that as soon as possible. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, Mr. Rogers, you have this item. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm actually going to take this in two motions out of respect for Councilmember Sawyer. I'll do item 12.1 through 12.4 and waive for the reading of the text. He voted no on it. So we have a motion and a second. I'm concerned because we only have four people here. Do we need four votes for passing this item or is the majority sufficient? Looks well, like we've got another council member. I, I'm delaying till yeah. we get another council member. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second for items 12.1 through 12.4. Your votes, please. And that passes with five yes votes. And then I will move item 12.5 and waive further reading of the text. Do I have a second for that? Second. We have a motion and a second on 12.5. Your votes, please. Modern technology, we're working through it. Maybe we should use some peg funds on this. <laughs> We're oh so close. And that passes with four ayes, one no by Mr. Sawyer and Mr. Tibbetts abstaining. Thank you. We are going to take a one minute recess before we take public. Five minute recess? Okay, we're going to take a five minute recess. Uh, we'll take public comment, then move on to item 14.1.
Okay, let's reconvene our meeting. We'll start with item 13, public comment on non-agenda items. Mr. Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Kathleen Miller. Thank you, Dwayne. I wanted to come and talk with you today. Wait a minute. Hey, folks. All right. Do I get my three minutes up here, Keep sir? talking, Dwayne. It's your it's three minutes. It's not on the clock, sir. There you go. Thank you, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt, and I'm from Roseland, and I came today to talk with you about environmental justice and social equity. Those are going to be components upon the upcoming general plan, and I don't believe Santa Rosa has ever addressed either of those topics in any way, shape, or form that has been realistic or authentic. There's something called authentic community engagement, and I ask you to do that. But before that, I'd like to go into the Wayback Machine, and today I brought you a report from 1993 called the Final Report of the Southwest Area Plan Financing Plan. At that time, the city of Santa Rosa was preparing to annex Roseland, which took them all these years, just finished two years ago. In this, it points out the city had a park standard of providing six acres of park for every 1,000 residents. According to the park standard, this would be to the general plan. The total can include five acres of parkland and one acre credit for open space. After this was put into place, different folks came forward and said, you know, that's too much. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that we'll count schoolyards, we'll call, we'll call plazas and cement areas open space also. Essentially, taking away a bit of social equity for the Southwest and South Park also, because they didn't have enough green space already. And as a matter of fact, you just turned in a grant application to the state of, and you asked the State Department of Parks to help you because my area of Roseland only has less than one acre of park per 1,000 residents. So we're in a deep deficit for those social amenities that we need for true social equity, and yet we won't get them unless you folks make the decisions to work with the community on what we'd like to have. We'd like to have a Roseland open space system in which we can actually call out the spots along the Roseland Creek corridor where there is still a chance for nature to exist. Actually, what we hear is when the city or the county talks about park development, they're interested in spending money to put down hardscape to actually sometimes kill the nature that we would like to have our children see. We're in a real dilemma here because that's also environmental justice. Roseland is the most polluted area in the county. The Roseland Brownfields area along Sebastopol Road hasn't even been addressed by the city yet, even though the county went and got a grant for $392,000 from the US EPA. Come to find out, the city and the county haven't really been working together on it. So I'm asking you here and now to step up to it and get ready for environmental justice and social equity in the next general plan. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Miller, followed by Pat Mitchell. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm a little uh, nervous. I don't usually do this sort of thing. But um, the reason I'm here tonight, and by the way, I do support the 15 dollar an hour wage increase. I had to throw that in there. Um, is because I'm a new citizen to Santa Rosa, even though I've lived in the county a long time. And when I moved here, I wanted to become an educated voter and an informed citizen. I reached out to my council man, member and um, I wasn't able to connect and I'm feeling a little frustrated and isolated. I realize I'm, I'm not wealthy or politically connected or powerful, but I would like one hour of time to ask my questions and learn his views. So I'm hoping that my council member can respond to my request to meet. And also another council member who represents Smart Train I have some questions about that before that comes up for the vote as well. So that's why I'm here. I tried my approach, it didn't work. So I'm here tonight trying a new approach. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Mitchell.
Okay, so let's begin. Um, my problem seems trivial in the face of all these enormous issues that you're faced with today. Um, so I almost feel like I should apologize for being here. But I handed these out. Uh, hopefully you all have a copy of this. This is um, 4090 Walker Avenue, which the city of Santa Rosa owns that property. And uh, there are damaged, rotting, leaning trees threatening my home, 4060 Walker Avenue. They're a fire hazard. They're a real danger. The neighboring house is shaded, that's my house, in fall, all fall and all winter, even at four in the afternoon and at, in the morning. And there's a picture on the other page of that. In the, um, this costs us homeowners, my husband and I, um, high gas bills to heat our house. These trees need to come down. They're rotten, they're dangerous. If there was a fire, uh, we would have no chance. They're right next to us. And um, this is my fourth request. My first two requests were to employees of Santa Rosa City. My last request was to you, the council, and now this is the fourth request. I'm asking again that you eliminate these trees that are a fire hazard and a danger to me and my family. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have for item 13. We're now going to move to item 15.1. Oh, do do forgive me. I, I just arrived. Go ahead, Thomas. <clears throat> um, I was going to address this issue the last council meeting at the end, but uh, well, there, there there was no one here. But but I, I would have preferred to to address it at that time. Uh, but now the chamber's full. Uh, maybe this is a benefit. So a few weeks ago, the council was looking at uh, affordable housing that was a conversion of housing, uh, existing housing, with uh, a tax credit financing. And the, the affordable housing contractor owned the housing and wanted to uh, essentially refinance that housing. So I just wanna point out, this is really, really costly. This is not costly to us. There was no cost to the city, but the cost is with the tax credit. So in the financing, the, the developer, the owner, stood here and said they wanted to get the most return from the federal government that was possible, meaning that they refinanced the most that was possible on the housing. It was $88 million, and uh, the total uh, uh, expected valuation uh, $22 million probably would be the equity portion of that, which would be the tax credit financing. So the $22 million, 9% tax credit would be about $2 million a year in tax that would not go. So they would, they would shelter, uh, that would be the tax credit and it goes immediately to their taxes. That does not go in for 55 years. That's $110 million. It's very straightforward. $110 million does not go to the federal government for that $22 million of financing over five times as much as, the, as what was financed. So it makes it very expensive. Um, it does shelter income, that $110 million dollars of tax would shelter over a billion dollars of income. So it's extremely expensive. That's at the federal level. Uh, again, so it's not at the state level. There might have been state tax on it. it. depends on how they actually do it. But the point is, is that kind of financing, is this a wrong way to finance existing housing that is already affordable? We need to use those credits very uh, diligently. Yes, maybe that housing uh, um, affordable housing contractor or owner would then invest in other housing. They might not do it here. Okay, so there's no guarantee that they're gonna do it here. They're just making our housing more costly, right? So that's gonna be the actual price and sale price and everything about that would, would be up there at $88 million to be refinanced at that um, and can potentially make our housing more expensive and yet not benefit us. So it's, it's critically important that you act on those things that are local and produce housing for us, not, not necessarily refinancing somebody else's housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, move to 
Public hearings, item 15.1, Mr. McGlynn. Item 15.1, public hearing ordinance adding chapter 10-45 to the Santa Rosa City Code to establish minimum wages to be employed by to be paid by employers. Raisa De La Rosa, Economic Development Manager, presenting. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwethelm and members of the council. At its core, this item before you calls the question of expediting within Santa Rosa the $15 minimum wage state timeline by two years for small businesses and 18 months for large businesses. So uh, by way of background and to recap what was presented at the July study session, uh, SB3 was signed into law in 2016, setting the stage to raise the state minimum wage by set amounts each year over the course of six years for large businesses and seven years, excuse me, and seven years for small businesses starting in 2017. Come 2023, under this formula, both large and small businesses will be at $15 plus CPIW. For the purposes of the labor code, I'd just like to point out that the state defines a small business as 25 fewer employees and a large business as uh, those with 26 or more employees. This split uh, in terms of size of business is consistent with the vast majority of input we received, uh, both from a survey conducted in, uh, with the help of the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, as well as from meetings we've held with various business groups uh, and labor and individuals. So in, at some point in 2018, I believe, North Bay Jobs with Justice and the North Bay Labor Council began working with cities, uh, particularly in the North Bay, proposing local ordinances to expedite the state timeline. In February of this year, during Council's goal setting session, uh, addressing a local minimum wage ordinance was set as a tier two priority uh, that could be addressed and put on the docket uh, as soon as resources permitted. As luck would have it, resources eventually did permit, and uh, as mentioned, a study session was held on July 27th, at which the North Bay Jobs with Justice proposal that you see on the right uh, of the screen uh, was uh, introduced, recommending the tiered implementation starting in uh, January 2020 of an expedited timeline. Then in 2021, uh, small businesses would match large businesses at $15 per hour plus CPI using, unlike the state, um, the Bay Area CPI index. To gain a better understanding of the effects of labor's proposal, Part of the study session included a presentation of analysis by one of the authors of the UC uh, Berkeley Labor Center study. And what we learned then was that of the counties studied, and that was uh, Sonoma, Marin, Napa, and Solano, only 36% of North Bay workers would be directly affected by the expedited uh, timeline. Of that 36%, it's estimated that Santa Rosa's portion of the affected workforce is about 13%, or around 25 to 30,000 workers. Uh, uh, those workers then would see an average increase of, uh, in earnings of almost 16%. Some of the other main takeaways that day, uh, I think contrary to popular belief, are that mostly older workers with at least some college education are the ones who are currently making less than $15 per hour. Also, uh, the most affected workers by industry are in retail, food services, and health services. So uh, knowing that, uh, this of course means that the businesses that will be most affected are retail, restaurants, and healthcare services. The study pointed out that in order to offset the cost of business, the most common response to increase response by businesses is to increase prices on goods and services uh, and or to reduce staff and or reduce services. That said, the study found that while restaurant costs increased by 2%, prices increased only by about 1%. Whereas for retail and the general economy, the study found that there were minimal cost and price increases. While uh, this study is not specific to Santa Rosa alone, uh, the data and research sources in this study were pulled uh, from 
many different areas and are available uh, for further review. Uh, we have put the study on our website, srcity.org slash minimum wage. Uh, and uh, the sources included, and these are some of the sources that I looked at when studying this issue, are the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, public use microdata areas, as well as uh, other studies from such places as American Economic Review, the Federal Reserve, uh, Journal of Human Resources, and the Economic Journal. Uh, many more were, were sourced for that. At the end of the July uh, study session, direction was given to move forward with an expedited minimum wage ordinance using the Bay Area CPIW. Council also expressed a desire to remain as consistent as possible with other regional ordinances as well as with the state labor code. And lastly, based on questions asked during the study session, I did dig, dig deeper into the issue of enforcement as well as data uh, that staff can easily track and use uh, that could uh, provide indications of the effectiveness of uh, this proposed ordinance. Because we knew where labor stands on the issue, I spent uh, most of my efforts post-study session reaching out to uh, and engaging as broad and inclusive a spectrum of businesses as I could um, between July and actually, to be honest with you, until yesterday. <laughs> um, in addition to the dozen or so business group meetings that I uh, attended and presented to and got feedback from, uh, the draft ordinance was also discussed at uh, public meetings via the Economic Development Subcommittee uh, and the Downtown Action Organization board meeting. And uh, furthermore, we created a uh, policy document, I think you've seen this, um, w that has a number of policies, but we uh, tried to highlight uh, the fact that uh, minimum wage is uh, coming up as a discussion, and we uh, made this uh, available to a broader spectrum of stakeholders in the community. Um, all of the policies on that document have a uh, specific website or contact information list available. Uh, also in collaboration with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, we developed a survey uh, that the Chamber was very proactive about sending out, as well as sharing with uh, other groups to send out to their constituents, uh, including the Sonoma County Alliance and the Downtown Action Organization. Uh, that survey was open for almost two months and promoted throughout and ultimately received about 100 responses. Uh, lastly, on engagement, we, the, the city, chamber, and engaged stakeholder groups, uh, were relentless in encouraging folks to weigh in either by writing or showing up to council. And by last count, we received, I believe, 49 written correspondences thus far. Uh, and uh, I have to say, as a, as a staff person who's worked in uh, gov uh, government for quite a while, I'm uh, very enthused and invigorated to see uh, people who haven't normally uh, participated in government come and participate. So getting into the meat of the ordinance elements, or a little bit more into it, uh, first I'd like to start with key points on the state code that the city will continue to adhere to. I call this out because uh, in most of the meetings I had, there were questions about changing things locally that are actually under the state purview. So it's important to note that uh, in the case of labor and wages, uh, if there are conflicts between a state and local minimum wage policy, the policy that is most beneficial to the employee is the rule that must be followed. Uh, that said, it's really only the uh, condensed timeline toward the $15 uh, per hour minimum wage and the specific cost of living adjustment index that Santa Rosa, the Santa Rosa ordinance addresses. So as the state already clearly lists and defines exemptions to the minimum wage requirements, uh, the Santa Rosa ordinance stays consistent with those. So for example, um, as listed on the slide, learners are uh, people who are new to an occupation to, uh, for which they have no previous experience, they can, uh, and they can be of any age, uh, they can be paid at 85% of minimum wage for up to 160 hours, so those kinds of uh, exemptions still exist. Uh, disabled workers and nonprofit organizations that hire disabled workers are exempt, assuming they have the proper license and approval from the state. Uh, that's the same with apprentices. And what does not need special uh, approval from the state to pay less than minimum wage are exemptions for immediate family members, such as children, spouses, parents of the employer. 
There were many questions and comments raised from restaurateurs in particular about the possibility of tip credits, and I'd like to be clear on this. This is a state level issue in that the state code expressly prohibits any wage reductions related to tips or known as the tip credit for tipped employees in California. And while it's not listed on the slide, the question of healthcare credits was not raised by any, in any of the meetings uh, and we did not receive any comments on those and we did not address that at all in the uh, ordinance. So because council asked us also con to consider regional efforts, this chart shows what other jurisdictions have, uh, that have passed ordinances have done. And before I get into that, I need to point out that I made an error on the chart on this slide and therefore an error in the staff report and the attachment three, and that is that I failed to insert uh, in under the city of Santa Rosa column, which is the orange-ish column up there, I fail to insert the, that of course we would uh, be subject to the state minimum wage increase occurring on J January 1st, 2020. So the $13 uh, for large and $12 per, for small um, should be uh, in the column right above the, uh, the circled uh, portion up there. So uh, let's see, so if you approve the ordinance as is, Santa Rosa's minimum wage would uh, rise from a base of $13 for large and 12 for small as opposed to the what's shown there is uh, 11 and $12. So getting back to the other cities, uh, Sonoma, which came out of the gate first with their ordinance, and Nevada, the most recent city to pass an ordinance, are uh, more of the outliers to both state code and the North Bay Jobs with Justice proposal in that uh, where Sonoma expedites their $15 uh, timeline to 2021 for large businesses and 2022 for small. At this point, uh, they do not uh, sink large and small to a single rate, so that's the, the first thing. Uh, and then the second is that Sonoma City Council decided to continue to raise by a dollar per year the minimum wage by size classification until 2023 when small businesses will be at $16 per hour and large at $17, uh, at which time they'll revisit the issue and I understand uh, decide on the CPI and I think can address uh, the, the parity issue with the size difference. Uh, Nevada, on the other hand, implemented a third size tier to their small business, uh, uh, a third size tier to the size of the businesses so that small businesses remain 25 or less employees. A large is now 26 to 99, and the category they added is very large, which is 100 employees or more. Uh, furthermore, each tier reaches $15 per hour a year. Uh, uh, where they uh, reach $15 uh, per hour a year apart starting in 2020 for very large businesses, uh, January 1st, 2021 for large and January 1st, 2022 for small. So um, they do not reach parity with, uh, because with each year the uh, Bay Area CPI W is added to that wage calculation. Uh, so at this point it seems, as I understand it, they'll go forward with three different rates. Um, most similar to us is Petal Luma, though they implemented their ordinance, uh, they, they will be implementing their ordinance starting on January 1st, 2020, whereas for us, oops, as noted, um, we uh, will have uh, waited to implement ours or proposed to wait to implement ours uh, starting on July 1st. Um, so due to feedback we received and uh, in acknowledgement of the angst around the cost and preparation needed from businesses' perspective to plan for an increase, our ordinance begins implementation starting July 1st, 2020, allowing for nine months of preparation. Starting July 1st, 2020, minimum wage for small business would then rise 14% uh, from $12 an hour to $14 an hour, and large businesses would go from $13 to $15 an hour, which is uh, about a 13% increase. Six months later, on January 1st, 2022, both small and large businesses will be at $15 an hour plus Bay Area CPIW. Another thing to note is that, uh, like the state, um, Santa Rosa's ordinance does propose a CPI cap at 3.5%. Of course, the state uses uh, US CPIW, and again, we're proposing Bay Area CPIW. Uh, this was done as another concession to help businesses with their budget planning. 
And uh, the original North Bay Jobs with Justice model uh, ordinance does not propose a CPI cap. However, we also discussed this uh, with them, uh, as well as the proposed six-month imp implementation delay, uh, just to uh, see if they had any issue with it. At the time, they did not. Uh, so uh, it became a talking point for us as we've been reaching out to, uh, to businesses and the community. So about the consumer price index. So during the study session and to a smaller degree during discussions with the community, there were questions about the various consumer price indices that could be used. The consumer price index is a measure of the average change over time in the prices paid by urban consumers for a market basket of consumer goods and services. Uh, and indexes are available for both uh, US and various geographic areas. So firstly, it's good to understand the difference between CPIU versus CPIW. CPIU is a more general index that tracks retail prices as they affect all urban consumers, and CPIW is a more uh, specialized index. It's a subset of the CPIU that tracks retail prices as they affect urban hourly wage earners and clerical workers. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to point out that uh, there is a difference between U.S. CPI and Bay Area CPI, uh, or more specifically, when I say Bay Area, uh, according to the Department of Labor, that means San Francisco, uh, Oakland, and Hayward CPI. And that is our region. Uh, so this difference is because the average price for goods and services nationwide is, of course, uh, different than the average uh, prices within spe uh, specific geographic areas. So you can see this difference in this chart where our region is relative with a our region has a relatively high uh, cost of living, and so this is reflected in the average cost of goods and services tracked here uh, between 2009 and, and 2018. Uh, oh, uh, before I go back, I want to just point out there is an attachment in your packets that shows um, a, a more comprehensive look between uh, 2001 and uh, 2018. Um, and uh, I point this out while I don't have it on this uh, screen. I do want to point out that there were only two years on that attachment uh, when the Bay Area CPIW was higher than 3.5 percent, and those were in uh, 2001 and 2018. So once again, in listening to the uh, broader community and with the support um, at the time of labor, we added into the Santa Rosa ordinance a CPI cap of 3.5 percent, uh, so that the adjustment will always be the lesser of 3.5 percent uh, and the Bay Area CPIW. So uh, uh, just to round out this discussion, examples of policies that use various CPIs to adjust the cost of living, uh, because I know this came up in the um, study session, Social Security uses the U.S. CPIW, uh, State Labor Code also uses the U.S. CPIW, and then of all the regional ordinances that I've reviewed, um, they use the Bay Area CPIW. Uh, and uh, uh, the last thing I just want to point out, in the ordinance uh, under Section 1045.030, beginning in October, uh, 20, uh, uh, beginning in October 2020, uh, and then annually thereafter, um, the city would publicize the um, CPIW and the adjusted minimum wage effective for the, year, the next year. So it would begin in October uh, when we would notify businesses. Uh, enforcement was identified as a concern before and during the study session. Uh, in doing some digging, I was very pleased to stumble across and read 2016, A, 20, the AB 970, which uh, came into law in 2016. Uh, this bill amended the state labor code to authorize the labor commissioner to enforce local labor laws uh, and to issue citations and penalties for violations when deemed necessary. So it takes a lot of the burden off of us um, as the sole enforcement uh, arm for a local minimum wage, uh, and we can now then partner with the state on this. So while this codifies the state role, state's role in uh, local labor policy, um, to have an effective minimum wage ordinance, the city should also plan uh, to do its part. Um, and uh, so in speaking with other jurisdictions who've had uh, more experience or have had uh, higher minimum wages for longer, 
Um, we know that uh, the bulk of the uh, issues that come before them uh, are in fact uh, directed to the state. Um, and then uh, those cities that we talk to either have a defined program or they contract for services with a specialized vendor who can provide assistance to, um, to address specific labor issues. So our recommendation is a combination of all these options. So what isn't uh, referred to the state either automatically or by staff, um, which we understand again, it would be the majority of the complaints. We believe that economic development staff can manage the remaining issues either by, um, you know, working with the uh, business um, or by, if we need to, bringing in a compliance consultant uh, we could contract with, and we likely wouldn't do that until the next fiscal year. These next few slides are really just examples of the type of data or really data sources that we can track uh, that can help indicate uh, the influence of the minimum wage ordinance over time. The question of tracking and metrics came up during the study session and short of commissioning periodic studies specific to Santa Rosa, um, I believe these should suffice as uh, general indicators. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, page through them. The Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out a Santa Rosa Area Economic Summary, which is where these graphs come from, uh, but they also give us a uh, an occupational employment and wages overview, which is attachment seven in your agenda packet. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the means, as I said, to restrict tracking to Santa Rosa specifically. So I do want to point out that um, the uh, BLS data that you see on these slides is provided either uh, by the Metropolitan Statistical Area or by county or by the Western region as a whole. So some of the charts I think would be helpful, for example, our employment rates by sector, uh, average weekly rates as tracked by county, the annual spending graph by category, uh, which is tracked uh, for the whole of the Western region actually, and then um, the uh, over the year changes in selling prices received by producers on select industries, but that's uh, nationwide. Um, lastly, I think other indicators that I think will help uh, track, and of course I don't have them on this slide, uh, but just to point out, um, licensed childcare slots and average fees. We noted um, in uh, reviewing this that um, it's a good indicator in that uh, licensed childcare, the bulk of their uh, costs are related to uh, labor. Uh, and then also the number of Santa Rosa business tax certificates, which we, uh, year over year, which we already track. So um, finally, getting to the survey that was distributed uh, fairly widely by the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, um, what you have in your agenda packet is an earlier poll of respondents showing uh, 69 responses. Uh, in total, the chamber actually received 93 responses and were kind enough to share the data with us. Uh, I've only selected a few of the results to share in the slide, but uh, it's an interesting read in the comments uh, and uh, are interesting and the, the, generally it's a, it's a very good uh, document to sort of review and, and uh, see. So 55% of the respondents uh, represent corporations, 10% are sole proprietors, uh, but we also received responses from nonprofits, LLCs, partnerships, and um, a couple of uh, government agencies. Support for and against the minimum wage increase was truly evenly split with just one vote separating, or one, you know, I guess they're a vote, <laughs> separating the two of them. Uh, other things to note, most employees of the respondents get paid above minimum wage. There were 66% of the respondents said they pay their employees above minimum wage, with only 34% paid at the current minimum wage. Of those paying minimum wage, on average, 62% of the employees, uh, if I'm reading it correctly, hold part-time positions. 99% of survey respondents uh, target compensation at or uh, above market rate, um, though the survey didn't really define uh, actually what is market rate by industry sector. Uh, in reaction to what the impact might be on staff, in terms of staff benefits, nearly 60% said that there would be no impact, uh, but when it came to potential reductions in staff, 48% said uh, that they expected some reduction in staff levels or hours, whereas 39% said there would be no change. Uh, 
Uh, on a positive note, 17% 17 indicated they would, uh, that this uh, minimum wage increase would provide staff a greater stability or a higher quality of life. So the, while the survey was helpful in, in gaining general understanding of the uh, business community sentiment uh, regarding the uh, expediting of, of the uh, minimum wage, I will say that the more in-depth discussions with business groups and individuals was uh, most helpful in understanding how we can help mitigate some of the uh, identified issues within the ordinance. So uh, lastly, I'd like to spend a moment on compaction. Compaction occurs when wages for jobs that carry less responsibility get too close or even overtake salaries for higher positions uh, with more responsibility. This issue was brought up most directly and most recently uh, with meetings that I had with restaurateurs um, who pay uh, the example they gave me, their front of house, um, who are tipped employees uh, at or closer to minimum wage, whereas a mostly non-tipped uh, back of house employees earn more. So um, an easy way to explain this is as it relates to the city. During the study session, I presented some information uh, that uh, comp compaction for the city is not an issue. Um, while this remains true for the permanent employees within the city, we did find that we have compaction with our uh, seasonal uh, part-time workers with Rec and Park. So. And the number uh, that we uh, presented did not factor into compaction as I just defined it. Um, and taking that into consideration, um, we estimate for the city, for example, uh, compaction costs to the city would be closer to about $350,000 uh, starting in fiscal year 2020, 2021. That concludes my presentation. And so it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council introduce an ordinance adding chapter 10-45 at SEC to the Santa Rosa City Code to establish minimum wages to be paid by employers. Great, thank you for that presentation, Isa. And I also really wanna compliment you and your team for the outreach that you've done, um, both, I, I know, meeting with council members, but, but out in the community, getting all that feedback. So this um, very obvious is whatever decision we make, we'll, we will not struggle with the lack of information. So I really appreciate all those um, outreach efforts. Council, questions on the presentation? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I wanna echo what the mayor said, that this was has been an incredible uh, job that you've done to go out and get information and incorporating all the perspectives and and I definitely appreciate that um, I have a question and it was I was meeting with a group of students yesterday and he asked me to ask this so I'm asking on his behalf um, for it, employees who are working under the table uh, usually back of house what recourse and typically undocumented what recourse would they have in this environment um, to kind of earn the minimum wage and that's a tough one. I had a hard time answering because I thought, well, that kind of implicates a tax crime most likely. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, but A number one, it's illegal. I promised I would ask. Uh, but I would say um, one of the first things I would like to point out that the state code expressly states that uh, immigration status is not a consideration in the right to be paid minimum wage. So that's one, number one. Okay. Um, a, anybody, regardless of immigration status, and that um, the way the code states it, um, you're not supposed to ask that. Uh, anybody, regardless of immigration status, may wage a complaint with the state, uh, and they should. Okay, great, thank you. I'm hoping he's listening. Thanks, Mayor. Ms. Plumey. Thank you, and I wanna echo that I, I cannot appreciate enough how much work went into both your work with um, our local businesses and our um, labor community here. I do have a number of questions about the ordinance itself. Um, I'm curious to know, um, under AB 970, um, what uh, enforcement capacities um, does the state have that, are the state enforcement capacities limited to the extent to which we set forth uh, our, our fines or our punishments? Uh no, I mean, um, basically, uh, 
It, AB, uh, AB 970 authorizes the Labor Commissioner to investigate and upon uh, a request from the local entity to enforce local laws regarding overtime hours or minimum wage provisions uh, and to issue citations and penalties for violations uh, except unless we have already done so. So um, they have um, all the rights to uh, enforce our local uh, requirements plus the um, uh, plus those dictated by the state. Do they have the right to revoke a city-issued business tax license? Yes, and that is in the ordinance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering um, why uh, collective bargaining units were exempted from this ordinance? Uh, that was taken uh, from the North Bay Jobless Justice uh, model ordinance, and we kept it in. Okay. Um, do you have a sense of who the workers are that are most affected by uh, collect, uh, who are union members who are making less than the proposed minimum wage? I don't have that, but I have to say I don't. I mean, I don't anticipate you'd, you'd have to. Uh, if I if I recall correctly, you, they'd have to be told and understand what they are agreeing to in order to accept less than minimum wage. Because my sense is that it's hotel workers and women of color who are cleaning rooms who are going to bargain for better working conditions and or panic buttons to avoid sexual assault. And by having this in there, we uh, we are tacitly making it harder for them to both be safe and earn a living wage. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering why uh, we capped it at 3.5 percent of CPIW when, um, when it goes above 3.5, it's uh, a good year for everybody. Additionally, um, we have uh, a rent stabilization bill coming down from the state that's likely going to be signed if it hasn't been signed already that does not cap at 5 percent um, increase per year plus 3.5 CPI. And my additional concern embedded in that is that if we have a few good years, we're going to be out of sync with Petaluma and cause greater challenges with enforcement that have been seen in San Jose. Well, 3.5% uh, cap was um, something that was recommended or uh, I don't no, I'd say this is like it was a um, in recognition of um, some degree of certainty uh, that it could provide to businesses in planning for their budgets, um, and so that was um, one of the core reasons um, that we that we went with that. So sticking with that, if I'm a business owner and I want to be able to plan, let's say it's October now and not in this kind of a year where we're looking at um, this ordinance, but in a couple of years from now. And I want to know when I'm doing my pro forma quarter out or six months out for January or, or you know, mm -hmm. April, how would I be able to track what the CPI is so that I could have the predictability in my business expenses, regardless of whether it's 3.5 plus or not? Right. So um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, well, f for one thing, I, I, I think you have to be a savvy business person because I have to say I don't think many people actually <laughs> pay attention that much attention to it. But um, the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, uh, provides or keeps a running uh, tally and it is uh, available uh, again for the uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward um, region. Um, so you can look uh, at the averages as they're gaining through the, I think they release the figures every other month and so you can uh, begin to get a good indicator of what the uh, year and annual percentage will be. Okay, so it's fairly easy to predict early on is what you're saying? or in advance? Well, it's easy to begin to understand what the uh, percentage would be. Or the data is available. Is the right, point. the data is available. All right, thank you. Ms. Cohen, do you have a question? Okay. Thank you. I have appreciated the learning curve here and um, the amount of information and materials you have provided has been outstanding. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it concerns me to do something different from Petaluma um, what were the reasons why we would not coincide with what surrounding individuals in the county uh, are doing? I just wonder what, what, how do we justify making it that confusing for businesses that may have like a site in Petaluma and a site here? Well, the only difference between us and Petaluma is the, is the uh, potential cap to CPI. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is no consistency either with Sonoma um, 
but there is with that CPI cap, that is, uh, though they use a US CPIW, it is consistent with the state. So the direction I received uh, specific to that item is find consistency with SB3 uh, and consistency with our uh, regional uh, uh, cities, uh, the other cities, and thus far, uh, we are most consistent with the exception of that 3.5% cap with Petaluma. And uh, help me because I may have misread, um, is the small business uh, timing different between us and Petaluma also? No, that is consistent. So uh, Santa Rosa, uh, Petaluma, and the uh, City of Sonoma all recognize the uh, SB3 or the State Labor Code uh, definition of small and large business. Okay. It c I, I will just say it concerns me that rent can go up CPI plus 5%, but that wages are limited to under to the lesser of CPI or 3%, which is not the same as adding. We're talking about a significant difference in increase between rent and wages. It does not seem to me to be appropriate to um, put our low-income workers in such a vice. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to piggyback on Councilmember Tibbetts' question a little bit. And, and first, uh, if you could go back to that student, also point out to him, uh, I think it was about three years ago, Assemblymember Mullen passed legislation actually making it illegal to uh, blackmail somebody based on their status. So that helps in some regards. Uh, Raisa, you and I have had a conversation multiple times actually about uh, wage theft type ordinances at the local level and understanding that that's an important component in making sure that everybody is playing on the same level playing field. Uh, and in particular for folks who are undocumented or, or uh, minority status, they, it's not always just the wage that we sometimes need to step in. Does this ordinance and the tools that are built with the Labor Commissioner's Office also allow us to talk about overtime for example, trying to uh, not pay overtime in order to get under the per hour uh, wage that we're putting in place here. Yes. Okay, uh, and any other types of complaints, uh, people could still come to you and get that assistance as well, right? That's correct. Okay, we've also talked a little bit about um, the ramp up to 2020. And one of the things that, that you mentioned to me is that the city would also be looking at ways to assist businesses that are legitimately on that margin and just need a little bit more time. Can you talk a little bit about what assistance there is out there from the city's perspective for those businesses? Yes, and um, I'm finding uh, more, um, you know, as quickly as I can. Um, but the most common ones are uh, looking at, um, at, the, at the base level, at the business plan uh, and business conditions. And so we work uh, with the um, SBDC, Small Business uh, Development Corporation, uh, uh, which is a state agency, uh, as well as our partners uh, with the Economic Development Board, uh, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Um, we're working with Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, LOCN. We've talked to a number of different people uh, about what opportunities exist to reach out to businesses who, um, who need assistance uh, with business plans, but also we are looking at microloan uh, possibilities. And so um, I I've just learned of a new one, which I'm totally blanking on, but it's a national organization uh, that helps with microloans. We also have the, um, gosh, I can't remember any of them. Uh, I think it's uh, Working Capital or something. It's um, uh, managed out of the Economic Development Board. Um, uh, from the from the county, um, so we're uh, and then of course SBDC um, has a number of small uh, and micro loan uh, possibilities on our website srcity.org/business. We also have a number of. Um, uh, loan programs and um, lending uh, resources. And so we're uh, trying to be more aggressive or we're planning on uh, being more proactive about what those resources are and how to get them to people, again, using our partner community organizations. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm curious about a couple of things. Was there any conversation given to the impact on young workers like that are 
you know, in school, 16 years old, um, and how this, you know, if you've got two, two individuals applying for a job, one is 16, unskilled, perhaps first job, and then um, an 18 year old who may have had, may or may not have some experience, I would assume that 18, they probably have some experience under their belt. Um, th I would think that there's going to be a tendency um, to hire the older worker and to hire the, perhaps the more ex experienced one because the only advantage might be for an employer uh, to be able to pay less to a to an unskilled 16 year old as opposed to an 18 year old. Has any any, any thought been given to being able to carve out that age group? Because I, I am concerned with what, what may happen to their first jobs. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I don't remember, I can, I can look it up quickly um, if I have it within my bandwidth right now, but <laughs> there was uh, the uh, UC Berkeley um, Center for Labor uh, did address that uh, to a degree in their presentation. Again, um, I think it was something like 96% of the people are uh, who are affected by minimum wage are actually 20 and above, and the majority of that is actually 30 and above. Um, so it's a small segment of the minimum wage population that we're talking about who are, um, you know, 16 to uh, to 20. Um, I. Uh, I actually did some research on some of the studies and I, I can look also quickly and get back to you on this because I have um, cited some sources that did talk about um, what those impacts might be and again, they're, they're minimal, um, but uh, yeah, that's all I have for you. Thank you and, I, and, and I, I also agree with my colleagues, I really appreciate this amazing amount of research that you've done to help help guide us in, in, in our decisions here today. One other question I have, um, they, the, the governor or the in the development of SB3, they did add a clause that allowed the governor to um, pause the increases if there was a major downturn in the economy. Was there any thought given to that if, if something severe were to happen uh, and to be able to um, mitigate some of the some of the pain of a, of a of a dropped economy on the employers right before the increase happens. Uh, so not for this ordinance. Um, the if I recall correctly, the governor has only uh, the ability to use that uh, off ramp twice. Um, if there is, uh, I think what we had discussed here and during the study session is if there is a negative CPI that there would be no change. But we did not discuss, and nor did we consider uh, an off ramp. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The only question I had, um, I couldn't find it in the ordinance about third party complaints. Would we accept those or how would we investigate those? Um, I did look that up uh, and um, anybody has the ability to make a complaint um, and they would go to the state. Said with confidence. Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was trying to look at my notes real quick. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay, those are all the questions we have from council. We have plenty of cards here, so you'll have two minutes of opportunity to share your views with the council. Don't feel like uh, you have to use all two minutes. You can also uh, just acknowledge what previous speakers have said that you would agree with them. So first up is Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Daniel Pablo. Did Dwayne leave? Wow. All right, Daniel Pablo followed by Valerie Hingham. Okay. Is Dan, there you go, Dan. Yeah. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Daniel Pablo and I actually serve on the board of trustees and I serve as a student voice. Uh, but beforehand, I'd like to apologize to uh, the city council. I know I'm a little short, so I know some of you can't see me. Uh, but the fight for 15 is an issue I've been fighting for a year for, uh, and I'd like to <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jack Tibbetts especially uh, for joining our student government meeting at 3 p.m. yesterday, uh, listening, asking questions, and actually hearing the student perspective at the junior college as well. Uh, but I would like to ask the city council as a recommendation for the voting process uh, to actually approve this. Uh, I know a lot of students and a lot of friends who first handedly go through homelessness and just working at Starbucks, Barnes and Nobles or any other place, $12 is barely enough uh, for a lot of these students to make uh, money on for their side, uh, some gas uh, for their car, going to class, uh, feeding themselves every day in school. 
Uh, so this would be great if we could pass the five for 15, and this will just be a slippery slope. Santa Rosa is one of the biggest cities in Sonoma County. Uh, the city of Sonoma actually passed it first. The city of Petaluma fell in hand as well. And if we pass it, it's just going to be a chain of commands. Uh, it'll be uh, eventually sought out to the city of Healdsburg, uh, every other city, and we'll be the ones to actually fight that on. Uh, so I would recommend to the board to approve this. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Valerie Hinshaw, followed by Susan Lamont. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. My name is Val Hinshaw. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa, and I'm here on behalf of the Sonoma County Democratic Party as well. I'd like to read a, re a letter into the record, which has been distributed to all members of the council from our chair, Pat Sabo. Dear Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council, the Sonoma County Democratic Party is writing to voice our organization's support for the North Bay Jobs with Justice proposed ordinance to raise the citywide minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2020, with an annual Bay Area CPI chain each year thereafter. In a time of skyrocketing cost of living and stagnant wages, we believe that local government should do everything in their power to address this imbalance directly by implementing policies such as a minimum wage increases. The Sonoma County Democratic Party passed a resolution for support of a $15 an hour minimum wage in 2014. The California State Democratic Platform it includes specific and direct language supporting a statewide $15 an hour minimum wage. A number of you council members read this platform and pledged to support it when seeking the Democratic Party endorsement. By increasing the minimum wage in Santa Rosa to $15 an hour by 2020 and including an annual relevant CPI increases, not only do we give our poorest residents some measure of economic security by putting an average of $2,900 annually in their pockets, but we also improve their health, better their educational outcomes, stimulate the local economy at the same time. Low-wage workers have been found to spend a significantly higher portion of their income locally on basic necessities, and the increased spending power of these workers would return to our local economy, providing a boom to our small businesses. Sincerely, Pat Sabo, Chair of the Sonoma County Democratic Party. Thank you. So I do, uh, before I get yelled at by the city attorney, <clears throat> I do have to uh, open this public hearing. So this is a public hearing that is now open. So we have Susan Lamont followed by Debbie McCann. Present the Green Party of Sonoma County and to add its voice in support of the North Bay Jobs with Justice proposed ordinance to raise the citywide minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2020. The Green Party stands with labor and believes that the prosperity of the city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma cannot be, continue to rest on the backs of poorly paid workers. Everyone in this room knows that working people cannot live and work here without struggle and precarity if they can live here at all. Everyone in this room knows that rents have skyrocketed while wages have not kept up. Everyone in this room knows that we are in the midst of an environmental crisis and that it makes no sense to force workers to live hours from their work and with inadequate public transportation. Everyone in this room knows that economic instability creates stresses affecting health, relationships, family, education, and so much more. Everyone in this room knows that income inequality has reached levels that are obscene and inhumane. Everyone in this room knows that past minimum wage increases have not destroyed local economies, but have boosted them because those increases are returned to local businesses. But this is not just a monetary issue, it's an ethical one. Though you will hear protestations to the contrary, everyone in this room knows what the right and ethical thing to do is, and that is to support the people who make this county what it is. That is to share the prosperity. That is to recognize that the worker using the vacuum cleaner, the worker carrying the tray, and the worker behind the cash register are just as valuable as workers and as human beings as the worker wearing a suit. They have been waiting far too long. Their struggle is real and they are desperate. The Green Party of Sonoma County asks you to please act on what everyone in this room knows and raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour by 20. Thank you. 
Thank you. Debbie McCann, followed by George Uberti. I'm Debbie McKay, and I'm here on behalf of the League of Women Voters, and we sent a letter to the council members, to each of you, but I would like to read our letter into the record. As you are aware, the California cities can set their own minimum wage higher than the state, which is what you're considering this evening. The League of Women Voters of Sonoma County support a living wage designed to help as many covered employees as possible earn a wage at or above the poverty level. And I'd like to add a side comment that I'm really pleased you're not carving out teenagers. Very often teenagers are a very important part of low-income households making it and being able to pay their rent and buy and put food on the table. So I'm glad you're covering everybody underneath this ordinance. The League urges the Council to take this important step towards a living wage by approving this ordinance this evening. The League has long been concerned with the lack of affordable housing in our community. Low-wage workers cannot make ends meet in this high-cost county, particularly given the skyrocketing rents and housing costs. As you know, Sonoma County rents have increased by approximately 25% from 2000 to 2016, while the annual medium income for renters has only increased 9%. Increasing the minimum wage will make housing more affordable by offsetting rising rents. This is a really important step that you can take to make sure that our residents can stay in our community. We have lost approximately 3,000 of our community members post-fire, and this is an important step to make sure that people can stay, live, and work in our community. In addition, raising the minimum wage is good for our local economy. Low-wage workers are not going to put their money into the stock market. They're going to spend it. They're going to spend it in our community on local necessities, and it will boost our economy. It will help us prosper. Boosting the minimum wage will help cut poverty rates and make all affected less reliant on public assistance. Thank you. Uh, George... Um, folks, we kind of have a, um, a, a practice in this chamber. If you agree with one of the speakers, just wave your hands because the applaud delays the meeting and we're going to be here for quite some time. Uh, feel free to acknowledge that you like them, but please hold the applause. Uh, George Uberti followed by Sandy Reynolds. Yeah. Wow. What do you think here? Uh, do the people want 15? I think so. Yeah. Looks like it to me, pretty unequivocally. Uh, I just wanted to say that I was ecstatic to uh, hear that CPI considerations uh, are going to be factored in to the minimum wage as we go forward, right? We're, we're thinking really about what a sustainable wage is going to be like for the future. Everything else goes up, the wage goes up with it. I just want to add that, uh, you know, $15 an hour was not scientifically arrived at in any way. It's about like 10 years ago, people, you know, it was just a kind of a, it's hard for low income people to organize. We picked a kind of snappy number that was higher than what we were getting and we've stuck with that for 10 years. So I'm, I think it's great that we're considering the CPI as we go forward, but let's think maybe a little bit more about this 15 thing. I mean, it's, it's a good way of getting us all on board for the same idea, uh, but I don't know that it's enough. Uh, you know, I don't know that it's enough. I think that we should maybe take some time to really think about what a living wage is for this community. Um, and, and something that's not just, I mean, we're talking about a bare minimum. We're talking about a living wage, right? We need to, we need to aim higher than uh, an amount of money that we need to realistically stay alive. As a, I mean, I don't know that that's our goal as Western civilization to, you know, uh, put all these people here on life support and, and, you know, call it a day, right? Let's think about really elevating civilization. Let's think about calculating a wage that's not just a way for us to organize what we're asking you for, right? Let's think about a wage that is what these people need, right? Let's be a government, okay? And let's think about what our people need and find a way to give it to them before they have to beg us for 10 years. Um, so that's, that's what I think I have to add to this discussion. Uh, I'm happy to see everybody here. This is what we want. Thank you. Sandy Reynolds, followed by Lee Pierce. 
Good, e <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I address you tonight on behalf of the Santa Rosa Democratic Club, the largest membership of Democrats in Santa Rosa who are activists, your constituents, regarding the uh, proposed ordinance by the North Bay Jobs with Justice. Last week, you received a letter from me on behalf of this organization, which directed me to write you with unanimous support, giving clear directions to you as your constituents to raise the minimum wage in Santa Rosa to $15 an hour in 2020. You've heard from a lot of people already tonight, so you're aware of the reasons that this needs to happen. And you know that in the coming two and three years to postpone this raise, $15 an hour is no longer worth the value that it is today. That's not really progress. More is needed now. It's important that you do what's right and what's critically needed for our workers in Santa Rosa. You've done a good job with and, and important work with creating, creating affordable housing and given the housing crisis. However, if the workers don't earn enough to live in these homes, then a terrible gap exists between what you've created and what's possible for them to afford. Tonight, you can make a substantial difference in the lives of our workers in Santa Rosa. Increased wages makes housing and other necessities more affordable. The increase in income gives workers an increase in spending power right here in the local economy. It's a win-win for Santa Rosa. We are sincerely counting on you to do the right thing and pass an accelerated minimum wage ordinance tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Pierce, followed by Natalie Silerzo. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Lee Pierce, resident of District 2 Council seat. Um, I'm the president of the North Bay Black Chamber, and that's what I rise to tell you this evening, that the North Bay Black Chamber supports the $15 minimum wage. Uh, I sat there at the dais a year ago uh, as a candidate for that District 2 seat, and I made it clear that I support that wage, but I also thought it was too minimum. Uh, I think there are people out there who would argue that while the increase to $15 in 2020 might put a few more groceries in the, in the food cart, or a little bit more gas in the tank, but it's not going to touch rent and mortgages and that kind of thing. Black and brown people are typically at the bottom of the economic schedule. There are statistics here tonight that will support that, and I'll leave that to the folks who have done that work. I urge the council to do all green lights tonight. That will show that you have done your homework and you've studied this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie Salerzo, followed by Susan McDonough. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Santa Rosa City Council members. My name is Natalie Salerzo. I am the co-owner of Russian River Brewing Company at 725 4th Street with a second location in Windsor. I would like to start this by saying that I do support a minimum wage of $15. It may not seem like it as I'm speaking, but I want everybody in the room to know this. In 2004, we opened with 28 employees when minimum wage was $6.75 an hour. We now have over 200 employees, 80 of whom are employed at our Santa Rosa Brew Pub, and 33 of them are paid a base hourly rate of $12 per hour, the current state minimum wage. 100% of these employees earn tips, either directly, like bartenders and servers, or indirectly, by being tipped out. We also have known for a long time that minimum wage is not a living wage in our community and have been paying our next least paid position at least $15 per hour. My point is that no one in our company earns the current minimum wage. Each year since 2017,
2017, California restaurant owners have been required by state law to provide raises to our employees who need it the least. I would much rather be handing out larger raises to our dishwashers, cooks, security, and other non-tipped positions. As minimum wage increases year after year, we must respond accordingly by raising our prices to cover increased costs of not only wages, but payroll taxes and workers' comp insurance. There is also a compounding effect of raising other employees' wages to offset the increasing inequity. We would also need to raise minimum wage for our Windsor employees for equal pay for equal work. Therefore, if Santa Rosa passes this ordinance as it is, about 70 of our employees will receive a $2 an hour per raise or 15% increase. The financial impact to our company is upwards of $200,000, not including taxes and insurance. I am in support of $15 per hour minimum wage, but please consider moderate, modifying the proposed ordinance to keep tipped restaurant employees at the state minimum wage. Thank you very much. Susan McDonough, followed by Tom Woods. Yes, good evening. My name is Susan McDonough. Uh, I am speaking tonight on behalf of a businesswoman in uh, Santa Rosa who was not able to make it. So I will quote her words. Uh, uh, I am Olivia Walton, owner of Live Fashion Boutique in Santa Rosa. I have had my boutiques for 13 years now, and I'm proud to say I do and have paid well above the minimum wage for my employees. I've found that even being in retail and employing young people, the longevity of their careers here at Live are much greater with a higher pay. I always start at least $1 above minimum wage if there's no customer service or retail experience, and then raise them after probation to $15. I continue to raise them higher as they take on new tasks, and I give raises each year. Most of my employees start in high school or college and stay until graduation and move on to their final careers. I also have employees move away from college and come back during the summer and winter breaks. Although retail is tough, it's a tough business. I find offering a higher base pay and commission when they hit higher sales has really paid off for both my store and for my employees. Please pass a minimum $15 minimum wage by 2020 tonight. And thank you. Thank you. Tom Woods, followed by Tom Amato. Council, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. First thing I want to do is I want to look around this room and I want to tell you how proud I am to be a part of this group labor and community organizations, it's great to be on the side of righteousness. I want to point out that we're talking about the minimum wage. We're not talking about the living wage of $23 an hour. We're talking about the minimum wage. People that are earning so little that they are not able to pay their bills week to week. These people are not saving. They're not putting money in the bank. They're not saving for a future. They're not taking their families to Disneyland. These are people that are surviving hand to mouth. When we're talking this minimum wage here, all of this money, every cent of it is going to be recycled right back into the community and into local businesses. They're not leaving, they're not traveling. They, every, every, penny, every penny that they get, gets spent right back at the same stores that we're talking about that don't wanna raise that minimum wage. We need to do it. We need to protect our workers. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Amato, followed by Erica Galera. I'm Tom Amato, and um, I'm uh, really happy to see, first of all, so many oak miners here, because this is an, an issue that a lot of oak miners are concerned about. And uh, I'm chair of the Oak Mine Democratic Club, and we strongly support raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, I'll be very brief, because you got a lot of speakers here. Um, coincidentally, I had a conversation this morning with one of the Catholic priests who served this area, and one of the things he was uh, lamenting was the high cost of rents and the low cost of wages uh, and, and the relationship between the two and how many members of his parish have a time, hard time making it to the end of the month because the wages just don't match the rents. And particularly like a young couple, how, how can a young couple get by with like a one bedroom apartment? So uh, we ask you tonight to uh, consider that and consider the young families in our city and to raise the minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Erica Galera, followed by Maddie Hirschfield. Hi, my name is Erica Galera, and I'm a longtime resident of Santa Rosa, and I currently work for a very small nonprofit called Food Empowerment Project, which is based here in Sonoma County. Uh, we are encouraging a yes vote for 15.1. 
As a vegan food justice nonprofit, a part of our mission is working for equal access to healthy foods in black and brown communities and low-income neighborhoods. It is a very complex issue and one that varies from community to community. However, as part of our focus groups, one consistent issue that continues to come up is the individuals living in these communities emphasize that cost is a huge factor as they don't make a lot of money, which is why we strongly support this effort. Also, although we are a very small organization with a staff of four, we feel it is imperative that businesses take the responsibility of paying their employees at least $15 an hour starting in 2020, if not sooner. I hope you will take a minute to digest that this equals, before taxes, $28,800 a year. With that salary, it is difficult to live in Sonoma County. Paying your employees at least $15 an hour and increasing it each year should be a part of your budget every year, it should just be a part of your budget. A small nonprofit like ours pays our employees much more than 15, not only because it is the right thing to do, but because we value our employees and we know how difficult it is to live in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Hirschfield, followed by Marty Bennett. Mayor Schwedholm and um, council members. Maddie Hirschfield, I'm the political director with the North Bay Labor Council. I'm with those groups that did some of those studies, so I'm going to be talking to you about that. One of my least favorite sayings is studies show, but I'm going to be saying that to you a lot tonight. Um, I, I want to address, first of all, one of the concerns that always comes up when this is discussed, and that's about small business um, being exempt. It, it should first be noted that none of the 27 cities in California that have passed minimum wage ordinances have exempted any size business, including the following cities that either went to 15 this year or are going to 15 January in 2020. That includes Santa Clara, Richmond, El Cerrito, Fremont, Alameda, San Leandro, Redwood City, Belmont, Los Angeles City and County, San Mateo, San Francisco, Berkeley, and Emeryville. Of those cities, only LA and Santa Clara and Fremont gave an extra um, year for small business to phase in. Santa Rosa uh, most certainly can and should phase all businesses into 15 plus CPI together in 15 months on January 2021. The second concern is that res restaurants will struggle to keep up. Uh, a study of restaurants across San Jose, as well as a separate study of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, DC, and Oakland, found that above all businesses, restaurants are able to absorb minimum wage increases the best because they spend the most money uh, than other businesses on constantly replacing their, their staff. And the, the tips that was mentioned are um, uh, considering tips uh, against a minimum wage or as part of the wages against California law, so that just can't be done. Um, Studies also show that since low-wage workers um, are the most likely to spend increased wages, they also tend to spend it mostly locally, which you've already heard, and in restaurants, eating out is a luxury. Workers who work hard to serve the, and feed the middle class at their restaurants want to also enjoy eating out, and studies show that they do when they get a raise in their wages. The only... Okay, Thank that's you. it. Thank Mar you. Marty Bennett, followed by Jack Buckhorn. Uh, Marty Bennett, North Bay Jobs with Justice, and we have three consecutive speakers uh, who are all presenting on behalf of Jesus Guzman, Masters of Public Policy uh, from the UC Berkeley Goldman School, and the author of The State of Working Sonoma 2018, and I'm the first speaker. I come before the council to offer our assessment of the research and evidence with respect to the minimum wage and its effect on the local economy. I'll begin by addressing a point of concern that claims that the effects of the minimum wage will exorbitantly increase business operating costs and prices. The empirical evidence would suggest otherwise. An accounting of operating expenses would obviously show a rise in payroll costs, however, what the accounting often fails to calculate is the positive effect of an increase in a minimum wage, which is reduction in turnover and subsequent net savings. We know from industry reports that even in a labor-intensive restaurant industry, that labor costs constitute about one-third of the operating expenses. The UC Berkeley Labor Center 2018 report on the economic impacts of 15 minimum in the North Bay 
estimates a 7% increase in payroll costs due to the 15 minimum wage that accounts for three factors. One, the increase in wages. Two, changes in payroll taxes, workers' compensation. And three, the net savings from reduced turnover. It's that last factor which an increasing minimum wage reduces and helps prevent that can be difficult to account for, but which empirical research has shown time and time again can significant net savings for business. Thanks, Mari. Jack Buckhorn, followed by Mara Ventura. The point here is obvious. Pay workers and they'll be less likely to leave. For the restaurant industry, that in recent years has reached an almost an average annual turnover rate of more than 70%, those can be significant savings on that turnover rate. A 2014 paper by Aaron Duby found that within nine months after a minimum wage increase of 10%, a corresponding 2% reduction in turnover occurs with teens and restaurant workers. Uh, a study by uh, Heather Bosley and Sarah Gwen in a uh, in 2012 paper estimate that the average cost of losing and replacing an employee earning between 30K and 50K annually is between 16 and 20 percent. Roughly speaking, a $30,000 employee who departs for a better paying job, for example, would cost that firm about $4,800 to replace. Given a tight labor market, at around two to three percent unemployment and a turnover rate of about 10 percent, almost twice as high for workers ages 19 to 24, a reduction in turnover, turnover as a result of a minimum wage increase can mean significant savings for business, especially those with high turnover rates and persistent job vacancies. The remaining difference in increased operating expenses are mostly passed off to the consumer in terms of marginal increases in price of about two to four percent. This range in price increases increases actually very consistent with the 2013 study measuring the effect of a minimum wage on the restaurant industry in San Jose. In the study, they collected menu prices from almost a thousand restaurants from inside and outside San Jose. They then measured the effect of the minimum wage increase in San Jose pre and post comparing San Jose to surrounding cities. They found that the restaurants increased by about 2% on that. Thanks, Jack. Mara Ventura followed by Miles Bergen. Hi, Mara Ventura, Executive Director, North Bay Jobs with Justice. So should the minimum wage be staggered by business size in perpetuity? As Jesse Rothstein at UC Berkeley has noted, there's good research to suggest that larger businesses have greater flexibility to increase payroll costs than smaller businesses in the short term. Giving smaller businesses a bit more of an on-ramp through a staggered minimum wage schedule a year or so after large businesses to adjust to the minimum wage can be, can be helpful. However, it doesn't follow that there should be a long-term or permanent staggering of a minimum wage that differs by business size. Doing so may only further compound the disadvantages smaller businesses face by allowing them to pay less wages, which rather than helps them, actually makes them less competitive in attracting talented employees to help them run their businesses. In a tight labor market over the long run, why would an employee choose to work for a local retailer, for example, that offers a lower minimum wage than a business like Target that would offer a higher one? Rather, it behooves the council to create a level playing field in which smaller businesses are giving an on-ramp to adjust to the minimum wage increase in the short term, but then merge the wage levels to match that of a larger business in the long term. There's robust research demonstrating the net benefits for a local economy of putting additional dollars in the pockets of low-income workers, given their marginal propensity to consume. Increasing the income of low-income workers has a much higher multiplier effect and helps increase local consumer demand, given that the likelihood that both a low-income worker will spend that dollar and the statistical likelihood that they're going to spend that dollar locally is significantly more impactful than raising wages for high-income workers. Given what we know about the average price increase of goods and services as a result of the minimum wage, there is no evidence that consumers discern a significant price increase, especially not one when a cost-benefit analysis is done between small price increases for a good and the relative price in transportation to go get that burger at another nearby city. Oh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Miles Bergen, followed by Philip Beard. 
Good evening, Mayor Sweat Helm and members of the council. My name is Miles Bergen. Uh, I'm here in a couple different capacities today. Um, I'm on the board of Sonoma County Conservation Action and Wine Country Young Democrats, which have both endorsed unanimously and sent letters of support for the ordinance in front of you, but also as a member of the Jobs with Justice uh, Committee for Santa Rosa. Uh, specifically, I want to dive, well, first let me thank you for bringing forward this ordinance tonight, and hopefully we'll be taking the first step towards making Santa Rosa a more livable place for everyone. Uh, the one concern that we have with the ordinance is the 3.5% cap on CPI. Um, the whole point of putting a CPI chain in this ordinance is to make sure that the wages that our lowest wage workers make keep up with inflation every day or every year. Um, keep in mind that over a third of the CPI percentage is based on housing costs. And according to a study done on Sonoma County's housing costs in 2019, our housing costs here are rising faster than any other county in the Bay Area, including San Mateo County and, um, and San Francisco County. We don't implement any cap on CPI for landlords being able to raise rents on renters under our rent stabilization ordinances, including those in the mobile home park ordinances. Yet, for some reason, we decide to have a 3.5% cap on the wage increases that our lowest wage earners can make. Uh, this is inconsistent with the goal of keeping our minimum wage ordinance, which is designed to help low-income residents be able to keep up with the rising cost of living. Um, and it's something that we should look at when we pass the final ordinance tonight. Uh, in my last little bit of time, I'd like to talk about enforcement and predictability. The biggest lesson we learned from Santa Clara County, where every city has the same minimum wage, uh, is that we need to be consistent in terms of what we pass. Petaluma did not cap their CPI, neither does the county cap their CPI for their county workers, um, or do we cap CPI for um, our rent increases? By putting a cap in the ordinance, we're going to create a more difficult job for the state and local labor and commissioner's office to help our cities and the county enforce their ordinances. We also make it more difficult for business owners who do business in jurisdictions to know what to pay their workers where. Thanks. Philip Beard, followed by Gabriel Machabansky. Good evening. I'm Philip Beard. I'm here on behalf of the, Santa, the uh, Friends of Public Banking, Santa Rosa. And I'm here to report that my organization enthusiastically endorses the proposed ordinance raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Mashabansky, followed by Colin Williamson. Um, my name is Gabriel Mashabansky. I'm the Associate Director at the Grayton Day Labor Center, as well as a member of the North Bay Jobs with Justice Steering Committee. I want to present to you tonight just under a thousand petition signatures. These were collected around Santa Rosa to support the $15 by 2020 ordinance proposed by North Bay Jobs with Justice. We spent hours having conversations with everyday Santa Rosans all across town, as well as members of the Grayton, Grayton Day Labor Center most of whom are Santa Rosa residents, um, and their concerns with losing valuable residents due to the rising cost of living. Overwhelmingly, people agreed that 11 and $12 are too low for our community and want to see the $15 as soon as possible. So I ask that you please accept our almost 1,000 petition signatures in support of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Williamson, followed by Dr. Tony Ramirez. Hi, uh, I'm Colin Williamson. Uh, about three years ago, I opened up a restaurant here in Santa Rosa. Um, I've been in the restaurant business for most of my life, so um, I feel pretty comfortable. I know how to run a business and know how to run a restaurant, and I know what, uh, what my expenses are and how I can deal with those expenses. And I just think, like Natalie said, I'm not against $15 an hour. I just don't want to see it ramped up that quickly. You got to give me some time to make some adjustments to my business to be able to uh, be able to adapt to that. Um, I think uh, the studies show that you know it's only going to be a 2.1 percent increase. Um, it's going to be a lot more than that. Um, I, I'm a pretty small business and I think that um, I'm going to have a harder time dealing with this than the bigger guys, the McDonald's, the Applebee's. Those guys are going to be fine because they're going to uh, just come in and they figure out how technology is going to be able to help them cut labor. And so I think the local independent restaurants are the ones that are going to suffer. And you're going to see more and more of us go out of business. 
Downtown Santa Rosa is already littered with a lot of empty storefronts. Tex Rastavi just closed their doors yesterday. I think you're gonna see more of it. Um, I, I know that uh, we have a responsibility to do the right thing for the community and I feel like I've been trying to do that all my life in this business. Uh, and I've got some long-term employees, I've got some people that I think really like working for me. And most of the people that you're trying to help are already making more than $15 an hour in, in my business. The only ones that aren't are the servers, the bartenders, the hosts, the ones that make tips. So it's not really gonna help. It's gonna, I think, hurt in the long run. I'm scissor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tony Ramirez followed by Laura Larku. Good evening, Council. My name is Tony Ramirez, and I'm a family doctor here in Santa Rosa. Speaking on behalf of HP, so along with my colleagues here are other health professionals in Santa Rosa. We're a local health professionals advocacy organization that encompasses representatives of all healthcare delivery systems in the county, and we are here in support of the ordinance. So one of the most common and most important questions I ask patients is, are you concerned about being able to afford your medications or food that you need? Healthcare, healthcare providers do not exaggerate when we say that that families are making decisions between medications, foods, roof above their heads, or going to the emergency room versus waiting it out. If healthcare providers do not ask patients about their financial circumstances, we are failing them, and thus advocating for moving people out of poverty is an obligation of ours. And this minimum wage ordinance can have incredible, meaningful impact on the health of our community. A 15 plus minimum wage is an antidepressant. It is a sleep aid, it is a stress reliever, it is a contraceptive preventing teenage pregnancy, it prevents premature death. It shields children from neglect. Poverty can be unrelenting, shame-inducing, and exhausting. Some people live so close to the bone, a small setback can quickly spiral into a major trauma and cause significant health effects. From evidence-based studies and UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations, we find that when patients have a bit more money in their pockets, they exercise more. They are less stressed and can quit smoking. Their mental health improves pretty dramatically, their sleep gets better, and people start eating healthier almost immediately. Sure, we doctors, we can prescribe a new expensive heart drug that the industry spent an incredible amount of money on, but if we increased wages by even one dollar, we'd save more lives. You could save more lives and we are with you. Raising the minimum wage by prescriptions, rest, and broccoli, but it also provides something less tangible, dignity. This translates into empowerment and a better community for all. Please consider passing this, including uh, removing the CPI. Thank you. Laura Larku, followed by Isabel Fisher. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Laura Larque, and I am here representing the faculty, all faculty association, which represents all of the faculty of Santa Rosa Junior College. We are here to encourage you to consider uh, approving the $15 minimum wage an hour, given that many of our students work full time go to school full time and have family responsibilities. It is difficult for them to focus on their classes when they have to work full time and they are making only $23,000 a year. That is before taxes, making only $12 an hour. We know that the majority of our, of our people who are making $12 an hour are people who are poor and who are people of color. Pockets of poverty we can find here in Sonoma County, and Santa Rosa is the largest city in this county. We cannot argue that the uh, minimum wage of $15 will bring harm to people who own business. Because how can a person who makes $12 an hour can pay a rent of more than $2,000 a month? That is only a very small apartment. Plus they have many other responsibilities. I encourage you, along with my peers, the faculty of Santa Rosa Junior College to seriously consider raising the minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel Fisher, followed by Judith Gaipo. Good evening. My name is Isabel, and I'm here speaking on behalf of North Bay Organizing Project to urge you to pass this $15 minimum wage in Santa Rosa. 
Say a single person is working one 40 hour a week job and making the current California minimum wage of $12 an hour. That means they're making about $1,900 a month if you're not including taxes or if they're funding their own health care, et cetera. Let's say this single person is living in a one bedroom apartment. When the average rent for a one bedroom apartment here in Santa Rosa is also about $1,900 a month, well, hold on, that scenario is already impossible. Uh, but for the sake of this example, let's just say that they were able to find an apartment for $1,400 a month. They're still paying almost exactly 75% of their income towards rent, 75. They've only got $500 left per month for additional expenses like utilities, gro groceries, <clears throat> groceries, extra medical payments, or anything else they might need finances for. It's the constant cycle of barely making ends meet month after month without the ability to save money. This is why people get second and third jobs. And let's not forget that women are still making less on the dollar than men are. Data from 2017 and 2018 show that in California, White women make 80 cents on every dollar a white man makes, as do Asian American women. African American women in California make only 60 cents on the dollar. Native American women only 49 cents, and Latinx women only 41 cents on the dollar. It couldn't be more necessary to pass a $15 minimum wage at this time. It's an important step in the right direction. It's essentially raising an unlivable wage to a slightly less unlivable wage, but it is still an important step. This for working people, your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Juanita Gaipo, followed by Logan Harvey. Hello, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Um, I'm here to basically emphasize what she just said. Making, most of the people make $12 an hour. Some of them, they still make $11 an hour in the city. Uh, that makes them to 1920 a month. Out of that, if they're lucky, they can get an apartment for 1400 one bedroom. If they're very lucky, they can get two, an apartment for 850 But let's say we get an apartment for 1400 Out of that, you have 520 left. So. If you can figure it out and send me a letter to let them know how they can pay their bills because they have to decide out of that 520, they have to pay federal taxes, state taxes, insurance, health insurance, car insurance, food, electricity. It's like, what are you gonna pay? So, like I said, if you can figure it out, let us know. I think it's more than, than fair to to raise this minimum wage because a lot of people, they're already feeding their kids with mac and cheese, if they're lucky, with watered milk and with hot dogs. That's no nutrition. Not only that, but they already gave away their um, being able to, to live by themselves, you know, basically. They gave away vacation, it's out of, the, out of question, you know, so they have been, been giving away too much stuff, privacy, and now they're give, some of them they're giving away their dignity because like single mothers making minimum wage, they have to sell their dignity or give away because they're living in a, sometimes in a living room and people telling their kids, don't do that, why are your kids? That's hard for a mother, that's heartbreaking. So please, it's a necessity and I'm asking you as a human being, to raise the minimum wage to 15, that will give them $500 more per month. Thank you. Logan Harvey, followed by Dana Bellwether. Thank you. Um, I'll do my best to stay within time. I've had a time limit in a while. One thing I'd like to point out, I'm, the, I'm Logan Harvey, I'm the Vice Mayor of the City of Sonoma. The one thing I'd like to point out with regards to Sonoma's minimum wage is that we do have a 3.5% uh, guaranteed wage increase uh, at the moment. It wasn't listed on our website, so that's no fault of your staff. Um, but I, I would like to address that first, and then we'll be coming through with the CPI as well. Um, another point I'd like to make is that, you know, we heard a lot about uh, tip credits as well. 
during our minimum wage fight. Um, our city attorney determined that it was illegal under California state law, as did this, your city attorney. Um, the North Bay Jobs with Justice city uh, attorney also declared that it was illegal under California state law. And um, the California Restaurant Association was active during our minimum wage campaign, and if it were legal, they would have argued that it was legal. Um, so they didn't believe it was legal either. So there's no way that that is a legal uh, proposition for you. Uh, in addition, you know, just remind you who these workers are. They're making sub $25,000 a year. They're living completely hand to mouth. These are not workers that are capable of going to their boss and demanding a raise. These are not workers that are capable of standing up for their own rights and it's up to the city government to stand up for them, to support them. That is where you need to be and I, I really hope that Santa Rosa does not become the first city to say no to their low wage workers and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Dana Bellwether followed by Fred Allebach. Hello, I'm Dana Bellwether. I live in Santa Rosa. I think that $15 an hour is the minimum that anyone should be making in this county. $15 an hour, 40 hours a week, enables uh, one adult to support him or herself and one child. Not easily, but without having to live in a place that's so ill-maintained, it's not warm enough in the winter. Um, it, it enables them to have a lifestyle that is at least healthful for them. Um, when people are in good health and at ease, they work better. Uh, and if they have enough money to know that they will be able to continue to afford their apartment, they're going to be uh, a lot more relaxed. Um, if you don't want um, tourists to see so many homeless people on the street, the thing to do is not to emulate the medieval prince who had his soldiers go out and kill all the beggars. The thing to do is make sure that everyone can afford their apartments. I think that's in keeping with the, the council's overall vision for the city. If there's no rent control, it must have been decided with the idea that wages would be rising. So this is the opportunity to allow the wages to rise so that people can earn enough to keep themselves and their children housed. Um, please do pass the $15 an hour minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Allebach, followed by Lori Fong. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Fred Allebach, and I'm here representing the Sonoma Valley Housing Group. And I would strongly encourage you to adopt the uh, North Bay Jobs with Justice template ordinance, and I agree with the people who are saying to take off the uh, CPI limits. And I also agree with the woman who was just up here that said it was more than fair to raise minimum wage. And I had thought that maybe that I would save some time saying who I agreed with, but there were so many people here, I would just like to list the people that I did agree with, uh, strength in numbers, uh, the North Bay Jobs with Justice, the Green Party, League of Women Voters, Santa Rosa Junior College Student Council, County and Santa Rosa Democrats and Young Democrats, Lee Pierce, North Bay Black Chamber. I agree with Lee, all green lights. Tonight, please, uh, Jesus Guzman and the state of Oregon Sonoma is an excellent document that I've uh, looked at a lot. Uh, the Green, Grayton Day Labor Center, the healthcare folks, Santa Rosa Junior College faculty, and the uh, North Bay Organizing Project. Uh, 15 is gonna put $3,000 more in, in the pockets of low-wage workers. That's a North Bay Jobs with Justice figure. And that's money that will ripple up into the economy. Uh, we've heard for years about trickle down. I think this is a great opportunity to ripple up uh, some effects into the economy and uh, I think that's a great idea. Affordable housing, it's not gonna, what, what these workers really need is 28 to have a real living wage in Sonoma County. Um, but it will help with housing and affordable housing is an indicator that brings on a lot of other indicators with it. So if you have a good roof over your head, 
uh, then you're in good shape. So I'd encourage you to uh, do the right thing tonight and uh, pass 15 and ripple it up to the people who need it the most. Thank you. Lori Fong, followed by Luis Torado. Have to see you. Mayor Swellham, Santa Rosa City Council members. My name is Lori Fong and I'm representing the Santa Rosa City School Boards as the Vice President. We consider the city and all businesses and all nonprofits our partners in preparing our students to be life ready learners. The Santa Rosa City School Board passed a resolution in September of this year in support of the City of Santa Rosa's ordinance raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. As we all know, and are working on together, the cost of housing in our area is one of the highest in the nation. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and Zillow, a real estate data firm, Santa Rosa is the fifth, okay, listen to this, Santa Rosa is the fifth most expensive city in the nation for teachers in rent as a percentage of salary. Our strongest thoughts were that this would help our families Santa Rosa residents, as over 50% of the students we serve are eligible for free or reduced lunch, 50%. Even though single wage earners need more than $15 an hour to meet basic needs, much less thrive, this would improve the lives of families and helping our students. While the schools are exempt from the city ordinance, we have our own intent and timeline to raise our classified employees' wages to $15 an hour and are working within our means to do so with a target date of July 2021. We honor the city's intent and moral imperative to support our most vulnerable citizens. Therefore, the Santa Rosa City Schools Board of Education has presented to you the resolution that we passed in September. Thank you. Thank you. Luis Torado, followed by Peter Rumble. Hi, thank you for, for the opportunity to, to, to talk. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm a student at Santa Rosa Junior College, a political science major. Um, I'm also president of the Students for Bernie Sanders Club at the JC and a former member of North Bay Organizing Project. Um, one of the reasons why I um, support Bernie Sanders is because he was the first presidential Democratic candidate to support the $15 minimum wage in 2016. Um, he was the only candidate willing to go as far as $15. I remember Hillary Clinton was only um, capping it at $12.50. Uh, um, but I think that, um, let me just um, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I, was, I, I was brought to this country um, at the age of three um, by my mom who migrated um, from Mexico to here without knowing a word of English. Um, and I got to see firsthand how much she had to struggle to put food on the table. Um, I remember how much she had to work two jobs for 20 years. She didn't have a single day off. Um, and like the things that we were able to, to afford weren't even like the best of quality things. Like we had to eat like macaroni and cheese and stuff like that. Um, to this day, minimum wage, I, I, I would say that it's not um, enough to be able to afford a decent standard of living here in Sonoma County. Um, and I just wanted to say that increasing the minimum wage is, um, is super important as well, um, also for the economy. It's one of the best ways to stimulate the economy. Um, when you put money and, and it, uh, disposable income um, in the hands of um, working class people, they, they, they will uh, buy here in, uh, locally. Um, yeah, to this day, I'm a student and um, like, you know, the, one of the guidelines for, for um, attending cl classes, well, I ran it. Thank you, Liz. Peter Rumble followed by Thomas Ells. Good evening, Council. Peter Rumble from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce. I wanna start by being absolutely crystal clear uh, that uh, the Santa Rosa Chamber is not here to argue against a minimum wage. Indeed, increasing uh, income and wages uh, in a community is fantastic for all of the reasons cited, uh, for being able to pay living expenses, for the health reasons that were cited, all of that is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, workers are extremely well represented uh, here tonight. 
I do want to make sure to be as crystal clear, though, about uh, some of our businesses here uh, in the community, particularly our family-owned uh, restaurants. Um, we have restaurant owners who uh, have literally paid themselves zero for the last several years uh, while trying to pay uh, their employees as much as they can, uh, including health benefits in some cases. And for those small businesses that are able to pay more, like we heard from Liv, that's wonderful. Uh, and they will often do that. They care about their employees like they do family. Uh, we do not have the same levels of turnover as uh, were cited in studies. We do not have the same levels of personnel costs. I think we'll hear greater data uh, from that, more specific data. Uh, but there will be very real negative impacts for our businesses, including closing and laying off workers. Uh, and I just want to be sure that we are making this decision uh, with that uh, fully conscious, fully in mind, uh, that that is also not good for the community. Um, this is, a, uh, I know, a difficult choice, uh, but because of those negative impacts, the Chamber's Advocacy Committee has voted uh, to recommend staying consistent with the state and not moving out in front of that. Taking on more debt and doing business plans is not gonna help uh, when there's zero revenue for Thank you, Peter. Thomas Ellis, followed by Gary Lenz. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and, uh, and thank you for taking up this issue. This is really important and I, I wanna point out that uh, the CPI is a, is a COLA. Everybody has heard of COLA as a cost of living adjustment. So those were yanked out of seniors and various things. It was an attempt to take it out of, of Social Security and, and uh, that was not allowed. But in many places in, in, for workers, it, it was taken out. Even for workers, the cost of living adjustments were taken out of their income. It was a very concerted effort. Uh, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics creates a basket of goods that looks at the cost of living and it's based on sale prices for, for workers' baskets, for consumer baskets. It's based on a sale price. So if you look around and you see at the store, you see a sale price and you go, wow, that's really low, that's really great, I should buy that. That is used, that price is you, not the regular price. That sale price is what is used to create the basket of goods, to create the, the COLA and the, C, the CPI. Whichever CPI is gonna be used, they're using these sale prices. And uh, not everybody can afford to stock up on the goods at that price because it can be six months before that good is on, on sale uh, at that price again. And you can't buy, with these wages, you can't buy six months worth of goods. So it's really important to have that understanding of that adjustment that it shouldn't be capped at 3.5 and that you should come back. It's very important to review this statistic within six months. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second uh, as to why. Uh, um, marginal propensity to consume and the, and the velocity of money is really important for local stuff, but uh, there was, just on the 17th, there was a 10% overnight rate on the money market. And what that's called is, a, is an inversion of interest rates. That was a huge inversion of interest rates. From hey. a real risk Gary Lentz, followed by Michael Hirschberg. Hi there. Um, I think it's, you know, obviously a worthy goal to want to help our less advantaged citizens, people who are making $12 an hour to make more. And if we as a community decide that this is something we wanna do, I guess I wonder why we wanna do it on the backs of business owners who are the people that hire them. It's a very difficult decision to start a business. I've never done it uh, because I'm scared. I mean, it's very difficult to meet a payroll and to make a business profitable. And I worry that we're going to make things worse because while you can pass this law, what you can't repeal is the law of supply and demand, the economics. Um, if there are fewer businesses in business or they're cutting employees, that's gonna hurt the people you're trying to help. Uh, the, what, what makes people make more money is when more jobs are chasing fewer people. If we have more people employed, they have to raise wages to bring those people on board or else they'll reject the wage that they're offered. So if we as a community have decided this is a problem we wanna solve, I guess I don't understand why we wanna do it on the backs of businesses. Why don't we as a community decide to give money out of our you know, city treasury to folks to help them out? 
Why, I mean, why put businesses out of out of business? I mean, that's what's going to happen, unfortunately. So, I, I, you know, there's lots of ways to solve a problem, but do it on the backs of the people that have the courage to start a business. I think is misguided. Um, I, I think it's a very worthy goal. I, I hope that you know everybody can be lifted up and we can have more money circulating in our economy and people can make their rent and their medicine payments and everything. I, I trust me. I, I think that's a worthy goal. I just think making fewer out of business signs in our downtown and, and more restaurants going out of business is not a great way of going about doing it. And that will happen, unfortunately. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Michael Hirschberg, followed by Merlin. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Hirschberg, and I have owned restaurants in Santa Rosa for 30 years. And for the last 15 years, I've been a partner in a company called Central Books, which is a bookkeeping company uh, exclusively devoted to doing the books for restaurants. And so as you may have noticed, the only trend here, the only people speaking uh, in any way against the minimum wage increase are people in the restaurant business. I wanted to explain that to all of you who don't really understand the restaurant business. And it's something, it's probably the only thing I can speak about authoritatively. And that is that 40 to 45% of the money that comes into every restaurant goes out to labor. Uh, restaurants controlling their labor costs is the most important factor between being in business and being out of business. All of my clients, and I'm talking, my clients I should say right up front are, uh, are restaurateurs who have tipped employees, and that's what's throwing this whole thing out of whack, and we all realize that the council here cannot change that. But I want to just kind of educate everybody as to what this really means. All of these clients, all of these restaurateurs who are running tipped employee table service restaurants are all in favor of everyone making $15 an hour, and all of their non-tipped employees, for the most part, 95% of all the employees are making the minimum wage already. But because of, of the minimum wage, the only people that re receive minimum wage are the tipped employees. And, and that means when the minimum wage goes up, the tipped employees are the ones who are all getting the raises. The tipped employees are already making 20, 25, or $30 an hour. So this is a hardship for, for restaurants, and I wanted you to understand why. And so it is going to have an impact, an increase of 25% um, uh, to the minimum wage, which is what 12 to $15 represents, is going to be a 4 or 5% hit to the bottom line of restaurants. And it's not that they're worried about their profits, it's they're worried about their viability and their ability to pay off loans and things like that. So I just want everyone to understand that as, as the counterbalance to this picture. Thank you. Thank you. Merlin, followed by Carrie Fugit. Business owners. Uh, coming in here and showing us that they're, they're the only ones who don't understand basic economics. Go back to college, guys, and take something past Econ 101, please. We're increasing people's wages, and they can buy more. That creates more demand. Supply and demand, my ass. Minimal annoyance. Uh, you guys are just barely keeping up with the other uh, major cities in the area, not quite, uh, and taking us a tiny, tiny, tiny step towards getting back to the kind of minimum wages that we had back in the 1970s. Good for you. Do better. All of these excuses for not doing more, for capping the CPI index increase, for exempting certain employees, they're cowardly. It's ridiculous. You're taking whatever excuse you think you can take to push everything down to what will just barely keep us from getting out on the streets and demanding more and shutting things down. Well, we can still do that. Uh, I've got about 40 seconds left, and I would like everyone who's been shut up by the mayor to be able to express their gratitude to the great speakers before me that were here and deserve your apology, deserve your applause. Please take 20 seconds of that to give them your great applause because it won't take up more of these city council members' time. Thank you all. Awesome. I don't appreciate being shut up by an authoritarian mayor or his mercenaries with guns that came over to me and said, you cannot use your freedom of expression. Fuck you. Carrie Fugit, followed by Lisa Fakowski. 
Liz Fikowski. Uh, I want to thank you, Mayor, and members of the City Council for having this conversation tonight. And uh, my name is Carrie Fugit. I want to quickly draw the link between climate resilience for our community and uh, the importance of having a $15 minimum wage or higher. Um, our community, we know, is ground zero for climate impacts from droughts, fires, and floods. And we know that the impacts of climate change are only going to get worse based on the IPCC reports. We have 10 years to avoid catastrophic climate impacts. We know that the cost of food will rise, the cost to stay cool will rise during heat waves, and that the related health costs, especially mental health, will rise. This decision today to support a $15 minimum wage is a critical first step to help us adapt to climate change. Adaptation means looking to lower the risks posed by the consequences of climate change on our most vulnerable populations. We know that our low-income workers are going to be the ones most hardest hit by climate change. Our farm workers, our teachers, our youth, and our communities struggling with mental health. We need to make sure that they don't have to pick between turning on the air conditioner during a heat wave or buying groceries, so that they don't have to live check to check hoping that the next disaster and fire doesn't hit them. There are so many reasons tonight to support this, and I just want to make sure that we make sure that we recognize the growing instability we're going to be facing due to climate change and that the additional financial support this offers can help mitigate that and have a large ripple effect on our community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Fikowski, followed by Sonu Shandi. Good, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the North Bay Labor Council and also as a resident and a, uh, a, a pro living wage person. Um, we've heard from quite a few um, restaurant owners and small business owners who are afraid of the viability of their businesses after a $15 an hour wage goes into effect. Um, and I, I just want to speak to that. I'm actually finishing Maddie Hirschfield's um, notes, but we felt that this is such an important point that we wanted to make sure it got made. The, there, the only data that correlates raises to wages with failures of small restaurants was done in Santa Clara in uh, 2013. And the study showed that restaurants that closed earlier than the owners would have expected um, were on their way to closure anyway. In other words, there is no correlation between an increase in the minimum wage and a failure rate of restaurants. Um, most of the customers who were surveyed uh, of restaurants that were closing or had closed talked about um, customer sat talked about that their their satisfaction was lower and that even though the restaurant was able to pay more perhaps uh, pay more money or workers were quitting less often because they were getting a higher wage the restaurant was still, the customers still expressed dissatisfaction. So we understand the position of small business owners, but the ordinance is evidence-based and we want you to pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Sonu Shandi. First, thank you. Um, I, I can see this issue is such an important to our community and all of you know we hear one of the key things we do is, is in, in, as a, a company is do whatever it takes to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our community. And supporting many of these folks that I've seen spoke, speak today, we have supported them with, you know, from our businesses, various businesses. One of the key things I think uh, the, through what Santa Rosa has been through in the last two years, with the, with the destruction, we've seen many businesses close. I know the, the restaurant issue, many of our employees are already paid a lot more than uh, minimum wage because of the, because of the tip, uh, that, tips that exist. So one of the key things I really like the council to look at, if there could be a modification can be done. I think the state, the, the, uh, the plan that is proposed by the state the timeline would be more sensible because increasing, if we're shifting in July 25% increase, 
which is more than 40% of our employees are in the front of the house, what it does is there's no way we can increase prices by 25%. And the time, as we're looking at the downturn upcoming in future, um, I really would like to, I, I appreciate the staff, all the study that they've, the, the reports that they have done, but I think it's important to consider that the, the restaurant industry cannot all of a sudden increase 25% on their, on their uh, prices. And that's the key issue, that the adjustment is too quick, that it would be a hard for many businesses I do want to say that I support minimum wage to go up. I want our living wages for employees to be uh, where they do, uh, they, they do have their living uh, space that they deserve. But thank you. Thank you. Patrick Sidon. Hello, I would just like to say I'm strongly in support of a $15 hour minimum wage and a lot of businesses closed just because they suck like Texas Wasabi. All right, those are all the cards we have. This is a public hearing. You don't have to fill out a card if you would like to address the council. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council on this issue? Please, please identify yourself. Uh, my, my name is Josh Silvers. I'm the owner of uh, Jackson's Bar and Oven. And I, I also support a minimum wage. And like all the other restaurateurs here, I, I have to be honest, it's a very huge hit for us. All our staff makes more than the minimum wage in the back of the house. It's all the front of the house people. And I employ 40 plus people, which is a huge chunk. I've been in the restaurant business in Sonoma County since 1999. And I actually have, uh, an employee who started the second day I opened. So the idea of turnover, I, my general manager worked for me for 18 years. My dining room manager, who's 35, started when she was 17. It's not, it's not a real thing. Um, I'm sorry, I've just been doing this for so long. And it, it's just such a huge hit for a small restaurant. I mean, we're classified as a large restaurant, but we feel like a small restaurant. We have one location, um, and and to just put that big of a hit on us is is rather a difficult way to go. Um, you know, every year we get a rent increase. Every year taxes go up. We we pay taxes on equipment that we bought to have a use tax. We pay four hundred dollars every time we go to the uh, Staples to get supplies. You know, we get asked, I'd say, in a week, 30 times for donations, and a lot of times we give money. When the fires happened, my restaurant alone, we comped, uh, it came out to about $30,000 worth of food and wine for people when they lost their house. We just said, we're going to take care of you. You're a part of our community. We're not going to charge you. Just eat, enjoy you know, have a little relief. We went out and we bought phone chargers so people could charge their phones. We feel like we're part of the fabric of this community. We, I lost the house in the fire, we're rebuilding now, but it's just more and more difficult to do business here. Um, I, I don't wanna be, but it just, you know, it Thank is. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Please, sir. My name is uh, Richard Savage. I grew up in a family that uh, ran a small business. It was a grocery store that my father, grandfather built from the bottom up. We supplied a lot of restaurants. You're in a tough business, and so is a small grocery store to run and operate and buy equipment and hire staff and the like. So I know and understand what you're going through. I also ran my own business in a little county south of here and I hired employees too. And it was rough running that business, but I was able to in the 1980s and 1990s to pay them $15 an hour or more. Yes, I was able to do that. And so if we're to run businesses, which are not just businesses, and I know how tough small business is to make a buck for you and your families as well as your workers, but without workers, you don't have a business. So at the same time, you need to understand 
that we're part of a community, socially, economically, as well as in other ways. And so 15 bucks an hour, all you can do is raise some of your prices. That's what I had to do to my customers. I know it's competitive, I know it's tough, but it's the right thing to do to pay people. So they'll come and visit your restaurant. If you're running it well, as many of you have over the last 10, 20, or 30 years, you'll figure out a way to keep it going and make a buck. Anyone else like to address the council on this item? Seeing no one else rise, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council. Do you have any questions over any of the comments that we heard that staff might be able to answer? Ms. Combs. I have several questions that I think staff might be able to help with um, based on testimony that we heard from the public. Um, do we have any data on um, price increases with, I thought I heard you give us some data on price increases uh, as a result of uh, increasing minimum wage. Well. Um, in, uh, in other areas, obviously. Right. Um, you know, one of the issues is the studies we're relying on are based on areas outside of Santa Rosa and of outside of our Santa Rosa economy. So, um, I'll preface it with saying there are studies that address price increases. They're mostly based around uh, Seattle, um, San Jose, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, so sort of those denser areas. Different kind of market, but. Right, so. Um, what's the trend? The trend on grocery stores and the uh, report that I read from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health uh, said that there was minimal to no increase on grocery store prices. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, um, there was a, a statement in the report from the UC Berkeley uh, mm -hmm. report that we heard earlier um, that I believe they said that there was a 2% uh, increase in restaurant prices, which I will tell you the local restaurateurs um, disagree with for our local market, uh, and a 1% pass through to the um, consumer. Okay, and uh, do we have uh, data on turnover rates for any of the studies? Again, data um, is called mostly from reports outside of the area. Um, there is one report um, that I can point to. <clears throat> that is from the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a 2018 report um, that indicates that there is a 8% uh, reduction in turnovers um, resulting from increase. Uh, does, does a reduction in turnover um, in some way equal uh, financial benefit, I would think Right, so then they did, they did equate it to, um, a, a, I, I just don't have it in my notes um, right here, but they did equate it to a um, cost savings, not so much a financial increase, but a cost savings to business. And again, um, it was not specific to restaurant or retail. This was a general study that was done, uh, again, by the National Bureau of uh, Economic Research. Thank you for, for stretching your memory on some of these. Was there data on closing? Uh, there is no data that I recall reading about on closures. Okay. Is there any data on an increase in customers or an increase in income following uh, an increase in minimum There may wage? be, but again, that is not something that I uh, noticed in the research that I did. I thought I heard somebody give testimony to that, and I wondered if you'd had it. What are our current unemployment figures for the area? 3%. 3%. 3%. Um, gee, I'm remembering 6 and 9%. 3% unemployment is pretty much employment. That's correct. Uh, okay. So um, we don't have a situation where um, we have a lot more employees looking for work 
than jobs at this point. I heard some supply and demand kind of comments about employment and 3% unemployment seems to me to not be likely to trigger low wages. Um, that you don't have to make a, an answer there, but I'm making a guess about that. Can you tell me why we've not chosen to go to 20 in 2020? Uh, I'm just asking if you know why. Well, because I, I mean, this was, that was not a question that was asked of the council. Okay, just asking because it, I, I'm keenly aware that 15 doesn't feel like enough, but um, I, I'm, I'm happy to work with the uh, folks who are working on this project and appreciate what they think is, is achievable. Um, thanks very much. Any other questions from council? Okay, um, Mr. Sir, you have this uh, item. So what I'd like to do is get a um, motion, see if we get a second, and we'll get feedback. Thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, adding chapter 10-45 to the Santa Rosa City Code to establish minimum wages to be paid by employers and wait for the reading of the text. Do we have a second on that, Mr. Tibbetts? I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Let's start over here with comments. Um, would you accept a friendly amendment? Which is to remove the 3.5% uh, cap on, um, it's, the, it's the wage cap that I'm looking to, not the, not following CPI, but the cap on limiting how much uh, wages can increase by CPI. No, I wouldn't be willing to accept that. You would not accept that as a friendly amendment? I would not. Mr. Mayor, can I make a substitute motion? Sure. Uh, to uh, pass the ordinance as written with the removal of the 3.5% cap. Second. So, Madam City Attorney, that last one then trumps the first one? Uh, yes, you would take the the Substitute motion first, uh, if that does not pass, and you go back to the original motion. Okay. So before we, we start I'd comments. I'd like to add a friendly amendment to Mr. Rogers's, um, a couple of them, if that's possible. Um, yes. One is I would like to add um, enforcement language um, that uh, except where prohibited by state or federal law upon determination of a violation of this chapter after hearing that affords a suspected violator due process, city agencies and departments may revoke or suspend any registration, certificates, permits, or licenses held or requested by the employer until such a time as a violation of this chapter is remedied. So, and I do believe, council member, that that was in the latest version of the ordinance. It, it is, yeah. I, it was on a, I, perhaps I don't I have, have to show that. The version I have does not show that. Okay, thank you. So. Was that was that that you're accepting it? Because I don't see it in this version. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with accepting it. I was under the impression that it was in the latest ordinance. It, it's been in all versions of it. The problem is that we call our uh, business licenses business tax certificates, and so if you do a search for permit, that does not come up. Okay, and then additionally, I was hoping. Wait, can we before we go on that? Can you share with me where that language is, since I wasn't capturing uh, all the words you said there? 10-45.070 under enforcement, C-4. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll let it go at that. But to be clear, it's in there. It's correct. There's an old ad they said, Prego. <laughs> Are there any other friendly amendments on this, that motion? Are there any other motions before we can have a discussion on this motion in second? Not seeing. Mr. Tibbetts, if you'd like to make comments on that motion. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, a lot of the times when you deal with public policy, at least in the three years that I've sat here, you find that the issues that touch people's pocketbooks are always the most controversial, regardless of who's on what side of the issue. 
So to, to kind of help formulate my own decision, and, I, and I'm gonna get to a punchline here that I hope sinks in with this whole community. Uh, I, I looked to the own business that I help run. Uh, I looked at our budget. I looked at what increasing our folks to $15 an hour would do. And across the board, it would cost us about $55,000 a year. Um, it's about one third of our net proceeds from, from our retail sales revenues. And so I, I wanna say that because this, this does come with real impacts to the businesses. And I want the businesses to know that as a one council member of seven up here, I do acknowledge that that's not lost on me. But the other side of what I do is, is I deal with folks that live in extreme poverty every day and folks that, um, you know, I get choked up talking about it because they, I'm thinking of one example, I'm meeting with a woman tomorrow to give her a check uh, to leave town. And, you know, I, I think when we talk about being a city of excellence, when people are working two jobs and they are living not just paycheck to paycheck, but penny to penny, to the point where when they want to leave to go move to a cheaper community, they can't, they're trapped because they can't pay a security deposit in that cheaper community. And when they come to me for, or my, the organization I work for, for help to say, can you help me with a security deposit to leave this town? That just, we are obviously off track. And I, again, I, I share that because nobody should have to go through that in this community. And so I'm, I'm very eager to support this ordinance, the one that you've made, Mr. Rogers. Uh, and I hope that this council can see that see that reality and, and, and vote in unison tonight to make that happen. So thanks for letting me speak on the issue. Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do appreciate the concerns of the business community and how much work you guys do in providing jobs. However, uh, I heard somebody speak with, and uh, an, um, just very clearly over the weekend that there is false equivalencies when we do when we talk about both sides that it is really hard on businesses but when we talk about the business owners compared with the 30,000 earners in our community and in, in in addition to that that we will have compaction that will pump a, over a billion dollars back into our local economy here with some back of the envelope math and that we have to think about 30,000 people and that that means that there will be food on their table and their children will have maybe a few more hours with them because they won't have to work a third job. Growing up, I had a father who was a strong wage earner and a mom who was a teacher and was going to school at night. And I know firsthand what a difference it makes to be able to have a parent who can be around and how lonely it is for children when they don't get to see their parents. I think about the fact that women of color, African-American women don't earn the same amount as white male earners until August. I believe that that's equal wage day for women of color. For, for Caucasian women, it's in April. This is a civil rights issue. And while I feel for the bottom lines and the performers of business, owner, business owners, I get choked up because this will mean that we here in the last couple of weeks, if we're able to pass this, have done some things that will house people and feed people. And we look at our federal government in such disarray and we shake our heads. But here at the local level, we have an opportunity to come together and do something meaningful, collaborative, and stabilizing for not just our women, our children, our family, our people of color, but it also will ripple out into the economy. And I really do hope that we don't lose jobs and I don't think we will. And I couldn't be prouder to be part of this council that's taking on these issues. Thank you all for coming out. Ms. Gomes. I'm looking forward to supporting the $15 by 2020. Um, I'm also looking forward to sometime in the future uh, having folks come before us and talk about how important it is for all of their employees to be able to be housed in our community. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all those businesses who have employees that are like family understanding that those families are struggling and speaking toward that struggle. Um, I'm very frustrated when we have the same group of people who fight rent control 
fighting increases in wages. Um, I find that I find that very difficult. Um, and I want to appreciate the work of Marty Bennett, Mara, North Bay Jobs for Justice, North Bay Organizing Project, uh, a variety of political entities that have shown up here today. Um, thank you for this persistent long-term work on behalf of our population, our, the people of our town. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I was a little amused actually when I saw that I had the, the um, ordinance to read in front of me this afternoon, being one of the most vocal uh, council members uh, over the years fighting uh, an increase uh, in the minimum wage because of the uh, reality of messing with labor markets and markets in general. Uh, there will be, there's always a bit of, of um, fallout and some of it's um, predictable, some of it's not as predictable. Um, I do uh, feel for the restaurateurs, I wish the state could have come up with a reasonable way to deal with the reality of tips because of the, um, those employees are not, um, are not making $12 an hour. Um, we all contribute to that as we support our restaurants and I hope you continue to do that because they will be one of the, the largest hit um, uh, in, in, our, in our city. Um, don't decrease your tips just because they, the minimum wage went up uh, potentially. So there are lots of stresses in our community. I know that, that income is one of the social determinants of health and I'm the immediate past chair of the Center of Community Health and we offer health care to one out of four people in Santa Rosa. So I know it's, it is, there are so many stresses that are hitting Santa, you know, Santa Rosans and many other people, not only in this in California, but, but nationally, stresses that didn't exist 10 years ago when I closed my business after 65 years. But I know what, and part of what I, why I fought, um, why I questioned the, the validity of, of raising the minimum wage is because I never paid the minimum. It was always higher and we gave full medical. Um, so I was, I was, I know what it would have done to us. We would have had to close before 2010. The last couple of years before we closed, we paid the employees and the landlord um, and, and took no draw ourselves because, because that was the right thing to do. And I really appreciate the research done by, the, by staff. Uh, I, I know that, uh, Raisa, you weren't alone uh, probably in, in compiling that. Um, but we had a couple of good conversations. And the, the fear that I had gained over the years um, as, a, as a longtime retailer, um, I may be one of the only retailers uh, sitting at the dais uh, tonight, um, was to me real. Uh, but I also understand those stresses that are happening in our community now. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a teenager or someone in their early 20s trying to make a go of it in Santa Rosa given how expensive it is to live here. Um, and the, the uh, rents are just a, a part of that. So I will be, um, I'll be supporting uh, the increase in the minimum wage tonight. Um, I know that it's, it's it will come as a surprise to many, um, but <laughs> um, but I also, you know, <laughs> I, I always say, give me a reasonable, or give me a reason, a, a good reason to change my mind, and um, uh, there will be there there will be fallout. Um, from our businesses and, and I, I, those that are capable of making changes that are not on the, on the edge will do that. We, we will probably lose some and, and perhaps it is true that, that maybe they were challenged to begin with. Um, but again, I, I realize this is um, for me and for our community the right thing to do. So I will be hitting that green light. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank Raisa for all of your work that you've done on this. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things across the board from folks about how much time and energy you've put into this. I also want to thank Professor Guzman, who I've had a chance to talk to a number of different times about the reports that he's done, the additional information that he's provided. Uh, he's gotten back to me a number of times on individual questions that I had as well, and I know he couldn't be here tonight, but I thought he needed to be thanked as well. Uh, folks have heard me 
talk about this before from the dais, but oftentimes what we talk about at the council is economic inequality and poverty without actually calling it economic inequality and poverty. Every time we have a conversation about affordable housing and how we're going to drive housing production so that folks can find a place to live, we're talking about one side of the equation and that's on what people are spending. And we've very rarely had a chance to talk about what people are making and what type of capacity that they have for that housing. When we talk about climate, we're oftentimes talking about systemic changes because we know that folks, particularly the, those who are struggling in our community, don't have the funds in their pocket to be part of an individual change. They can't drive a Tesla, they don't have solar panels if they don't own their home. And so how do we draw them in on the other priorities around our community? And that's all talking about poverty without actually talking about poverty. We currently are at the highest level of economic inequality since the census started tracking that. That's new data that came out three days ago. Uh, it's even worse as we heard for women and people of color, uh, and I think that that needs to be acknowledged as well. What we're trying to do tonight is return the purchasing power to low-income workers to make sure that they can stay in our community and that they are a part of our local economy, being able to spend money. We know that they're not saving money. We hear that week in and week out. And I also wanna make sure that we're, we're very clear that we're not trying to leave particularly small businesses behind. So I asked the question of Raisa about what we're going to do to try to also help small businesses that we know might need a little bit of help, might need some strengthening uh, from our community. And there was a, a comment that was made to me in the outreach, and, and I apologize, I got flooded with emails and phone calls, and I promise I'll get back to folks if I haven't already. I know the other council members were flooded as well. But one person told me, it, it's easier for the council to help a few struggling businesses than it is to help 25,000 struggling workers. This is a systemic approach to solving what hits so many of us on a personal and individualistic level. Uh, I, I, Anybody who's followed us on social media has seen these conversations wage about how great the economy is and leave things alone because the economy is great. The reality is that wages have been stagnant for 20 years. And I keep asking folks, if not now, when? When is the market going to put that upward pressure? When are we actually going to see wages rise? And the answer is tonight. We're doing that from the dais tonight. The, the, The final comment that I wanted to make, and I, those of you who are here for the study session know that this is a particular pet peeve of mine, but I, I enjoyed the gentleman who was um, educating us on tips and how that applies. And again, I want to just point out again, the historic origins of tip prevalence in this country was so that folks of color or women could make a different wage in the amount that people were paying. And I, as a consumer, when I go into a restaurant and I'm expecting to buy a, a $5 beer, I already know the price is $6 because I know that that tip is going to be in there. So adding an additional amount, raising the cost of that to actually be able to afford for the, the service of somebody coming in is something I already expect. I know we'll see it a little bit, uh, but that's just my own personal pet peeve. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the process because I think as a community, those of us who have been on council for a little bit, we've had some adversarial conversations. And what I really appreciated my conversations, not only with staff, which they ought to be friendly, but with some of the other groups um, that sometimes people would think it's an adversarial conversation. And I just really appreciate the amount of information that's been shared because it's a tough call up here. It's, it's not exactly a, a black and white issue because there are impacts. And I, and I, you know, I think Council Member Fleming mentioned it. Um, I'm proud to be part of a, a council that we actually do listen to all sides. And I know some people say, you guys already had your mind made up before you came in. Yeah, not me. And I I don't think any of my colleagues because there's so much information and there, I, I don't wanna say there's winners or losers, but I think each of us, and for me specifically, I'm gonna be making um, the decision that I think is in the best interest of the city of Santa Rosa at this time for our entire community. Um, and so, you know, you're very predictive. If Lee Pierce is still here, I think you are gonna get unanimous consent on this because I think it is the right thing to do for the city. And any of the uh, unintended consequences that this may cause, I think we are also a community that can come back together and try to address those unintended consequences if they raise up to um, our level here. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, your votes, please. Yeah. 
And that passes unanimously. So with that, Ms. McGlynn, council is going to take a, council is, is there something else we, on that item? Council is going to take a 15 minute break. And then when we come back, we'll be on the second public hearing, item 15.2, when we come back after our break. Thank you.
Okay, we'll reconvene Mr. McGlynn, item 15.2. Item 15.2. Public hearing, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 21 of the Santa Rosa City Code, updating Chapter 21-02 Housing Allocation Plan to modify the requirements and incentives for providing on-site inclusionary housing units, a resolution updating the housing impact fee, and a resolution to establish a commercial linkage fee for new commercial development within the city of Santa Rosa. Claire Hartman, Deputy Director of Planning, leading us off. Great, thank you. Um, Mayor Sweldham, members of the City Council, I'd like to first introduce the city team and the consultant team that have put this package together. Um, this was truly an interdepartmental effort uh, and from many different um, perspectives. So with the city team, obviously David Gouin, our assistant city manager, myself, Andy Gustafson, uh, Jessica Jones, our, our resident now in Windsor, uh, Raisa De La Rosa for economic development, Megan Bassinger for housing, Ashley Crocker, our city attorney's office. Uh, everybody contributed a great deal to this effort in the, our community outreach and the preparation of the draft ordinance. Um, also, we couldn't do this without um, our consultant team, Heather Hines and Jim Carney of M Group, Karen Warner of Karen Warner Associates, Sarah Graham and Bob Spencer, who's not present tonight, um, uh, strategic economics, but the rest are here and available for questions as we walk through the ordinance. So what we have before you tonight is a uh, draft, one draft ordinance and two resolutions that address fees. And this is brought to you because this is part of our housing action plan. So in program one of that housing action plan, this is uh, intended to address inclusionary housing or specifically the production of affordable housing in the city and looking at it from a couple of different ways, um, reconsidering our inclusionary housing ordinance and also evaluating uh, whether or not the city of Santa Rosa is ready for a commercial linkage fee. So the housing action plan is many different initiatives that we've been working on. Several of these that you see here are accomplished and in effect at this moment. Others we're still working on, but it's never one of these initiatives that's going to make housing happen for Santa Rosa. It's really this collection of integrated comprehensive effort. So uh, this is no different. This is just another tool in that toolbox that we're working on. So tonight we're going to, it's a two-part presentation. Uh, the first part is inclusionary housing. We're gonna look at uh, the, the analysis that's set up for the draft ordinance that's before you tonight. Uh, the options of building the units on site or paying a fee or both hybrids. Uh, what type of uh, project types and sizes would be uh, uh, relevant to either of those options. Uh, Areas and needs to address innovation, things we haven't thought of or heard of, alternatives to these things, and how we're gonna address that. Flexibility is what we've heard a lot uh, through this process. Uh, implementation, uh, and then uh, revisiting the impact fee itself and what levels uh, we should set that at. Second part of the presentation will be commercial linkage fee. Um, and again, how does that fit in with the overall housing strategy? So how, does, how do we evaluate the responsibility or the opportunity for our non-residential uses to contribute to housing? So a little bit of background before we head into the draft ordinance itself. Uh, this slide is essentially just showing our progress to date. Um, in terms of production of housing. Um, as you can see, in recent years, there's a significant decline in housing production. And so uh, the housing action plan, all the initiatives, including the one tonight, needs to be written in a way that is incentivizing housing production and works with a development market so be, to not detour the production of housing. And so we work with that in mind. Uh, this is how we are doing um, in our current housing cycle. This is not unique to Santa Rosa, but as you can see, uh, the two different colors here, the remaining need is in red and the permits issued in our current housing cycle, which is 2015 to 2023. You can see that uh, there's a lot more to, to do in our, in our time. Um, and again, it's not unique to Santa Rosa, but what is, is our toolbox needs to be a fit for Santa Rosa. 
Uh, this slide is uh, identifying what we mean by affordable housing in terms of different income groups. Uh, and then this slide talks about the two primary options that are before you tonight in the ordinance. One is uh, on-site inclusionary housing, which means you're built, putting it on site. Uh, it uh, has pluses and minuses, we'll go over that. But essentially, it's where you, we get typically the low income um, units are uh, just the nature of how inclusionary housing uh, manifests itself through partnerships and whatnot. Um, but we looked at different ways of how we would write inclusionary so that you could get other types of income levels in inclusionary. Um, and then the housing impact fee is another primary option. And with that, um, we tend to work with in partnerships and, and leveraging uh, the fees that we collect is often used to fill a gap or sort of the, the, last, the last dollar, if you will, to complete a affordable housing project. So we have in the past, um, since 1992, have varying different uh, housing uh, policies related to inclusionary housing. Um, and in the more recent cycle of our ordinance, the default was uh, paying a fee, but what I, we wanted to do is present, so how we've done since 1992, how much housing have we produced, either by fee or by inclusionary. And as you can see here, uh, not a whole lot in either category, but um, what you can see is there's 1,500 in the housing impact fee, and one thing I do feel we need to recognize is those aren't outright provided by the housing impact fee. Again, the impact fee goes toward making those 1,500 units um, accessible, um, feasible. So it's it's a, a partnership with other monies and leveraging of other monies that make that happen. So with that, uh, we're gonna move into, Andy's gonna go over our draft ordinance and our outreach comments that we've received to date that helped formulate that draft ordinance. And Andy. Thank you, Claire. Um, so I think you will recall we had a study session in August and that really culminated a uh, six month period that we were actively reaching out to the development community, affordable housing providers, community members, as well as um, presenting to the Housing Authority and Planning Commission to vet the ordinance concepts. Uh, this program, that outreach program resulted in some key issues or comments that um, are part of the ordinance that will be presented to you. One is that the inclusionary and uh, fee should be blended, that it, the ordinance itself shouldn't rely exclusively on one tool or the other. Um, and that flexibility is really important to promote residential projects throughout the city. We need to be able to adapt or modify requirements to fit the individual project circumstance. And that incentives are really important to um, promote higher intensity development, particularly downtown where our uh, downtown specific plan is now uh, looking at ways of getting more housing uh, in a part of the city where we can support it most. Thank you. Um, some of the key points that the public raised was, um, and, and I'll, I'll say also affordable housing developers, that the housing impacts fees are a critical tool, uh, funding source to support uh, projects that rely on low income tax credits and uh, inclusionary projects uh, give an opportunity, interestingly enough, for market rate developers and affordable housing developers to collaborate um, to build a blended project, um, each taking responsibility for the type of housing that they know how best to build, and there are some efficiencies there. Um, the other concept that was brought up was that our inclusionary percentage requirement uh, should be tiered that the level of affordability and the percentage really should work together um, and, and, and that way uh, unburden, not be so burdensome to a developer who's contemplating building affordable units on the site. We learned also that um, land dedication, while um, it, it sounds good, often has a lot of hidden costs. So when um, we 
were to, if we were to accept a land dedication for a future housing development site, there are a lot of costs that aren't recognized up front that often uh, make a future project challenging to finance. And then um, finally, um, in terms of flexibility, there is a desire to incorporate some of the uh, flexibility that's built into the density bonus to allow for dispersion uh, requirement to be relaxed, particularly when we have a circumstance where a blended project where affordable units are mixed with uh, market, market rate units in a building uh, makes it difficult to finance. The um, key part of this program that we went through is based on uh, nexus studies and a white paper that summarized the findings, which really has gave us a snapshot or an understanding of what our development context is. Um, the residential impact fee nexus study took a look at the type of residential development that we're likely to see here, single family detached, single family detached, um, 2,000 and 1,600 square feet each, and then multifamily development um, apartment buildings. And based on the cost of constructing those units in this marketplace and um, um, the, 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 oh, the average sales price, cost versus what the, 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 the units can be sold for or rented for, um, it was established that there's a certain amount of financial return uh, the developer needs. And on the right-hand column there is the uh, return on investment cost or, or uh, yield that's needed for a developer to decide that Santa Rosa is a place where it's feasible to actually build. So we're looking at 15 to 18% for products that are sold and about 6 to 7% for products that are being rented. And the, the, the challenge we have with this ordinance is to balance the different um, factors or variables that come into play in an inclusionary ordinance. How much inclusionary do we require, the percentage? What type of affordability are we mandating? And then does it apply to all project sizes? All those work together to make the on-site inclusionary requirement um, work or not. Um, likewise, it's counterbalanced the housing impact fee. We need to really look carefully at the fee that we were requesting in lieu of building units on the site to make sure that we're not uh, dipping deeply into the developer's financing to uh, exceed those rates of returns that we saw on the previous slide, that those fees don't jeopardize the, the financial feasibility of a project. So again, we're, we're, we're looking at the balance, that's what we're trying to achieve, and um, in the ordinance that I'll present now, those key elements, um, we'll go through those in detail. So it's kind of a good time to pause if you have any questions about those uh, particular points of, um, or issues. Great, Council, any questions? Ms. Fleming? Thank you very much, Claire and Andy. I want to go back to slide 11 and um, go over the, um, our, just confirm that you are suggesting that we have an exemption for um, incl inclusionary units or, or inclusion um, developments that wouldn't pencil if they were required to do inclusionary housing? Um. This is on the dispersion uh, exemption or implementation. Which item are you referring to? Yeah. So the um, this this provision mirrors what the density bonus um, ordinance provides. That in certain cases the developer would have to show that the financing that is being proposed for a project would not be feasible or would jeopardize the project um, if mixed income development occurs. So feasibility uh, seems like a financial standard is jeopardy, would that be another standard? And I'm wondering, because what I'm trying to understand here is that if it's not something that somebody wants to do, they could say it jeopardizes my project. How can we determine that it does jeopardize their project or is this simply a financial matter and they have to prove it via a pro forma or something? 
we would require some level of, of proof or, or standard of, of evidence to show that there is a, a bona fide risk to the project financing. We understand from comments we received that low income tax credit financing is challenging in a mixed uh, income project. That right, the, I always hear that it's challenging, right. but nobody ever says it's impossible. So I'm, right. I'm hoping you know, that we can get toward I think, as Andy mentioned, we did hear loud and clear in terms of the direction of the council. Um, we have the realities of tax credits and what that does. So one of the things we'll be looking at is working with the housing authority and the housing department to figure out what those projects are and really make sure that that's what's required for the financing. Um, you're going to hear later in the presentation the flexibility. So this is one of the elements that did change from the original, uh, the previous policy that allowed um, projects to have um, units around. Now we're saying that it has to be mixed unless you can show this. And so I think this is an extra step that we're trying to put in place. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Ms. Combs? Thank you, I'm looking at slide six, um, mostly because it sure looks like, my sense of our community is that we really need to be building extremely low, very low, low, moderate housing. But when I look at a chart like this, it sure looks to me like above moderate is desperately needed in our community because of the way the chart is shown using unit numbers instead of percentage of goal. Um, so, uh, I mean, a quick calculation shows that from moderate to extremely low, we're falling short 80% in the extremely low and very low, we're falling short 90%, whereas we're at about 60% on the above moderate. So it, it concerns me to show this without showing also the percent of how much we're attaining. Um, just that's, that's perhaps more of a, comment than a question, but I think that um, if I saw this and was less informed, I would wonder why we are concerned about very low income. Um, and, and I think that story is necessary, and I'm hoping that you'll use percentages in the future. So we're, we're certainly gonna look at different ways to illustrate the information. I think that's a good point. Um, but Rena is um, targeting specific numbers. It's a quanti quantitative exercise, but I, I think it's a great point. We should look at different ways of illustrating the information for our public. We definitely, thank you. We definitely need to meet our housing goals. And it will be interesting to see the future of how our Rena numbers look, because I really don't think that we're matching our housing numbers with our incomes in the community. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping we can get there at some other meeting and not this one. Just an aside, I think more than anything. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, please continue. Thank you. So the next series of slides will go through the uh, key components of the ordinance update. And we'll just kind of look at what the existing ordinance requires and, and what's being proposed here. Um, this first slide looks at the inclusionary requirement. Currently, um, the developer has discretion to uh, choose to build units on the site or pay the fee. Um, what we're proposing is to basically continue that um, same policy, but to insert a, a project size threshold that says for smaller projects, and that should read one to six units, I apologize, um, the developer pays an impact fee. And for projects that are larger, um, seven and above, they have a choice to either build the unit on site or pay the fee. Um, what this does is enters into an much earlier in the process, a conversation about what works best for a specific project. Um, I would also like to note here that the developer who is building a small project can, through the innovative uh, uh, compliance approach, say, hey, look, it works better for me to build a unit on site because, for instance, I may choose to couple some of the advantages of a density bonus on my project to get more concessions. So 
just because we say one through six should be a fee should, shall be paid, it doesn't preclude the option for a developer to come in with you with units. So that's a critical theme about flexibility that we inserted here. Are we? Are we? And forgive me, you're probably about to come to this. I would hope that we're leaning toward encouraging building on site. And I'm trying to, when I see the somebody has a choice, my feeling about this line has to do with how we're encouraging folks to build on site. So I, I hope that you'll clarify that when we get to that point. Yes, I think Thank you'll, you. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what we'd like to do is present the whole of the ordinance. That way, as you as you remember when we went through the study session, these are iterative things, so it's really the comprehensiveness that shows you how this is put together. So we'll walk through the draft ordinance, and then it's a great time to pause for questions about the elements of the ordinance and how they fit together. Um, so this this slide really talks about it really talks about does the inclusionary ordinance apply to all residential development as it does now, uh, or um, are, are there uh, built-in uh, exclusions or exceptions uh, based on size? And what we're saying here is the ordinance will apply to all residential development. There will continue to be exemptions that we have in place. Uh, exemptions for uh, ADUs, owner builder units, uh, community care facilities, uh, the types of uses which are, are providing um, by definition a, an affordable supportive type housing that we need. So one of the key changes that we're proposing in terms of inclusionary requirement is a tiered approach as was uh, brought to our attention during the review process. Currently, we have a flat 15% low income household requirement um, if a developer elects to build on site. The proposal is to uh, have a citywide tiered inclusionary requirement that for for sale, 10% mo uh, moderate, and that at 120 AMI doesn't so overstress a, a project that it, it doesn't preclude the developer from seriously thinking about building the units on site. And as that chart we looked at now, uh, just previously the arena chart, that would definitely help a needed housing category. Um, for the for rent category, um, we're, we're tiering low and very low at 8% and 5% respectively. Um, this again helps to lessen the financial burden of providing on-site uh, development. And um, we think this is one of the key changes to the ordinance to help incentivize on-site development to your point. Another thing that we heard and what we're responding to here is to provide um, uh, encouragement for development downtown. So for downtown multifamily and mixed use projects only, we would um, reduce the uh, inclusionary requirement to 5% for moderate for sale products. So those could be um, condominiums in a multifamily type building um, or for rent, 4% and 3% for low and very low income households. Um, this, we think, might um, really bring a developer downtown and, and unlock potentially that financial puzzle to make a project go forward successfully. Um, there, there is a uh, recommended modification here that uh, we want to be able to present to you. Um, and that is that when a project does come forward downtown at these lower um, percentages, we want to uh, add a provision to the inclusionary requirement of the ordinance that says essentially, if you come forward and you comply with this, this affordability, you will earn an incentive or concession because without that provision, um, we would not be able to go to the density bonus regulation and uh, 
expect that very low and low income projects, even moderate income projects downtown would earn a inclusionary, uh, or, or excuse me, a um, concession or, or an incentive. So that's a provision that um, at the end, when you take action on the ordinance, uh, we will uh, read into the record a recommended um, uh, the language, and you have that there in front of you uh, in bold. Um, I, before you move on, yeah. just a point of clarification, because we were trying to explain also existing versus what's proposed. So currently, if an applicant complies with our inclusionary housing ordinance, then they, the code currently says you are granted a concession. So that is a built-in incentive. And in fact, the amendment before you tonight, we want you to include, with our recommendation would be to continue that incentive. So if you comply, and I would say the recommendation is not just for downtown, but to be consistent with our current mm -hmm. policy, because it is an attractive, again, we're trying to build in incentives, not require them to do inclusionary, but to want to have them want to do inclusionary because because of a whole package of other incentives. So that, that one incentive where you get a concession, if you comply with our inclusionary, is really key. So that is definitely an amendment before you tonight. Thank you, Claire. Um, I do, and I apologize, um, want to uh, note also that there was a provision of our ordinance that defined project size that we need to add to this same section, and we will also add that to the record to clarify that projects with six or less units um, would be subject to the impact fee um, and, and that the larger uh, units, larger projects would um, have the choice of doing inclusionary units as or pay the fee. The next series of slides deal with development standards. Um, we're, we're really not changing uh, the existing requirements dramatically, though we are clarifying that it's really important that the inclusionary units on the site uh, on the outside appear uh, the same as the remainder of the project, but recognize that on the inside of the units, um, we're, we're wanting to make sure that the bedroom mix and the size are similar to the, the remainder of the market rate projects or units on the site. Um, so that's really a continuation of policy. Um, and then here in terms of uh, flexibility on how to comply with the ordinance uh, for the inclusionary aspect, currently we have um, mechanisms that allow offsite construction of affordable units within the same quadrant of the city. Uh, we talked about land dedication, and then we have an innovative alternative. All three would continue with this current, uh, with a proposed ordinance, but we'd, we would add something new. Um, we would allow uh, developers to convert uh, existing units on a site to affordable, and then also um, allow uh, credit for or recognition of preserving at-risk affordable units. Um, this will be helpful to promote uh, protection of ex existing housing stock within the city. And then for something um, new to this city, but not new uh, elsewhere in the state, we would uh, establish a uh, credit for affordable units that are built on the site in excess of the inclusionary requirement, which a developer from another project in the future might be able to benefit from. Um, and we, we can talk more about the details of that if you have questions. So um, those, those uh, elements we hope will help incentivize on-site uh, development of affordable units. Finally, um, we have, uh, in terms of the ordinance provisions, uh, we're recommending extending the term of the affordability on inclusionary units to 55 years. That's consistent with our density bonus and other housing-related regulation. And uh, here, I wanted just to show the list of exemptions that are available to projects, to different types of housing that already provide needed housing for special uh, uh, needs populations in the city, as well as extend that exemption to owner builders um, and, and not apply it to additions and replacement units. 
So that kind of wraps up the, uh, the ordinance mechanics. Uh, the next set of slides talk about the uh, housing impact fee, which um, evaluated the, uh, the amount of fee that would be appropriate to charge for these different housing types uh, and, and not jeopardize the financial feasibility of projects. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the next slide's gonna help explain this table visually. Um, but I just wanna point out here a couple things. Um, our for sale fee now is based on two and a half percent of the sales price. We're proposing to leave that metric, that unit of measure, and apply a fee uniformly based on uh, square footage. Um, we continue to recognize in our fee structure going forward, the distinction between small units and larger units, small being defined as 100, 909 square feet or less, large is um, 910 square feet and above. Um, we would have essentially a fee program established that would for citywide housing projects um, be staged over five years in, in three steps to bring up the fee to um, an amount that can be supported uh, uh, by development and not exceed the uh, development feasibility threshold. In addition here on the bottom line, you will see that we have also a discounted fee, a reduced fee that will help, uh, we believe, incentivize um, multifamily type development, both for sale and rent downtown, which is what is being targeted for that area. And um, the next chart will hopefully illustrate uh, the first, so this is the existing fee structure um, which is which is based on at the left side, the smaller units is a dollar a square foot. And then beyond uh, 910 square feet, that per square foot rate increases as you see there on the graph and it caps out at, I think it's $2,700, um, two, no, excuse me, $2,750 per unit. Um, $12,750 per unit, excuse me. Um, the maximum fee that was uh, determined to be supportable and not drive a project below uh, financial feasibility is $10 a square foot, and that's plotted across the unit sizes. What we were proposing is this staged fee program, which would start out at, um, in the first years one and two, for the small units would be $2 a square foot, and then for the larger units would be $5 a square foot. That explains that jump in, the, uh, in that uh, curve. In years three to five, um, the fee would increase to um, $5 for a small unit per square foot and $8 per square foot. And then after year five, it jumps from five, it goes to um, five dollars a square foot for the small units, and then to ten dollars for the larger larger units. So you can see, after five years, this transition brings us up to a um, a basis which a, a fee program which could have a substantial contribution to um, our funds to help support and fund affordable housing projects here in the city but it's done in a way stepwise so that current pending projects would not be adversely impacted and there's enough time for residential developers to factor in these increases into their pro forma um, without disrupting necessary projects in the, in the near term. The next slide shows again the uh, base fee that applies in this case for downtown and, and this is the maximum fee uh, the um, curves here are in reverse order, and I apologize for that. The, um, the first uh, year, the fee would be would remain at a dollar per square foot downtown for the small units, and it would go up to um, three dollars a square foot for the larger units. And then in year uh, three and thereafter downtown, the small units would uh, go up to $2 per square foot and the larger units would remain at $3. So 
you can see that it's a much lower fee um, level assessment uh, downtown, again, in keeping with uh, the idea that um, we want to incentivize developers to come downtown and build housing. Finally, this slide just kind of provides a snapshot of fees that are charged or assessed in the area. What I'd like to call your attention to is the Santa Rosa proposed fee. That number there reflects the current fee and for each of those items, uh, types of units there in the top, uh, the fee would increase to $10 a square foot after five years on a citywide basis. So you can see a $10 per square foot fee is right in the mix of the range of fees that are charged locally. We're not an outlier. That concludes um, the fee component of the inclusionary ordinance. There's a resolution for you to act on to adopt this. The, and then I can take questions now on this particular matter before we commence with the um, commercial linkage fee. Great, thanks. Mr. Chavez. Thank you, Mayor. I'll try to be as brief as, as possible. Thank you for this report. Uh, one of the questions I had is you, you talked earlier in the slides, and forgive me, I'm, I'm pretty brain dead at this point, but convert existing units that are, that are um, I think it had to do with extending the deed restriction. But one question, I know this, or at least I'm pretty sure this isn't what it was proposing, but is, is there an, was it slide 19? Do you mind going to slide 19? Yes, this was it. And I know this isn't what, what it's asking for, but is there a situation where in this ordinance, let's say you're a developer owner, and because I understand some of the times when I talk to developers, the fear about uh, doing inclusionary on-site mixed door is that the units, uh, it just, it's, they've got a mortgage and it's one of those costs those expenses on their books that becomes difficult to deal with if you've got certain units restricted and you don't have the ability to increase those. It, would it be possible to add to this uh, the opportunity for, let's say you've got another property somewhere in the city of Santa Rosa, it's been paid off, there's no mortgage on it anymore, to dedicate those units to, to kind of <clears throat> meet the requirement? Am I making any sense or talking gibberish? No, I think you're, you're speaking of an offsite, fulfilling the inclusionary yes. requirement by identifying an offsite, existing offsite project. The problem with that is we're not getting new units. Um, so that, that would be a policy consideration. Uh, if you're developing new units offsite, then, then um, uh, that does increase the overall housing production as well as provide affordable units. I understand that we want to do both. We want to yeah. produce housing, a new unit to market and produce affordable housing, but would that example of converting an existing market rate to a deed restricted unit fulfill the on-site or the off-site requirement, excuse me? So in that scenario, I think we would probably have to um, use the innovate, in innovation um, policy in, uh -huh. in the ordinance and, and the test there is, would, would that approach further our housing element uh, goals and policies? Mm -hmm. Megan. I'm Megan Bassinger, Housing and Community Services Manager. I think the answer is yes, we would use our affordability agreements to restrict the dedicated offsite units for 55 years in compliance with the ordinance. Okay. I mean, nobody's actually talked to me about that, but it was something while you were talking, I was thinking mm -hmm. of would that be some uh, way that we could troubleshoot some of these issues with developers who may not have the sophistication, to be honest, to do mixed income housing, the mixed doors with re deed restrictions. I know that's kind of a complaint that we face a lot. Um, and also just, just trying to get these, these new units to market. But I do know that some of the folks we work with in our planning department own existing properties free and clear elsewhere that it, it might be less of a bottom line impact, but but help. So I just want to throw that out there. I hope that we, we have those conversations either as a council or as staff to, to make that option available. Um, can we, the other thing I wanted to ask is, can we lock in the fees at plan submittal? Because it's my understanding that we do have some, some projects in our pipeline right now and 
I'm recently getting experience in this field on a personal level, and I do understand that at a, at a certain point, costs tend to increase, uh, and it usually happens, the real cost incurs uh, after you've done plan submittal. Is it possible to lock those in at that point versus issuance of building permits? And I think that uh, timing issue is a part of our uh, resolution. I'm taking a look at that right now. When those fees come due? Yeah, they're due, currently due when you, you pull the, the permit. Um, I think that's that's something we are looking at for a number of fees we have in terms of when they're due. Um, one of the things that does lock in, the one that we're looking at potentially modeling is the building code cycle. So when you when you submit your permit, that's when the you're, you lock in at that building code cycle. So we're looking to see what that would take to change the fees potentially to that same date. So everything locks in at that same point. Um, that is a, um, something that we've been talking about and trying to figure out if uh, how to figure how to address that. Okay. Um, also, I was, I was curious too, what are the current rates for capital facilities fee, water, sewer, and park per square foot? Are we, are we looking at, one slide I didn't see up there was kind of the overall picture, you know, by making these increases, what are we doing to the overall uh, fee level in the city and what's that look like? So those fees were factored into the total cost of construction in the, uh, the Nexus study to look at um, how much remains uh, capacity in a project to carry the housing impact fees. So those were built in. Um, I, I can try to point you to that in, in the packet, uh, but that, that was a, a part of the analysis. Okay, yes, can you? You said you could point to it. We'll, we'll pull that up for you. I think, yeah, I think, I think so the question is what, what, what impact does this have on the overall fee impact? So, because we did adjust the fee. So in the, just a heads up on the downtown and others, it might be a little different, but we could look citywide and give you that number. Because we do have the downtown incentive program, which changes those fees. The, the reason why what I wanted to get to, and I'll try to, to spare the effort, um, is because it, are there opportunities to reduce some of the rates in other areas? I mean, one one clear example I think is the parks impact fee uh, that we have. My understanding is that that fee is on new park development. Yet a couple of meetings ago, this council had a conversation about using new park revenue to maintain the parks that we have, which sig signaled to me sitting up here that we may not be have an appetite to start rapidly developing more parks. So would that be an area that we could look at kind of reining in a little bit as we try to attract new development? And I do wanna note the this evening's discussion is on the housing impact fees. We're not here really to talk about the other development fees that might attach to projects. And, and I think what I'll, I'll add, I think, is that when we did the impact fees, the park fees, CFF fees, we talked about that, that this inclusionary fee was coming um, and that we tried to hold those fees to make sure we had capacity to have this conversation that we're having tonight. Um, but I think to, uh, we hear your point in terms of looking at the overall impact now that the, if this fee goes into effect, we will be looking at the overall package to see what we need to do moving forward. So. Thank you. That's That was kind of the... What I was driving at, David, appreciate it. Ms. Collins. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that I did not get to have the separated meeting with you to clarify some questions that I might have. So you're, uh, unfortunately, we're doing it late tonight. Um, so thank you very much. I wanted to ask uh, follow up to my colleague's question. I understand you lock in costs at time of permit application or when the permit is pulled. Um, that doesn't mean that they're due at that time. So I didn't know if we were looking at any flexibility in due date versus date when you're locked in on the amount. That's correct. So we have two two different numbers, two different dates. The date when it's uh, the fee is locked in, which is when you pull your permit. Right. Uh, we do have a fee deferral program that defers the fees till uh, the end of the basically the end of the project. And so that that's that's an option. No, that's a that's a fee deferral that's open to anybody that wants to apply okay. for that. Yeah. And my question still on I think this slide nineteen. Um, it looks as if we're creating a market. 
uh, allowing the transfer of inclusionary units from uh, one entity to another entity where we're kind of doing a, you know, this, this person builds a whole lot of inclusionary units and then does some kind of market thing, sort of selling them to someone who needs extra, needs units when they have extra ones. I'm just asking if, it sure looks like we're establishing a kind of market. Did we talk about it that way? I have not looked in detail at what are the implications of creating this kind of market. Um, I'm assuming that it's a good thing or you wouldn't have brought it forward, but can you clarify the implications of creating this kind of a market? Well, what I can clarify is how we came up with the, the, the option. Um, what we heard loud and clear from all stakeholder groups is to, to add some element of flexibility and some room for innovation uh, because uh, past policies on, on inclusionary and impact fees have been you, you must do this and you must do it in this exact way and that has not incentivized nor has it been easy to work with uh, because the the financing of housing, the world of housing is constantly changing, our markets are changing, and so one thing we heard loud and clear is to have some element in the ordinance that has a process, a vetting process, and so, you know, some of these we have never done, and so right. we will be learning together what the implications are specifically, but what this ordinance does, the way it's written, is it allows the option to be considered, an option to be considered that that maybe is new to us, so that's where that's where that comes from. Let me clarify that I think creating a market is a good idea. The, the individual who built extra units um, can benefit from having done so. I'm more concerned about having whether or not this really means the kind of thing that happened in Roner Park, where they get a calculation in an area and decided they had enough affordable units and then somebody who came in with a big project, they didn't require affordable units because they said the region had enough. But the individuals who had built all those affordable units didn't benefit in the way that the individual who came in later benefited from their work. And that didn't feel fair to me, to the previous development group. Um, so I'm concerned about understanding whether what we're doing here is making a market or what we're doing here is saying we're going to draw an arbitrary boundary and if there's enough units in it, we're not going to require the next one. Did, am I clear in what my question is? Okay. Yeah, and I would ask Karen uh, Warner here to maybe describe how this type of a program has been implemented elsewhere in the state. But it's my understanding is we're not drawing a boundary or regions within the, the city in, in establishing an affordability number or quota. Thank you. Right, Andy um, is is correct. It, it's it's not um, reducing um, the net number of affordable units, but um, both Novato and Ronert Park have um, an inclusionary credit program. Um, where the um, the initial um, donor project is first, and then the receiving project is second. So you can't you can't have it the other way around. I understand the sequence. I'm trying to understand who benefits from the initial donor project coming in because it didn't wasn't clear to me that in Roner Park the initial donor project benefited from providing extra units. It seemed as if the only benefit came from the second group that came in and said, oh, there's already units, so we don't have to do any. So I don't under, I'm trying to understand, I, I don't like that sort of imbalance system. It, it, Yeah, I think I think the way this would work, and I think this is helpful helpful enough this conversation is that if a developer puts these in place, that uh, the developer would own the those credits owns the credits. Yeah, so okay. it's not coming to the city, and then we divvy those out. I think the intent is that if a, a developer builds a project and they have another project coming, they could use those credits. So it's their credit. Okay, and it's 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 an independent market from the government. C correct. Yeah. Okay. So, but we would need to well, manage. I'm an odd person to be saying how much I like that. Well, but I, and I think, but it's <laughs> a, I think you're making a good point though that it's up to us to make sure that that is being not abused. Right. So that's part right. of this innovation component that Claire talked about. 
we're trying to add flexibility in this, but it's also going to take some okay. some of oversight from from I, us to make sure this is done right. I appreciate yeah. the flexibility. I appreciate the role yeah. government has as oversight, but I, I and I like the market idea. I just wanted to make sure that it was a fair market. Thanks. Other question, Ms. Fleming. So I think my my questions around that. Um, have been somewhat, um, my concerns have been somewhat allayed, but I'm wondering, would the would the units in that scenario be transferable, beyond, or would they be required to stay with that? So if I'm a developer and I build extras, can I um, transfer them to another developer to help them with their development project to meet their inclusionary goals? That would be the attempt that the units themselves would not leave. They would continue to be allocated under a 55-year contract, but the um, the credit for those units could be liberated from the site and, and applied to a, a separate site. Right, that's that, what I'm asking. Are the credits transferable? Yeah. From one per entity to another entity? Well, one, so... If, uh, one-time transfer, I would assume, would be allowed, beyond, but but it would land and stay at its um, uh, final destination. Is it like mitigation? So I think because this is a new program, something that we haven't done before, I think what we'd want to do before we start to issue these credits out is to create some some program framework to this okay. and be very clear about it because I think these are the kind of questions we need to work through. Um, this policy is just allowing these type of things to happen, but we need to make sure that we're on the same page of how we're implementing it and have a doc documented program. So you're, you're bringing up a good point about can they be transparent between developers? Should it stay within the same developer? Does it stay within the same area of town? Those are the conversations we need to clarify. And, and yeah. has staff taken time to think about how the the incentive to get earn credit could potentially incentivize someone to build extra in order to subvert the inclusionary um, requirements that are really what we're going after here. Right. Yeah, so I think that's that's something we have to look at. And again, these are um, options that we came up with during the study session to try to provide flexibility, but you know, the, the intent is to try to um, really hit on the innovative alternative. So if somebody comes to us with an innovative alternative, we're gonna evaluate that and run it through the paces. This is one of those that we would have to make sure we're, we're doing correctly. And do you, do you have a metrics for how you would assess um, a, a unit that is at risk, the affordable unit that's at risk? Generally, what we consider to be an at-risk unit is one that has an affordability agreement that's going to be expiring in the next couple of years, so we can see the loss of the rent restrictions on the horizon. Okay. And so we'd be looking to extend the, the restrictions for an additional period of time. And would that time period be 30 or 55 years? 55 years in compliance okay. with the ordinance. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, and then I'll cede the floor. Um, by going to um, up to slide 21, by going to the fixed fee structure away from a percentage of sale price, um, do we have um, any uh, plan for what we're going to do after the maturation of the staged increase schedule? Because at a certain point, it will be um, like in 50 or 100 years, or I mean, after some time, that, that dollar value will, relative to the market, not be the same. Um, purchasing power as whereas a percentage would be. This fee staged program would would um, hold through five years and then for, for the entire city. And then uh, after that point, it would adjust based on a um, regional index, cost of uh, living index, uh, so on an annualized basis. And we'll be reporting back to council on an annual basis to give you a progress report on how we're doing, and that would be the time for us to talk about um, amending, uh, adopting resolutions for fee increases. But there is a built-in. Yeah. Um, okay, that's all I wanted, thank you. And just as, sorry, just as a quick follow-up, some of our other initiatives that have come out of the Housing Action Plan are similar. Um, we're, we're trying new things, and so a lot of them have an update in five years. So we're, we're gonna be looking at all of these things again and seeing how, have they been, have they attracted development? Um, have, are they incentives, you know, how are they working? Um, that opportunity will be provided. 
So the question I is related to the uh, fee review. What is a reasonable, reasonable expectation? Because I've talked to some developers who've said, I've owned this property for 15 years, <clears throat> and now all of a sudden, you know, it's gonna be graduated for five years. From a council expectation level, when would we get some data that could be applied to future years in a realistic sense? Well, on an annual basis, we'll uh, talk about how many projects have paid the fee or, or built the units, um, and we'll, after five years, have a better trend line to understand if, if the fee is suppressing uh, or, or not hindering uh, development here in the city. So I think the metrics is, will we'll depend on, are we getting building permits issued and, and units built? I guess my question is five years, how did you come up with five years? And again, some of the experience I've had here in developers talk, this has been you know, decades in the discussion. How did we come up with five? Is that too long, not long enough? Because I'm sure some people may say, man, if you wait for five years, you've missed the boat. That's how, how did we come up with the five years as a solution? Well, I think as Claire mentioned, we have other initiatives that use the five years as a benchmark. Um, but again, we do come to the council on an annual basis and report to you on our progress towards uh, fulfilling the goals of this, progr this program and others. So we will have uh, check-ins annually to be able to get a sense, are we getting results or not? And then at the five year, there's, no, there's nothing magic that holds back the council from making a change if there's something substantial that occurs in our economy or in the city's circumstance to make a revision. But five years is a reasonable amount of time, not too far out. I also just want to clarify too, the two, two different times when we're talking about five years, five years to review the overall fee policies and impact fees. It's a typical um, best practice to look at fee structures every five years. The other five years is the implementation phase. We, we did a five-year program to try to address the building cycle, so two, typically a two-year process. So we stepped them in two years to get to that five-year mark. So I think along those lines, we would be wanting to um, evaluate those, and fees are done by resolution, so so those fees can be adjusted you know, if we need to. So it does give the council flexibility to try to get in there and fix something if we see a, a change in the market or, or some other something else yeah. come up. And I guess for me, just having earlier this morning have a discussion with the developer who says, you know, what you guys are doing, is it really working? Because we don't see a whole bunch of cranes in downtown Santa Rosa build housing. And just made me think, okay, what is that right time frame? Because I know all of the efforts that we've been doing, but I'm guessing we're still in the very um, early stages of seeing the impact of the decisions that we've been making. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's been about a year of, of policy work, um, and we're still f trying to finish up the specific plan, and then these fees, the inclusionary policy. So I think we're getting close to having that complete package of elements that hopefully we start to see some movement. And just from from our conversations with developers, we know things are starting to move, and some of the policy work that you've done have, have made some movement. So. I'm, we're with you. We, we're, we need to see a crane in the air pretty quick, and I'm, I, I'm hoping there's some developers behind us that are listening to this and um, come come through with that as quickly. Yeah. And then, could you go to slide 23, the, the fee comparison? I had a question about. Um, in one sense, these are. Um, if you keep on the ones with the cities, the comparisons. There you go. Um, in one sense, it's somewhat out of context because the inclusionary housing is just one of a set of fees that I think Mr. Tibbetts first brought up. And so for me, it'd be helpful if you, we saw here's the inclusionary housing fee and here's their overall fees to see how we compare. And then secondly, um, and I know Mr. Goon and I had this conversation with you, are any of these jurisdictions, you know, rock stars in the inclusionary housing fee comparison world? What's getting it done? Are any of these model cities that we would want to model after? Because that, that's somewhat out of context. Because, you know, I know we talked about with the inclusionary percentage, it'd be great, you know, we require 30%, but if nothing's getting built, what's the point? I, I had the same question when we uh, embarked on our, our uh, process of evaluating these cities. Uh, I wanted to know, you know, who's, who's got it right? Well, the problem is no, no one's got it right because we're all trying different things. And in California? <laughs> A lot of these, well, even uh, you know, even this sampling of cities, Bay Area cities, they're 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 trying everything, um, and they're new at it. So no one's been doing it for a while with proven results. If there were, you know, uh, it would be great and easy, but we'd still have to fit it for Santa Rosa. Um, so 
the study doesn't have that, that answer for us. So we're kind of all embarking on the same journey in different ways. And, and I will just say that when we go around and speak, speak at different events around the state, we do hear that, um, that Santa Rosa is, is trying things that a lot of cities aren't. Um, so I think, I think a lot of cities are watching Santa Rosa right now um, to see what will work. I know cities in our region are watching what we're doing, um, but we, we don't know what's gonna happen. That's why we're, we're, we're trying a bunch of different things. Great, thank you. All right, Councilor, are there any other questions on this part of the presentation? Okay, why don't you please continue for the commercial linkage fee. Hello. Um, so uh, I'm just going to do an overview of some of the things that we talked about at the last study session and then get to uh, what our recommendations are. So um, just as a quick overview, the purpose of uh, this fee is to mitigate the demand for affordable housing resulting from new market rate commercial development. Uh, and as a requirement of establishing this impact fee, we commissioned a nexus study uh, that analyzed the most common recent commercial development uh, types in the city and uh, evaluated what the impact fee threshold is, as well as what could be economically feasible uh, to developers. Uh, in short, the study quantifies the affordable housing needs associated with new commercial development, uh, the prototypes, and then also considers other fees and policies that could affect the feasibility uh, of a proposed project. So looking at the most common uh, Recent commercial development in the city, the prototypes we used for this study were uh, hotel, retail, restaurants, services, and uh, business parks, light industrial. And the study quantified the affordable housing need by estimating the number of uh, workers that would need, uh, that would be associated with these commercial spaces, what the estimated worker household income is, um, as well as the affordable affordability gap uh, for new lower income households. Uh, associated again with that with those new commercial developments. So you may uh, remember this slide from the study session. As a reminder, the charts show the performa analysis uh, that was tested on the financial impact of the maximum and reduced fee scenarios for each prototype. So the black line is the yield needed to make the prototype feasible. And the red bar show the total stack of fees by scenario. And any red above the black line shows the financial capacity. So where we landed is at the $3 per square foot option, which is shown on the right of uh, each of these uh, three graphs. And I just have another version of that uh, just in text, which is um, again by the prototypes the, you can see the vast difference between the maximize, uh, maximum justified fee and the um, fee option that we are recommending. <clears throat> So uh, also uh, we wanted to make sure that we were in line with comparator cities and we are, so $3 per square foot is um, well within the range of uh, our comparator cities and regional cities. Um, so not, not outside of the norm of what developers are seeing. So the questions from the study session that we were charged with addressing um, are mostly, uh, should we adopt a community, uh, I'm sorry, commercial linkage fee? We uh, have not had one, do not have one, should we do it? Um, is the proposed fee reasonable and is it feasible? Uh, and what options should we consider related to this fee? Um, we uh, recognize that um, it is of benefit to our uh, housing uh, strategy. And we do also recognize, as I just uh, showed you, that um, it compares favorably with our comparator cities as well as uh, within the region. <clears throat> So we're here tonight because we do indeed recommend a commercial linkage fee um, at $3 per square foot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We did, however, identify some exemptions that we would, uh, we're also recommending. Um, most are fairly standard, but we did uh, include some that are more specific to Santa Rosa and to the council goals. And those are to, uh, for example, address our desire for uh, residential development, uh, particularly in the downtown. Uh, the ordinance exempts 
mixed use projects consisting of two stories or more of residential over commercial. Uh, that said though, the commercial part would be exempt. The residential portion may be subject to the, uh, impact, uh, the inclusionary policy. Uh, we also exempt government and other public institutions, uh, public and private childcare facilities, uh, and um, other uh, community benefiting developments such as uh, homeless shelters, um, community care facilities, um, SROs, uh, units that are uh, specifically uh, to be used by uh, uh, people with uh, lower to moderate uh, income households. And then we also, which is fairly standard, exempt churches. Uh, the fee would be based on the rate in effect at the time of building up the uh at the time that a building application is submitted um, and would be due at or before uh, building permit uh, issuance. And then uh, if a developer uh, by chance provides affordable housing through some other means, um, that developer could uh, apply to uh, the city for a credit uh, or exemption uh, to the fee. Uh, and then lastly, regarding the uh, fee uh, starting at the first year after uh, adoption of the resolution, the fee will be adjusted annually each July 1st based on CPIU. So um, I just wanna be clear before I uh, state the recommendations that the ordinance will go into effect 30 days after the second reading, uh, which is scheduled to be on October 22nd. Uh, and assuming the schedule holds, that means the ex expected effective date of the ordinance will be November 22nd. And then the fees uh, for, uh, will go into effect uh, December 1st of this year, which is 60 days after the first reading of the resolutions, which is you know, what we're doing tonight. So uh, before I conclude to answer any questions on you may have on commercial linkage fee, I do just wanna read the uh, recommended action uh, which is to uh, introduce an ordinance as amended, amending the city code chapter 21-02, housing allocation plan to amend the requirements and incentives for providing on-site inclusionary housing units uh, with modifications to section 21-020.060 to add uh, section F as, as stated, uh, and by resolution uh, update the existing housing impact fee structure, and then lastly by resolution establish a new commercial linkage fee. Uh, and I'll take questions. Great, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So two quick questions. One is the same that my colleague had on the first portion of the presentation. Uh, how often will it be back before the council for us to be able to look and see whether this is working and what type of metrics will we use to make that determination? Uh, it's built into the resolution that we can come back and review it, so uh, every year. Yeah, so I think as part of our um, general plan update, housing update that we've been doing in the council every year, we'll be bringing back this policy and the inclusionary policy. Um, obviously the metrics in terms of uh, the, the revenue generated and what that, f what that funding is doing with the housing authority uh, would be presented at that point. Okay, great. And, uh, and right, so we just obviously heard a lot about uh, CPIW. Why is this using CPIU as instead? Sorry, CPIU is consistent with the um, index that is used for all of our impact fees. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions from council? No, okay, um, this is a public hearing, so I will open our public hearing. First speaker is Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Rog Collins. Did Dwayne? Okay. Uh, Rod Collins followed by Kurt Nichols. What's that? It's on. Oh, it's on? Uh, I'm Rod Collins with Evergreen Development. Uh, we are the master developer for the uh, project at Yolanda and Santa Rosa. Uh, we just received entitlements for 252 units um, in July uh, to go there. Um, as a master developer, we ourselves are not planning on building the multifamily project. We've been actually partnering with a couple of different developers. And at the recommendation of Bill Rose at the city, we first approached Wolf 
uh, to do the development there because they had completed Annandale very successfully. And um, when Wolf started the project, it was in the first quarter of 2018, and when they did their initial budgets, the, se the deal seemed to pencil. About a year later, 15 months later, when they re-upped their budgets, construction costs had gone up 20 to 30 percent. And I noticed that in the Nexus study that you had up there, the data for construction costs came in the first half of 2018. And I would submit to you that the construction costs right now have gone up at least 20 percent, maybe 30 percent. And right now, the Wolf backed out of the project because it was a hit to them of about seven to eight million dollars to their budget. They basically said, we can't afford to even give you anything for the land to, to, to continue. So we then went to another developer who looked at the deal. They passed. They couldn't get it financed. We're now working with a third developer to try to get this done. At this point, I don't know, honestly, today if that project's going to get done. And I'm guessing that 252 units is probably the biggest project that you have going on right now in the city, one of the bigger projects. And honestly, I don't know that it can get built. And I appreciate David uh, Guin working with us as far as phasing in the fees. But the problem right now is that, you know, in two years' time, those fees are going to start going up. So if we can't get the project built now because of the uh, construction costs, we let those settle. In two years' time, the higher fees kick in. Is that going to cancel out the cost savings we have from the, the, the um, reduced construction costs? So I appreciate uh, Councilman Tibbetts talking about locking in those fees earlier to the extent that we can lock those in the sooner the better, because in the development game, when we close escrow on land, we have to have all our fees fixed. Usually that happens when you have your entitlements. You know what the fees are going to be. We're doing a project down in, in Morgan Hill where there is a development agreement. We locked in our fees uh, back in 2016. So I would just really encourage you guys to look at the total fees that you're charging right now as well as how can we lock in the fees for the developer sooner in the process and later. And, you know, like I say today, I'm hoping that we can get that built at this point, honestly. Thank you. Kurt Nichols, followed by Bert Bangsberg. Mr. Mayor, council members, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I want to focus my comments on the housing impact fee changes. Um, as you've heard, this will affect projects that are in the pipeline and the original fee increase proposed uh, prior to the phase-in provisions that have been added recently would have killed at least one project you just heard about. Uh, we originally, as Rog mentioned, started working on that project in early 2018 and it just got entitlements uh, here in July. Um, and has experienced significant construction cost increases that uh, now there's a, a third developer stepping in to look at it. As part of that, they asked us to tabulate the applicable impact fees. So the total current impact fees, our current fees right now on this project total 8 million or about 31,860 for each of the 252 units. The current housing impact fees of that 8 million represent 570,000. The original proposal of a flat $10 per square foot would have added another 1.6 million to bring the total fees to 9.6 and would have clearly killed the project. So I want to thank um, David Guin for revising the proposed increase to include phase-in provisions to address projects already in the pipeline. Um, we say we need more housing, but I believe we also need to be cognizant of the challenges faced by those building housing. And primary among those is the need for greater certainty as to fees, costs, and process timing. Uh, unfortunately, not all uncertainties can be addressed uh, in the, this process, but some can. For example, I'd like to urge you to consider moving up the time at, at which the fees are locked in to earlier in the process, as has been uh, brought up by um, a couple of council members. In the case of this example project that's been in process for over a year and a half and the decision to proceed was based on the public, published fee schedule at that time without knowledge of a significant fee increase, the current building code provisions are locked in when plans are submitted for building permit review as we just heard. 
However, impact fees are not locked in until the end of the process when a building permit's actually pulled. This is typically at least two years from when the process started with the original entitlement application. It would be a big help in regard to certainty to at least lock in impact fees when the building permit plans are submitted, same as the building code requirements. It would be even better to lock these in when the entitlement plans are submitted. Again, that's when decisions are being made whether to go or not. Additionally, I'd urge you to consider the entire package of impact fees when making decisions um, because they vary from city to city and their the overall fees uh, might be different. Finally, I'd ask that you look at the whole impact fee package. Pay attention to the relative amounts of each of these fees as they relate to each other. Do they reflect our community's current priorities or could they be adjusted to raise some with corresponding reductions to others to better reflect priorities and the reality that the total of these fees have an impact on whether housing gets built? Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Bert Bengsberg, followed by George Uberti. Good evening, Mayor Shellholm and Mayor, members of the council. I'm Bert Bangsberg, 1809 Bella Vista Way, Santa Rosa. I'm the project manager for the Caritas Village uh, project that you're probably aware of. We're going through the environmental impact statement process now. We're uh, working on our entitlements. And I'm here this evening to support uh, the recommendation that you heard from uh, from Claire Hartman, and that is that the recommendation is to retain the mandatory incentives in the HAP ordinance for the development of more than 70 units of affordable housing when it takes place on the same site. It's really important that when <clears throat> we come forward and we put these low to moderate income homes uh, on a particular site, that we get that mandatory um, exception, if you will. Uh, as you're aware, acutely aware, we need the affordable housing in downtown Santa Rosa. And I believe that more incentives and concessions, not discretionary, but mandatory, the more you put forth, I think you will benefit from getting more from the development community because it will become a known. Discretionary uh, exceptions, fill out an application, pay the fee, go through the expensive process, and hope that you get that exception. But when you make them mandatory, like the one is in the HAP at the moment, then that gives you, uh, that gives you the, uh, the, the belief, the faith, uh, that you've got it and you don't have to apply for it. Um, Caritas Village has depended upon these exceptions and the one on the HAP in particular and uh, we support the staff's position on the amendment. Thank you. George Uberti, followed by Larry Florin. Thank you. Uh, I wanna be clear uh, about what I support and what I don't. Uh, I don't support the commercial linkage fee. Uh, it strikes me as Arbitrary. I mean, it says here, if enacted, the fee would be applied in the same way as existing city impact fees. Everything I've seen about the way the city handles its fees implies that we do not need to be hitting up developers for more money. I mean, if we're really concerned about incentivizing them, let's stop loading them up with fees and let's start thinking about how we're using the money we've already got. Uh, the next thing I would like to do is see if we can agree on what the definition of a bribe is. Because what I think the definition of a bribe is, is where someone pays you money so that they don't have to follow the law, right? Where they don't have to do something that everybody else should have to do. And then I wanna read what this uh, affordable housing incentive thing says. This is what I see. This section continues to provide regulatory or procedural financial incentives uh, in exchange for on-site uh, inclusionary units. Um, so you can, use money to not have to build affordable units, right? I mean, I don't, if that's not, a, it's way too close to what I understand, the right? It's using money to get around doing something that benefits uh, the general public. Affordable housing is not profitable, and it's not gonna be no matter what we do, all right? That's why there's a city. Things that aren't profitable, that people need, that's what a government does, all right? So do it, this is ridiculous. Right, I mean, I, it's, I don't even know if you kid yourself sometimes. Uh, the other thing that I wanna speak out against is this innovation. I mean, what are we innovating? Because what I can see is that we're innovating ways to not have to actually build affordable units. 
right? I mean, it, it, what we're doing is turning an actual place where somebody could live into this, like a commodity that can be traded and moved around. I mean, it, would there be any system? I mean, if, we, if we've got a 55 year limitation on where a, a thing can be built and then it can be moved to a different place. I mean, is there any system of tracking that at all? Or is it just gonna be something that rich people trade? I mean, even if, uh, you know, the, the total number of units were, were moved around. I mean, we're still not building new units. And based on the information that I see right here, we have a serious problem with, with building units. It goes down, I mean, it drops in 2008 and never picks back up. Um, so finding ways to not build units, to move around fictional things that serve it. I mean, I, you know, I see a lot of problems with changing things into any kind of economic entity that can be traded instead of actually building a place for people to live. This is not money, this is a home, all right? This, it has to be in a time and a place where someone can use it, all right? So let's focus on that. Let's stop loading people up with fees. Let's get these houses built. Oh, and no to the um, downtown thing where you reduce by half, no to that too. Larry Florin followed by Peter Hellman. Good morning, council members. Larry Florin with Burbank Housing. Um, the, um, I, I came up really to address um, council member Fleming's concerns, but she's not there, but maybe I'll, I'll speak to them anyway. Um, I do first do want to acknowledge the folks that are talking about the proliferation of fees. It's real. Um, when we underwrite a project right now at Burbank, we assume in Santa Rosa our fees are going to be around $50,000 per unit, about a tenth of the cost. That's real money when you're actually starting to write. And even as the beneficiary of the affordable housing fee, in most cases, we have to acknowledge the fact that fees have grown a lot and are affecting our ability to build. I also, by the way, I just wanted to clarify maybe with the staff that we assume that 100% affordable housing projects would be exempt from the affordable housing fee. I mean, I didn't see that specifically in the ordinance, but maybe I can clarify that um, going forward. Um, I also wanted, this, the specific issue I wanted to talk about with uh, Council Member Fleming had to do with offsite um, versus, in, versus inclusionary housing. Um, there's, we have the same goals that uh, I'm sure Council Member Fleming does, which is we don't want to segregate poor people. Um, we would like to mixed income as much as possible. The reality of, of the financing world um, in the tax credit world is that you have to have a tangible asset, which means you have to have a number of units together in a building in order to be able to sell the tax credits. I think what the differentiation here might be in the ordinance that you're looking at, we won't touch, we won't sell. It doesn't make sense for us to, to do a tax credit project of under 30 units. Um, so anything under 30 units is gonna have to figure out its own financing support system and maybe requiring the market developer to pay for that is reasonable and I think that's a laudable goal to try to build those inclusionary units. As soon as you start to talk about tax credits units, you can't build inclusionary tax credit units within a mixed income project. You can't sell the credits and, the, and you, can't put the, you can't put it together. It's just the fact of life. The other part I want to quickly just to speak to is the lack of being able to use housing authority or other public funds if you're going to do an offsite project. We can't access tax credits, 9% or 4% now increasingly because they're becoming competitive without local subsidies. And so it's not a question of being able to even help us to underwrite. We can't even get the credits because of the competitive nature of the tax credits. That's one of the factors that's used in scoring whether or not you can get tax credits. So, ex so not allowing housing authority or local funds to be spent on inclusionary offsite, which basically means you're not gonna get the project built. Um, last, fairly quickly, and Councilmember Coombs is well aware of this, preservation is one of the goals, the three Ps of CASA, um, and so being able to preserve housing is also an important mission that I think we need to be paying attention to. We thank you for helping us to buy the Parkwood project, which we just did, which helped 53 people from being thrown out of their homes. So anyway, thanks. Thank you, Larry. Peter Hellman, followed by Ananda Sweet. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Peter Hellman. I currently have two projects in the planning process in Santa Rosa. One is a 105 lot single family detached for sale project, and the other is a 30 unit apartment project. So I have horses in two of the three races that are running tonight. The uh, proposed changes in the inclu inclusionary uh, housing ordinance are well-meaning. 
Uh, and from what I understand, the staff has done an outstanding job of reaching out to the building community, community and incorporating many of our uh, proposed comments and changes. Uh, and I may have to hand in my development card, but I actually think the for sale requirements work. I think uh, you guys have done a great job. That said, however, I, I honestly don't believe there's anything you can do that will uh, stifle multifamily housing more in Santa Rosa than increasing fees, um, short of imposing a moratorium. Um, you got to, at least the numbers I looked at online today, I've, I found that there were only 75 multifamily building permits issued in Santa Rosa, a city of 178,000 residents, in all of 2018. That is a ridiculous uh, number uh, given the stage we're at in the environment in the business cycle, as well as the desperate housing need that there is here in town, uh, uh, given everything that's happened. Uh, the reason for that is, is multifamily projects rarely pencil. Um, the uh, relative low rents, believe it or not, Santa Rosa rents are low compared to other areas in the Bay Area. Uh, the sky-high construction costs, which I'll elaborate on in a moment, and yes, building permit fees all combine to make these projects unfinanceable. Um, just one quick number to throw at you uh, for relative purposes, uh, a single-family detached home we can build in Fairfield right now for $90 a square foot. That same home here in Santa Rosa would be $120 a square foot. 2,200 square foot single-family detached home, that's a $66,000 difference in the price of the house and the cost of the house. And those numbers come directly out of the land value uh, at the end of the day. So um, our little apartment, 30 unit apartment project, this ordinance, and if we pull our permits in the first two years, which we will, uh, will only increase our cost by $50,000. That may not sound like a lot, but that's $50,000 an acre and that puts me $50,000 an acre further away from being able to do my next project in Santa Rosa. It really hurts, folks. I mean, it really, truly does. So I respectfully hope you'll reconsider that part of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Anana Sweet, followed by Kristen Kiefer. Good evening, Mayor Schwethel, members of the council, and Nanda Suite, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Uh, we submitted a letter regarding commercial linkage fee a couple weeks ago, so I'll just summarize a few key points. Uh, while we recognize the need for affordable housing, we do not feel this is the right time for a commercial linkage fee. Uh, we applaud the city's recent efforts uh, to encourage development. Adding a fee at this time sends a conflicting message to the development community. Uh, it also creates disincentives for job creation within the city limits at a time that we need to uh, encourage both commercial and residential investment. Uh, should you move forward with a commercial linkage fee, we do encourage you to ensure that it's not applied to tenant improvements, uh, that you create some kind of mechanism for annu annual review so that it could be modified or suspended, particularly in the event of an economic downturn, um, that you would include a group of local expert practitioners to help develop the technical aspects, um, and that you would exempt the downtown core so that Santa Rosa doesn't discourage the very development it intends to promote. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Kiefer. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Kristen Kiefer, I work as a planner and representing many developers in coordination with the city. Uh, I'm concerned about the leveraging of incentives to uh, develop affordable housing, while many of these are well-meaning changes and labeling as an inclusionary policy Sorry, an inclusion, inclusionary housing policy uh, rather than the housing allocation plan, I think is a good step towards the intent behind this policy, uh, but does highlight many unintended consequences as it doesn't consider uh, the current state of construction fees uh, or construction costs. Uh, I do agree with locking in fees at the entitlement permit but I would like to focus on the commercial linkage fee. I do not think that applying a $3 per square foot rate apply all sectors is in fairness uh, in embodying of the intent of this policy. Uh, if the policy is to intent, if the policy intent is to develop affordable housing, housing need that is offset by the creation of new 
commercial facilities, I do not think that this is adequately reaching into um, how to address this properly. Uh, I think that the Nexus study should uh, focus a bit more on the sectors that each housing, sorry, that each commercial development is applicable for and uh, relating how many employees really would be relevant to that. Uh, with this, I would also ask that a concession be made for uh, residential and commercial projects, a mixed use project that is horizontally mixed use, not just vertically mixed use. Uh, we hear examples of projects where they are contained on the same site, uh, but are not built uh, within two stories above the uh, commercial development. So I would ask for concession and additional flexibility in that regard. Thank you. Great, thank you. Those are all the cards we have. <clears throat> Anyone else like to address the council on this issue? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing. Uh, council, any questions that may have come up from public comment? Mr. Vice Mayor. So David, uh, Larry asked a particular question about whether or not affordable projects would be exempt from this. Uh, can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so any affordable project that is compliant with our in the policy that you adopt uh, is, is exempt from paying the fee. Great, thank you. Ms. Gomes, you have questions first and then go, go. I have one question. I, ha I have the item and so I just have questions about making sure that I have the correct language for the item. Um, so is there going to be some, um, some recommended language um, regarding, uh, uh, I, I have it listed as the original slide 17 Yes, we have the language that we would recommend adding. It's two ads that we would right. add. Something to, to do with project size as yes. well for the earlier sections. Yes. Okay, and we're something prepared, to do. We're prepared to uh, read that into the record. Can you hear okay, it? so you're ready for that when the time comes. Um, I heard a request for lock-in for fee earlier. Um, is there language available if we wanted to move locking the fee in early? We, we don't have that available right now. One of the things we have been talking about um, as the building code is moving closer to coming to fruition is to work through that process and coordinate all of our fees and look at the, the fee package as its totality. So we're working on that. We're hoping if, if that's a direction from the council, we'll look at figuring out how to bring that to council. I would to address be interested that. in okay. an application rather than at pulled. I'm, I'm sorry. At, my understanding is there's a distinction between at application and at pulled. Correct. At pulled. Yeah. So we're and at application makes sense to me. And that's the uh, that's the point in the process where we're looking at that application. Um, okay. you, just to clarify, there were comments made about entitlements. That's not the, the date we're looking at. We're, we are looking at actually the application of the building permit is the the date. Just to be. Um, I, I, okay. Okay. That, but that won't necessarily be in the ordinance. It will be. Something you'll come back with? Correct, yeah, we'll bring back something to address all the fees because there are park fees, CFF fees, um, impact fees, commercial linkage fees. Okay. Did you say you had a question before I went ahead? That was my question, so thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. What I have before us is an ordinance and two resolutions. So I'll read the ordinance first. Um, and the ordinance should have two language additions. Do you have that? I do, and um, if you like, when you're ready, I can read that language into the record. Um, will you read the language now? Yes. So uh, section uh, 2102050 would be amended to add the following. First, Residential or mixed use development projects with six or fewer units shall pay a housing impact fee as noted in section 2102090, which is the uh, fee reference. The second addition to that same section would be a developer proposing to provide on site allocated units consistent with the inclusionary requirements of this section is entitled to receive one incentive or concession as outlined in section 2031090 of the city's densities bonus and other development incentives provisions or other benefits as negotiated with the city. 
So just yeah. to be clear, I'm going to make the motion, and I'm going to make the motion as amended, and I intend the amendments to include both of those items. And if I may just clarify, um, would those additions go at the end of that section? They certainly can. Uh, there's probably a better approach to the numbering of that section. So I think, just to be clear, I if think these can... are listed as the amendment is, the first one is C, would be adding a um, C to that with that language. And the last amendment was G that we'd be adding with that language. Thank you. Okay, so the ordinance uh, of the C Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 21 of the Santa Rosa City Code updating Chapter 21-02 Housing Allocation Plan to modify the requirements for providing on-site inclusionary housing units and to establish a commercial linkage fee, file number PRJ19-036 as amended and waive further reading of the text. We have a motion and a second. Uh, comments, Mr. Sawyer, any comments? Ms. Fleming, any comments? Mr. Weissman? Yeah, I'll just be really brief. Uh, in our study session, I did bring up a conversation topic about the commercial linkage fee. Uh, I'm gonna vote for it tonight. I am interested down the road when we start to really see how this is impacting our community. Um, having an additional discussion, particularly around the idea of high wage jobs. Uh, and I think I said this last time that it, it, it feels a little bit like what we're doing with the commercial linkage fee is taxing Keysight to pay for housing for Walmart because those dollars will go to that affordable housing. I understand that high wage jobs also bring with them an additional impact on uh, the housing market and on our community need. To me, that's an impact that we would welcome and would then be able to then turn around with additional uh, resources in our community from what those jobs bring in terms of resources for us as well to put into housing. So I'm not going to I'm not going to force that discussion tonight. But perhaps a year from now, when we do look at what the impact is, I would be interested in seeing some data around high wage versus low wage jobs. And for, for me, I, I would like that. Um when you do come back with that time certainty, um, because I could see it from a developer standpoint, we do all this paperwork and then we change the rules on a midstream. So that, that really concerns me. Um, same thing about, you know, I really appreciate the entire team's efforts about trying to find that perfect mix just to get what, you know, the council has been very clear, uh, clear on what we'd like in our community. So um, I would ask that you come back to us sooner rather than later if you started getting some feedback about what's working, what's not working, um, because I, I, I know we all want this stuff to work, but as you said, Mr. Goins, that we're doing some things that no other communities are trying. So uh, if we get early returns that this is not the right direction or even conversely, man, we hit the jackpot on this one. I, I would love to hear that sooner rather than later. Uh, I really want to thank you for bringing this forward. I know that you have worked very hard uh, to bring this forward and I very much want to thank you for, for the hard work that staff has done on this item uh, or these two kind of two items. It's not been easy, and I think you've done a very thorough job. I really appreciate the work you've done. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes with five ayes. Thank you. And we have two oh, uh, no. resolutions that follow this. Uh, I assume that I do not need to say as amended for these resolutions. Right. Resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa reviving, revising the housing impact fee as provided in Chapter 2102 of the Santa Rosa City Code, file number PRJ19036, and waive further reading of the text. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that also passes with five eyes. What a nice night. <laughs> We've had a lot of green tonight. Resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa implementing a commercial leakage fee 
for commercial development as provided in Chapter 21-02 of the Santa Rosa City Code, file number PRJ19-036, and wait for the reading of the Second. The motion and a second your votes, please. And is that the new one? And it also passes with five eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, back to the agenda. We'll do item 14.1. Item 14.1, report approval of general services agreement number F002035 for citywide landscape services. Jen Santos, Deputy Director Parks, presenting. Good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Ro Vice Mayor Rogers and Council Members, Jen Santos, Deputy Director for Parks. Uh, we're here tonight uh, to discuss the landscape contract going forward for contracted maintenance throughout the city. So as a reminder, currently our agreement expired as of yesterday. Um, we, had an extend, we had an extended agreement into September 30th, which expired yesterday. Uh, a formal RFP process was started earlier this year in March uh, in anticipation of the expiration of the contract uh, to solicit proposals for a new landscape contract. Tonight before you is a proposal uh, based on feedback we heard from our study session with you on September 24th, and it essentially is a mowing contract only. There is in the uh, uh, um, attachment and option to come back and amend it at a future date, but for tonight only, we are only looking at the mowing contract, which does not include any sort of chemical uh, treatments, weeding of any kind, everything is done mechanically only. And so the proposal is for Coast Landscape Management uh, uh, based out of Napa. The contract is for a three-year contract term with two one-year extension options. And uh, as we mentioned, the contract will provide mowing services only, uh, generally they're once a week, for all irrigated turf sites within the park, civic sites, and some roadway landscapes. Uh, these are mostly at our sports fields, et cetera. The contract is for a um, million dollars and $78,056 uh, per year for a total of a little over $3 million too. Uh, as an analysis, uh, the proposed contracts brings basic mowing services uh, to landscape areas. So we have our sports fields, we have our rented spaces, uh, soccer, baseball, and also uh, civic sites such as this building with the uh, mowing services out front. And there's just a few tiny places in the roadway where there are irrigated turf sites. Uh, bringing forth a mowing contract tonight allows us to come back and, or allows us to go out to the community to solicit feedback um, to find out uh, essentially we're saying what success looks like but also what um, the community is seeking as far as uh, maintenance services. Meanwhile, the city crews will augment landscape services uh, while we go through this evaluation process. So um, as of today, already our city staff are gearing up uh, renting mowers and trying to uh, take on some of that mowing themselves until our contract can uh, move forward. Uh, separately, in November, we plan to come back with a more long-term discussion and rec recommend an augmentation to address the remaining landscape needs that we will have throughout the city. We are rolling into November, into um, the rainy season, and uh, weeds and things are dying down, but we do wanna come back and address those additional concerns at a later date. 
Uh, so for tonight, our recommendation from the Transportation and Public Works and Finance Departments that the Council, by resolution, approve award of a general services agreement subject to the final approval to form uh, by the City Attorney's Office to Signature Coast Holdings, uh, doing business as Coast Landscape Management of Napa, for the citywide landscape services for mowing only in the amount of 1078056 per year for a three-year total of 3233168 And any questions you have? Hey, council, questions? Seeing none. Uh, we do have a couple cards. Is Dwayne in the house? He's still not here. Uh, George Uberti. Go ahead, George. Yeah, keep walking through that door with like the expectation that you'll have some kind of shame, um, but you don't. So <laughs> the, the the entire landscape budget for 2019, 2020 is five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we're talking about a contract just for mowing, that's a million plus? I mean, and then I'm reading right here, I looked through the agenda materials. One of the buildings it listed in there, I'm sure you're shocked to find out, is the Ridgeway Swim Center, at which I used to be employed by the city of Santa Rosa, mowing lawns at a whopping $11 an hour. Um, I'm not, uh, the, the list in there uh, for the guy that would be mowing those lawns would be $58 an hour. Uh, the language in this report says, um, for over 10 years, the city has contracted landscape maintenance services for parts, civic sites, and roadscape, uh, roadway landscaping to supplement its own small crew of park maintenance staff. I was a seasonal worker, um, so there was not an outside firm uh, that came in and provided landscaping service because I was the, the supplemental service and I was an employee of the city of Santa Rosa and I made $11 an hour. Um, and me and one other guy did that entire facility, all the landscaping, everything there. So that's just, I mean, I don't know if there's a problem with me calling it a lie, but I, I'm i blanking on a different word for that right now. That's just not the truth is, is it's just not real. Um, and so that doesn't bode well for the rest of those numbers, um, which don't look great. I mean, I you know we're just talking about the mowing. It's it, it's still, and then they want to continue it every year afterwards, right? So we're just going to let uh, this landscaping company double our entire landscaping budget just for mowing, and then we're just going to continue it for every single year. Why? I mean, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous on its face, and I know it personally to not be the truth. I did this job um, for $11 an hour. This, I mean, it's, it's unjustifiable, and it's just, I mean, not even close to the truth at all. So, I mean, I don't, it's such a huge amount of money and such an obvious joke that it's hard for me to believe that you're just going to vote on, I mean, this is, it's just, like, I just, I wonder what goes through your head sometimes, I really do. Um, no, please don't. I just, I don't know what else to say to you. Stop it. Just knock it off. Okay, those are the only cards I have. Mr. Tibbetts, you have this item? Yes, Mayor. I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving general services agreement number F002035 landscape maintenance mowing services and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments from anyone? See none. Your votes, please. And that passes with six ayes. Thank you. Mr. McGlynn, uh, Mr. You sitting in, Mr. Nutt? Since Mr. McGlynn is not in the room, I'll be happy to uh, introduce a report item, Urgency Ordinance, Resilient Cities, Combining District Amendment for Mobile Home Park Closures. Um, Claire Hartman, Deputy Director of Planning, reporting. 
This was. All right, good evening again. So uh, what's before you is an urgency ordinance and uh, it's a continuation of our resilient city combining district. Um, we have a base ordinance and then we've had some amendments uh, from time to time and I'll bring you up to date of where we're at with this particular need for an amendment. So as unfortunately we all know too well, on October 8th, 2017, the city was hit by um, a natural disaster, fire, and we lost 3,000 homes in the city, which represented 5% of our housing stock. And within that um, resource of ours and our community, 191 mobile homes were impacted, and that is involving three different mobile home parks. Some were hit harder than others, but they were all hit hard. Um, and particularly Journeys End Mobile Home Park lost 116 mobile home units out of their 160. So I think that's a little over 70% of their, of their homes. Um, it was essentially unprecedented uh, in the city. So as I mentioned, the city has a base ordinance that we call the Resilient City Combining District. And this ordinance was literally drafted as we were still fighting fires. Um, and we did the best we could to try to think of how could we um, facilitate the recovery that would be still involve the you know right checks and balances, but expedite the process for recovery. And we did pretty good, but over the last couple of years, we've had to do uh, initiations of a couple of amendments. So these are some examples of where we have uh, an issue has emerged, and we've had to address it through an amendment to that urgency ordinance through an additional or urgency ordinance. The item before you tonight is specific to mobile home parks. So this we haven't covered this before, and we've basically gotten to this point that something needs to um, be amended so that we can facilitate, in particular, the mobile home park closure process. Uh, and I'll go over the changes that we're looking at. Basically, we're taking a, what was a 1996 ordinance that never anticipated a natural disaster. Um, so it sets up policies and procedures as though the residents are still there, you have your HOA intact and you can work with them. And so obviously that's not the case. It's been challenging um, over the last couple of years. Um, and now we're needing to relook at that, that process and make some amendments. So I'll go over the uh, specific amendments that we're looking at. Um, again, the eligibility is that it's for mobile home parks within the burn area. We are specifically looking at those that are most impacted, so really past the point of recovery, looking at looking further, looking to close the park. So essentially uh, we set a threshold that would be the parks that lost more than 50% of their units. Uh, also we're looking at some of the nuances for how you are ready to move into this stage. We're ready to move into the stage. Uh, and this would allow for moving into the closure process without also having concurrently a project in its place. So basically it allows the city to process a closure report uh, as a first phase of recovery. Uh, the uh, applicants of a mobile home park closure plan would be allowed to um, select a qualified consultant that the city would review and accept and then we would uh, process that, that consultant's report through the process. The amendments also include sort of a clear checklist of what needs to be in that report. Again, it's a 1996 ordinance. There's modernization that needs to occur, clarification of terms, and so the amendment includes that. Uh, the uh, review authority is typically the planning commission, that's how the current ordinance is, um, but one amendment was to just bring it straight to the city council. Um, so again, just thinking how can we make it very clean and um, uh, uh, streamlined in terms of uh, getting to the right review authority in this particular case. 
Uh, we uh, are proposing that you reduce the public hearing notice from 30 days to 15 days. Uh, there's, it's, we've been working with uh, this particular site for some time, uh, and so they are quite aware of this. And so this is just, again, to sort of look at an opportunity to shorten the process, but don't give up on the fact that there is a communication that needs to, that has occurred, that needs to continue to occur, and then get it in alignment with our other hearing process requirements. Uh, there's other um, elements to the amendments. One is uh, that the closure impacts are the clarification that they're mitigated by the applicant to the, up to the reasonable cost of relocation. Um, but it can include compensation or benefits re received from other sources. Uh, another is that, and this is one of a, a key one, is that it, it clarifies that the conditions that require mitigation are mutually satisfactory between the owner's residents um, and, uh, and uh, those that are providing that compensation. And then it also clarifies in particular, this is probably the biggest one, is just what is the definition of the owners and tenants? The 1996 ordinance is, as you might imagine, it's for those that are on the site while you're going through the park closure process and we don't have anyone on the site in terms of the journey's end site. Um, and so this clarifies and redefines what that is, which is um, previous, previous um, tenants. So those are, that's the summary of the changes. Uh, it's an urgency ordinance. Um, and again, we, so there's no required notification. However, we've been in communication with those that would be most um, uh, affected by this process. And uh, we've used social media outlets to um, continue to educate about what this amendment in particular is. Uh, it's, the amendment is in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, three different bases for that exemption. Obviously, we're still in a state of local emergency responding to uh, the fires. Uh, the particular amendments don't uh, substantiate a project per CEQA, and we can also apply the common sense exemption. So the recommendation before you is to amend the uh, section of the zoning code that talks about the resilient city combining district. So it's adding essentially this new section that takes uh, the current ordinance, which is in chapter 667, uh, making the necessary edits and placing it in that, what is a temporary urgency ordinance, um, resilient city combining district. And with that, there is one amendment. It's a, really a typographical amendment. Um, it's just reference. There's one um, on page eight of the ordinance. There's a reference to 667, and we're going to replace that with J3. And when we get to the reading of the ordinance, I can read that verbatim. And that concludes my presentation. Great. Thanks, Claire. Council questions? Seeing none. I have a couple cards. Did Dwayne come back at all? No, he's not. Doug Johnson. Good afternoon or good evening. I've been here since four o'clock, so I guess it is evening. Uh, Doug Johnson with the Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association. Lots of words there, WMA. We represent the owners and operators of mobile home parks throughout the state of California. Uh, we appreciate the hard work the staff has done on the amendments to this ordinance, and we support adoption. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Fleming, you have this item? I do. Ms. Harmon, how would you like to proceed with the uh, additional language? So the amendment requested is that on page eight, of 12 on the ordinance, subsection eight, uh, the reference to section 667.030 is stricken and replaced with J parentheses three. Okay, so let the record reflect that, um, that I accept that as I read this urgency ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code section 20-28, Point one zero zero resilient city 
uh, combining district to add mobile home park closure procedures for mobile home parks of the city of Santa Rosa most severely impacted by the Tubbs and Nuns fires of 2017 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Seeing none, your votes please. And that does pass with five ayes, which is what was needed for urgency. Thank you, Claire. Mr. City Manager, 14.3. 14.3, report council direction to voting delegate for League of California Cities 2019 annual conference regarding council position on the resolutions coming before the League General Assembly. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Gorka. He's the City Manager Fellow. Uh, this is his, his wind up time. Um, we, we offer the City Manager Fellows usually a chance to do a presentation. Um, to council. Um, this is Keith's presentation um, before he goes back to water. Um, thank you, Keith, for everything you've done for um, the city during your, your six months stand in the city manager's office. Thank you, Sean. And Keith, don't be impacted by everyone leaving just before as you come down. We, we, we still have two assistant city managers, the fire chief, and our police officers still here anxiously awaiting your presentation. Thank you, Mayor Shadowhelm, council members. My name is Keith Gorka, I'm the City Manager Fellow. It's my pleasure to present to you these two resolutions of the League of California Cities and to seek your direction for guiding our voting delegates' participation at the 2019 Annual League of California Cities Conference. Policy, policy development is vital to determining the League's legislative and program strategies for important issues facing cities throughout California. Each member city has one voting delegate at the General Assembly, which will be held in Long Beach, California on October 16th through 18th. This year, there are two resolutions that have been through the policy committees, which were the Environmental Quality and the Transportation, Communication, and Public Works. Resolution one. Resolution one reads, resolution from the League of California Cities calling on the California Public Utilities Commission to amend Rule 20A to add projects in very high fire hazard severity zones to the list of eligibility criteria and to increase funding allocations for these Rule 20A projects. Summary of Rule 20A. Utilities alloc allocate ratepayer funds in the form of credits for utility undergrounding projects that have a public benefit and, and meet at least one of the following criteria. When it was implemented in 1967, the main goal was to address the visual blight of overhead cables. Notably, fire safety is excluded from that list. Excluding fire safety from the list puts the burden of undergrounding utilities to reduce fire risk entirely on proactive property owners or the agencies that are willing and able to cover the enormous costs um, of those projects. We know all too well here in the city that overhead utilities pose a high, you, you tell, you, overhead utilities pose in high wind and dry conditions. The goal of resolution one is to expand the criteria away from aesthetics towards one of uh, fire safety risk mitigation. Resolution one and the state of California align in Governor, Governor Newsom's wildfire strike force program. It identifies that hardening of the electrical, gr electrical grid is critical to wildfire risk management. Key component to this strategy is to underground ut overhead utilities. Then we get to high fire and risk. The designations differ among federal, state, and local agencies. Here's a map of our beloved Santa Rosa. The area in red shows what CAL FIRE deems as a very high fire hazard severity zone. The light opaque pink is what we call the wildland urban interface. And we believe that to be just the same, a very high fire hazard severity zone. In 2009, the council adopted an amendment to the fire code defining this wildland urban interface due to the large discrepancy between CAL FIRE's designation and what the city knows to be a high fire zone. This wildfire, wildland urban interface allows the city to maintain and enforce codes and mitigate risk in these vulnerable areas. 
supporting this resolution. There is no projected fiscal impact to the city for supporting this resolution. The resolution does call for an unspecified increase in funding for Rule 28 projects. We know PG&E is currently facing bankruptcy and restructuring as a direct result of the culpability in recent wildfires. Expanding Rule 28 will increase the cost of the ratepayers in the city of Santa Rosa. It is recommended by the city manager's office that the council, by motion, consider taking the position and to direct the, the voting delegate to approve resolution two with one addition, one amendment. And that is to add the term wildland urban interface along with very high fire hazard severity zone to the list of criteria for eligibility. And if I may interject, this is exactly tracking to your question earlier, Councilmember Rogers, about um, the the need that now that we have the evacuation routes identified and the hardening associated with them, that's why we would be urging the del this language, additional language, and it be placed into the resolution um, and for the voting delegate um, when, when we go down to the League of California Cities meeting. I've alerted the League of California Cities about this proposed amendment. Resolution two. A resolution calling upon the federal and state governments to address the devastating impacts of international transboundary pollution flows into the southernmost regions of California and the Pacific Ocean. A little bit of context. The new river flows north from Mexico across the U.S. border into the Salton Sea, ending up in Imperial County and Riverside County in Southern California. The Tijuana River flows throughout through Mexico and along the border and in the last few miles crosses and empties into an estuary in Borderfield State Beach, San Diego County. These rivers carry a tremendous amount of transboundary pollution flows that are a major source of raw sewage, trash, chemicals, heavy metals, and toxins. They pollute the local communities and the environment. They harm the ecosystem and they force closures at beach, damage farmland, make people sick. One of the implications is that Borderfield State Beach has been closed for 800 days in the last five years. These pollution flows have increased from the rapid growth of urban centers along the border and from the NAFTA uh, agreement. They generated increased pollution and although it was economic benefit, the expansion of the environmental infrastructure and the water treatment capacity has not kept pace with this growth. The degradation of the existing water treatment infrastructure and pollution flows exceed the treatment capacities is compounded with the federal government's repeated defunding of the 1996 Border Water Infrastructure Program. So over the last 20 years, this program has been deflated from 100 million a year to 10 million a year. And this 10 million is not just for these two, two rivers in Southern California, this is for the entire Southern border of the United States with Mexico. Supporting this resolution it is in alignment with the California voters who in 2014 approved Proposition 1, which authorized $7.5 billion in general obligation bonds to fund water quality projects. This resolution is in direct support of the League's goals. The League, ha the League has extensive language on water and water quality in its summary of existing policies and guiding principles. Supporting of this resolution will not directly impact the city's general fund, though possibly a decline in the reputation of our state beaches and the pollution flows in the Pacific Ocean could carry macroeconomic and environmental effects that ripple outside of San Diego and throughout California. Further compounding this, the federal government has slated to eliminate the BWIP program for its 2020 year budget. Fundamentally, it is recognized that water quality is essential to the health and welfare of everyone. Therefore, it is recommended by the city manager's office that the council, by motion, support resolution two and direct its voting delegate to approve the resolution at the 2019 League of California Cities annual meeting. Thank you. Great, well done. Thank you, Keith, for your first presentation. Thank you. Um, questions, council? No, no zingers, nothing we wanna put them on the spot on? Okay, uh, do we have any cards on this item? 
If you want to fill out a card, sure. Go ahead, just get up there, uh, identify yourself and... Hold on just a sec, wait till, there you go, you're lit up now. Sorry, I won't keep you long. Alex Crone, resident of Santa Rosa. I'm here to talk about 5G infrastructure in Santa Rosa. I think undergrounding utility poles is a great idea and I think it's probably a really bad idea to be putting cell phone towers on utility poles in high fire zones and urban uh, interfaces. Thank you. Great, thank you. Seeing nothing else, uh, Mr. Rogers, you have this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I will mention uh, just by way of a little bit of context, I am on the statewide environmental quality committee that did see the, the Rule 20A uh, discussion. Uh, I think uh, it's important for us to understand, and I know that this is not the only intent of that language change that we're asking for, but technically uh, the very high fire severity zones are designated uh, by CAL FIRE. And then technically, each jurisdiction is supposed to actually pass an ordinance adopting that designation as well. Uh, and I will point out that there is no state agency uh, that actually tracks who has and who has not accepted that designation. So I do wonder uh, in the way that, it's that the law is constructed whether or not the Rule 20A, even if they made that one change to the high fire severity zones, if that would actually be useful for most cities that so we need to make sure we put in the, the WUI information as well. Um, and with that, I will make a motion to consider taking a position on the resolution. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion that we support both uh, resolution, uh, resolution one and resolution two at the uh, League General Assembly uh, and give that direction to the mayor who is our voting delegate. Second. Motion and a second. And for clarification, does that include the language um, the additional language that was offered in the presentation? Yes, correct. Okay, any other comments? We have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously, thank you. Okay, we have no written communications. We do have one card for item 17, Alex Crone. Is it on? Okay, thank you, sorry guys, I know you've been here a long time. I've had a long day myself, probably the last thing you wanna hear is three minutes of me speaking, but I'm gonna take the opportunity, I've been here for three hours after I worked a long day. Um, you guys are really incredible, you're making very important decisions uh, that affect people, and you guys have handled yourself impressively tonight, I just wanna say that, I really do mean that, and I'm proud to have you as my city council. Um, in preparation for what I understand to be a November uh, study session on the further deployment of 5G infrastructure in the city, I just wanna let you guys know that since we put a pause, uh, you guys put a pause to the, the rollout last year, since then, all over the United States, California, the world, uh, the resistance from the medical community and scientific community to furthering our environmental exposure to RF radiation has nothing but grown. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this really shouldn't be a debate. Microwave radiation from wireless technology is biologically harmful, okay? It's not like natural radiation from the sun. Um, Man-made wireless radiation is, for one, polarized, so it has a charge on it, so it interacts with our cells and ions within our biological systems, not only humans, but animals and plants and it is also pulsed and modulated. So it turns on and off thousands of times a second, which makes it even more dangerous. Um, there was a Wall Street Journal article, Mr. Tibbetts, you were quoted in the first few paragraphs, you obviously saw that, right? Uh, you made some interesting quotes, some good ones. Uh, you don't work for Verizon, you work for the city of Santa Rosa and in the, in the residents, I can tell you, nobody wants a cell phone tower in front of their house. And there have been many cities in, Santa, in California that have adopted ordinances that cut out residential zones, whether it's on a utility pole or a city-owned light pole, it doesn't matter. And the FCC and the CPUC are, they have guidelines, they're not laws, right? And the case that our city attorney referenced last year the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, T-Mobile versus San Francisco, clearly, sh uh, they ruled clearly that we have uh, local municipality power on where to put these things uh, based on incommoding the public on health concerns, safety, 
and quiet enjoyment of streets. Um, so I want to leave you with an ordinance just passed in July in the town of Fairfax, and it cuts out residential zones, um, PG&E or light poles. It keeps them 300 feet away from child daycare, schools, playgrounds, parks, ball fields, and medical facilities, 50 feet from all residents not in residential zones. There's a public notice for occupancy and owners within 300 feet, a public hearing for the and 1,500 feet between each cell tower. So it can be done, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. No other cards, we'll adjourn the meeting.